Okay. So maybe meanwhile, let me share my screen for this session. Okay, here we go. Uh, I started recording and live streaming and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome. And uh, now we are gonna have our archaeogastronomy event. Um, which is going to be chaired by Professor Alper Ullu and co-chaired by uh, Zen Chenanli. So I leave the floor to you. Okay. Uh, th thank you. Uh, I thank you, Alex Alessandra, uh, for being chair. Uh, and I thank you for all, all, all organizing committee. Uh, this is very interesting uh, and very distinct in session um, in our program. We have a very distinguished speaker, uh, Özge Samancı, uh, about the culture, gastronomy, uh, and our uh, flowers, uh, in general, in our cuisine, um, mainly determining our lifestyle. Um, as my uh, ex-professor Amos Rapoport, uh, he says, and even though it, it was written in the book, the cultural core elements are like this. Uh, tenure systems in the culture, our tenure systems in the built environment. It's interesting. Child rearing practices, non-verbal communication. I can translate to architecture, clothes and wearings, and food, food habits. These five of them are very important in order to understand one culture. So we have a very distinguished speaker here, Professor Özge Samancı. Now uh, she will uh, make a presentation about uh, flowers of Istanbul from past to present. Uh, I want to uh, uh, tell something about Samancı. Sam uh, uh, Özge Samancı obtained her PhD in history and civilization from Ecole de uh, Edit on Science Sociales in Paris in 2009. Her studies and research are about the history of Ottoman Turkish food culture, focusing on the modernization process in the 19th century. I'm sorry if there are some French words uh, for this. She is the author of books such as Flowers of Istanbul, 2007, La Cuisine de Istanbul or uh, Cycle. 2015, Yeni Emek uh, Kitabı 2018, of book chapters such as culinary consumption patterns of the Ottoman elite, elite uh, during the first half uh, of the 19th century. In the illuminated table, The Prosperous House 2003, Klaff and Boucher, the modernization of official ban banquets at the Ottoman Palace in the 19th century in Royal Test 2011, Food studies in Ottoman Turkish historiography, historiography in writing food history, a global perspective 2012, cuisine in dictionary, the uh, Empire Ottoman 2015, hosting a feast for foreign guests in the Ottoman palace in the power of test, Euro Europe at the royal table 2020, history of eating and the drinking in the Ottoman Empire and modern Turkey, and Muslim. Uh, Editor's Handbook of Eating and Drinking 2020, Images, Perceptions, and Authenticity in the Ottoman Turkish Cuisine, Food, Heritage, and Nationalism in Europe 2019, Food Culture in Balkan Peninsula Through the Exotic Views of the 19th Century, Travelers' Accounts, From Kebab to Kebabçici, Foodways in Post Ottoman Europe, Interdisciplinary Studies on Eastern Europe, Harrowsweets Publishing House 2018. The cuisine of Istanbul between East and West during the 19th century in earthly delights, economics, and cultures of food in Ottoman and Danubian em Empire, uh, 1500 and 1900, 2018. Since two 2017, she's the associate professor and the head of the Department of Gastronomy and Culinary Arts at Özge University in Istanbul. Welcome, uh, Professor Samadji. Uh, now, this is your uh, time for speech and presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alper Hocam. 
Thank you for inviting me, Alexandro and Zeynep Hocam. I think your program is really uh, um, full and I would like to listen to all presentation, but as we talked with Alper Hoca, we have lots of classes and we couldn't. To, yes, uh, I'm an Ottomanist, I'm a historian, but I'm working since years about food history and I'm trying to understand the culinary habits uh, in Istanbul, in the Ottoman palace, especially focus, focusing on the 19th century. Today, I will share with you um, a journey through history in Istanbul cuisine from Byzantine era to the end of the Ottoman Empire. I want to share my screen. I prepared a presentation. Yes, I think it's okay, you can see. Yes. Okay, so um, I started with some pictures, <laughs> with some photos of the dishes. Uh, all of the dishes uh, reminds us some ancient culinary heritage. For example, here we have fish roe, botargo, um, and this uh, botargo is inherited from Byzantine era, even maybe before the Roman era. Here we have one leaves with sour cherries, an Ottoman dish from Istanbul cuisine, but probably originated from the land dishes of the Greek communities in Istanbul. Here we have a lamb dish called Çeşidiye from the 15th century. Lamb uh, stew cooked with some plums and apricots and apple, a very medieval taste because in this era mostly uh, fruits and uh, meat are cooked together and here we have a sherbet. So as you know, Istanbul is an imperial city. Imperial city for both Byzantine Empire and for the Ottoman Empire. So Istanbul has the privilege of getting the best of ingredients from different parts of the empire, both during the Byzantine and the Ottoman era. Of course, the palace or the imperial cuisines um, provided much more food ingredients and they used the best ingredients in their cuisine, but also the city, because it is the capital, profited from this priority. And from the fourth to the 15th century, Constantinople was the Byzantine capital. And it was during the middle ages in which Byzantine cuisine enriched with the taste of the Orient. I will explain. Um, in even today's Istanbul cuisine and in Turkish cuisine, we see some Byzantine heritage. First, I want to speak a little bit about Byzantine cuisine and then I will pass to the Ottoman era. So everyone may think that Byzantine cuisine is a direct continuation of ancient Greek and Roman cuisine. Um, it is not totally uh, correct because Yes, Byzantine cuisine reflect the continuation of ancient Greek and Roman gastronomy with some differences. Firstly, Byzantine cuisine, I mean the cuisine in Constantinople during the Byzantine era is a Christian cuisine. And the, what, what can be the influence of Christianity on food culture? First of all, the religious restriction, the fasting days and the period of abstinence, uh, approximately 150 days per year, Christians were uh, uh, abstained from eating animal food product, meat or milk, cheese, butter, only some vegetables and parcels and fruits, some vegetable oil, and sometimes some shellfish uh, can be eaten during this period of abstinence. At the end, some new types of dishes are invented. And you know, during the Ottoman era also, the um, Greek room community, Will continue to uh, will continue to their tradition in their religious restriction, and the invention of dishes will be related to these uh, habits. And you, the, on Byzantine cuisine, we see also a direct influence of the medicinal rules of this time, that we call theory of humors. And in the medieval 
ages, not only in Byzantine society, but also in medieval Europe, in medieval Arab Persian world, and in the Ottoman Empire, the humoral theory um, derived or inspired or developed from the Hippocrat doctrine and then became much more, uh, much more defined by Galen, uh, dictated also the uh, food consumption habits. And so it is a whole different theory. Every type of food items was categorized according to their quality, um, according to their quality related to be hot, cold, wet, or um, hot, cold, wet, and dry. And each humor, each human being has a humor, and each humor has some food uh, which are allowed to be eaten. It's a long uh, system. Uh, in Byzantine cuisine in Constantinople, fish and shellfish are really important. And uh, there is an abundance of fish and shellfish. Uh, even today, we see that Istanbul cuisine can be defined with the presence of different fish um, from Bosphor, from Marmara Sea. But because, of course, today everything is changed. Um, Fish culture is really remarkable in the Byzantine cuisine because of this land time and also because of the presence of different fish obtained from Bosphor. Mackerel, bonito, tani, bluefish, pickerel, sebas are some of the examples. Uh, and even before the Byzantine era during the Roman Empire, uh, fish, Istanbul, Byzantium, a small Roman uh, fish village was represented uh, with with some uh, fishers. And here we see a coin, a Roman coin from the second century on which we see dolphin and bonito. Botargo, which is a delicacy of the Mediterranean Sea today, uh, existed since the Byzantine era. It is the salted gray mullet called otarikon. And otarikon, botargo, fish roe, balık yumurtası in Turkish or mumlu balık yumurtası will be continued to be a part of Istanbul cuisine during the Ottoman era. And even today in today Istanbul, in some um, market like Balık Pazarı in Beyoğlu or Kadıköy fish market, we may find Botargo. But uh, nowadays, it became like a really um, rare delicacy to be found. Uh, today's in Turkish language, all of the fish names uh, are originated from ancient Greek or Latin. Uh, so still we continue to preserve, at least in etymologically, the Byzantine heritage, the Roman heritage in our food culture. Only uh, three or four fish names are Turkish, like Kılıç, Kalkan, uh, for example. In the Middle Ages, Byzantine cuisine, especially the cuisine of the elite, uh, was, can be defined uh, with the presence of lots of spices. Middle Ages was the period of the use of spices everywhere. In the Middle Ages in Europe, in the Middle Ages in Abbasid era, in Arabian Peninsula, and also in Constantinople. Spices were rare and expensive, and the use of spices was a mark of luxury and was a mark of distinction. And spices were important because they were used in with some medicinal purposes but spices were so expensive and they were not used in order to preserve food items as in popular culture it is uh, argumented in that way saffron mastic as sugar sugar was considered as a spice in the middle ages it was used in small amount and uh, it was used as a spice uh, and it was a really, really rare uh, food item. Ginger, cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves. You know, Constantinople was an important center of trade, commerce, and spices imported from the Far East uh, were distributed from Constantinople uh, to the other port city in Europe. Mastic, maybe you know, is a kind of re re raisin of a special tree called mastic uh, in Greek island Kio, Kios. And still today in this Greek island, mastic production is one of the major economic um, 
activity. Mastic was used in, in baking bread and cakes, and also it was used in wine. Of course, Byzantine Empire was a Christian empire, and also it was an empire uh, in which the production and consumption of wine was, was really important. And the production of wine will continue during the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it will be allowed to the non-Muslims, and we see that all of the winery which existed in the Byzantine era, like in Tras region and also on the Asian coast on the Greek island, will continue, but probably the consumption will decrease or it won't be enough, but we don't have detailed information about this subject. I already mentioned the importance of land in Byzantine culture. The consumption of meat was regulated by the Orthodox Church and approximately 40% of the days of the years, meat was not allowed to be eaten, not on red meat or poultry or fall or um, milk or cheese, but, uh, and sometimes fish also. And instead of uh, these food items, some new dishes are invented. Uh, for example, fava, broad bean puree. Originally, it is a land dish and it will continue to be a part of the Ottoman cuisine for, uh, during the following centuries. And at the end, it will be considered as a part of today's Istanbul cuisine and even today's Turkish cuisine as a renowned meze, small things to eat uh, as an appetizer. Um, and like fava, we can give other example, uh, hummus also, chickpea puree probably not invented in not invented in Constantinople on the um, southern part of the uh, Ottoman Empire maybe it was invented but it is a land dish also during the toward the end of the Byzantine era we know that the first use of fork will be realized um, Byzantine nobles uses forks and spoons at the table of course the shape was really different and we are talking about really the end of the Byzantine era, maybe 12th century or 13th century. And these um, strange forks are the first example. And then the use of fork will be forgotten until the Renaissance era in Italy in 15th century, it will be started to be use in 16th and 16th century on Italian Renaissance table, especially in city-state city of Florence, etc. When we look to today's Istanbul food culture, I want to give you some of the examples of dishes or flavors inherited from Byzantine era. I already mentioned about broad bean puree, fava, that um, that is prepared in different style in Istanbul on the Asian coast of Turkey, etc. Basically, it is made from broad bean, dried broad bean, um, cooked and make the puree mixed with lots of olive oil and maybe some garlic sometimes. It is a nice uh, vegetarian land dish originally, which is a part of today's uh, Turkish cuisine. Lakarda, bonito preserved in brine. Um, in real time, it is not the bonito, but the bigger bonito that we call torik in Turkish. And it is a, a renowned dish of Istanbul cuisine also. And um, still, it is, a, it is one of the famous meze on mehane table on tavern in Istanbul. Easter bread or Pascalia çöreği. Uh, this çörek is prepared for the celebration of Easter. When it is for Easter, most of the time red dyed eggs decorated the bread. But during the normal time today in Istanbul, in every pastry shop, you may find Pascalia çöreği. And uh, originally this çörek can be flavored a little bit with mastic and the, the taste will be much more enhanced. Um, today, especially on the eve of the New Year, another shape of çörek is prepared called New Year çörek. It is a round shape, but it is, and also we have other examples 
uh, I already mentioned all of the fish names are originated from Byzantine era. Uh, Peximet, Paximadi in the Byzantine era, another um, food item inherited from the Byzantine time. Just I want have for Byzantine era, unfortunately, we don't have cookbook cooking manuscripts. Only we have some um, manuscripts of medicine in which there are some recipes because recipes are important for medicinal purposes also. The Byzantine cuisine is regulated mostly according to this humoral theory, medicinal theory, and so the, the food items which should be eaten are organized according to the seasons, according to the uh, sickness, etc. One of the renowned scholar who has good um, studies about Byzantine cuisine is Andrew Dalby. Andrew Dalby uh, published books about the ancient Roman cuisine and also Byzantine cuisine. And the one about Byzantine cuisine is really uh, nice. It, it, the book is called Flavors of Istanbul, uh, Flavors of Constantinople, and the book is translated also in Turkish a couple of years ago. And now I'm passing to Ottoman era. So since the 16th century, new food habits will be introduced to Istanbul. After the conquest of the Istanbul, uh, at the end of the 15th century, we see that during the 16th century, the population will change um, and the food habits will start to intermingled with the ancient food habits. But of course, we are focusing always on Istanbul, but before the conquest of Istanbul, we know that the presence of uh, Byzantine um, population and with the um, with the Sajuk and the Ottoman Turkish um, half nomadic groups in Anatolia started a kind of interaction of culture between two different worlds and already some of the food habits are started to be influenced from each other. So that's why there are some topics of discussion, for example, about the origin of Tarhana, uh, Tarhana or Trakhana, uh, probably, and what is Tarhana? Tarhana is a kind of uh, ready. Um, tarhana is made from wheat or flour mixed with yogurt. It is a dried kind of powder, or not only powder, it can be also um, in other uh, shape. But once it, it is mixed with hot water, it is it becomes a nice soup. Still, it is one of the important soup dish in all over Turkey and different uh, types of tarhana exist. Tarhana under the name of trakhana existed also during the Byzantine era. So um, it is not certain who invented first tarhana. Maybe I have a question from chat. No, okay. Let's go, John. Please disregard the chat uh, during your presentation, but we will keep writing something. So uh, sorry for the interruption. No, no, it's fine. Okay, I'm returning back to my Ottoman era. Sorry. Uh, here we have a map. Everyone knows the territories of the Ottoman Empire, but to remind, um, starting with a small principality around 14th century in Iznik and Süd and became a large empire in the 16th century. All of the Northern, uh, North Africa, Arabian Peninsula, Balkan region, Trust region, uh, Crimea, etc., became a part of the Ottoman Empire. And what is uh, what will be the outcome of this large territory on the food culture? Uh, especially we see the influence on the food culture of the Ottoman palace, which is situated also in Istanbul. So, Always the Ottoman palace will have the priority of getting the best ingredients from different parts of the empire. And also Istanbul is profited from this uh, priority like it was during the Byzantine era. We see that uh, again, like previously in the Byzantine era, um, 
Balkan region and Anatolia will continue to provide wheat and animal to Istanbul. And the hinterland of Istanbul uh, is rich of vegetable and fruits and vegetable and fruit will be imported from the surroundings of Istanbul. But also during the autumn era, from the very uh, distant places from, for example, from Egypt, rice and sugar uh, will be imported to Istanbul from Damas apricots, from uh, Atin honey. So examples are in that way. So to underline, maybe we can say that since the 16th century in the city of Istanbul or Constantinople, some new flavors will be started to be practiced in terms of cuisine. So nomadic flavors inherited from Central Asia will start to be present in the cuisine. For example, yogurt. Yogurt is a new substance. And also some medieval Arab Persian culinary techniques and dishes uh, will be a part of the cuisine. Already medieval Arab Persian cuisine was um, present in the Anatolian Selçuk cuisine in imperial terms. You know why? Because from the 8th to 12th century, uh, Abbasid cuisine became like a model, um, not only its cuisine, but also its culture, to be inspired by other Islam um, state. And we, we know that uh, already during the Anatolian Selçuk era, there is a cultural interaction in terms of gastronomy between medieval Arab cuisine and the Anatolian Selçuk cuisine. And this influence will continue also during the Ottoman era. For example, the first Ottoman manuscript, cooking manuscripts, is from the 15th century. And it is a translation of an Arabic cooking manuscript written in the 13th century. Uh, who translated these manuscripts from Arab to Ottoman Turkish? Shirvani, who is a doctor, who is a medicine. It is not surprising to see that doctors have an interest in cuisine because in the Ottoman cuisine also, we know that cuisine has a direct relation with medicinal um, system doctrine. So in Istanbul, we will see some of the examples of dishes from Arab Persian cuisine. I will give you some details. And of course, after the uh, during the 16th century, uh, Sephardic taste will be started to be part of Istanbul cuisine also because uh, Sephardic, uh, Sephardic uh, population people will started to migrate to Ottoman Empire, to Edirne, to Salonika, and also to Istanbul. And the long Ottoman era from 15th to 20th century, nothing is the same. According to century, there are some changes in production of new ingredients, emergence of new techniques, changes in table manners, and also in material culture, we see some changes. But uh, we see that during this um, all long era, uh, Istanbul cuisine will start to be um, changed and still we will see that some of the inheritance will be a part of this cuisine. Um, during the Ottoman era in Istanbul, uh, I think we should uh, underline the presence of Ottoman palace in the city. So the development of an imperial taste, which, we, which became a model uh, to be inspired by the Ottoman elite, uh, Ottoman Muslim or non-Muslim elite is important. And the cookbooks published since the cookbooks and cooking manuscripts written since the 18th century will witness this continuity of change from imperial uh, taste uh, among the Ottoman elite in Ottoman household. And also in Istanbul, like in other city of the Ottoman Empire, the presence of the different religious communities, different uh, ethnic communities, Rum, Greek, um, Rum or Greek, Armenian, Muslims, Jewish, Levantan, etc. All of these different uh, communities contributed also to the formation uh, of a um, shared cuisine distinguished with some religious restriction. But what is surprising when we come to 19th century, we see that uh, some of the dishes which were which was created 
um, because of some of the religious restriction became a part of Istanbul cuisine, which is shared by all of the different community. That's why um, I always try to explain that it is not really, really possible to define separately and Jewish cuisine and Armenian cuisine, a Greek cuisine, a Muslim cuisine within the Istanbul cuisine, at least for 19th century, because what I see is a shared cuisine by different communities. So um, before to go to the details, maybe I may give you also a short example about the sources that we use when we study Ottoman food culture. Um, we have Ottoman archives. In the Ottoman archives, we have lots of documents related to the um, kitchen expenditure list of the Ottoman palace. I mean, uh, all of the food items, including kitchen equipment and tableware, uh, are listed in different documents, month by month, year by year, uh, for different palace. So by reading and by this covering these documents, we can construct the types of the food items used in the Ottoman palace, types of the tableware and kitchenware used in the Ottoman palace. But unfortunately, we don't have any recipe in the Ottoman archives. Just under the line, sometimes it is written, for example, yort, um, we see the purchase of yort for the preparation of mante. So we understand that some of the dishes can be prepared. In archives, we have also some uh, list of the food items sold in the Ottoman markets, not in Ottoman archives, but in Kadisi Cidere. So uh, for the 16th century or for the 17th century, we can see the list of the food items, including ready prepared dishes sold in Istanbul markets. So different types of spices, fish, vegetable fruits, we can have some list. So these are two important group of documents. Uh, on the other hand, we have cookbook, but for the Ottoman case, as I mentioned before, one cooking manuscript for the 15th century, and until the 18th century, we don't have any other cooking manuscripts. Starting from the 18th century, we have three cooking manuscripts, and for the 19th century, now it is the time of printing press. We have cookbooks published in Ottoman Turkish, and also we have cookbooks published with Armenian alphabet, but in Turkish. And all, all traveler accounts and memoirs and pictorial evidence, including miniature, etc., are constitute our sources that we use in food history, food studies in Ottoman culture. I said that some nomadic flavors inherited from Central Asia became a part of Istanbul cuisine since the 16th century. In real term, when I talk about Istanbul, you can think that it is done because Istanbul cuisine will constitute an, at the end the traditional Turkish cuisine. All of these things represent also traditional Turkish cuisine. Yogurt is the um, emblematic dish of the nomadic Turkish food culture. Um, and before, we, for example, we know that we, during the Byzantine era or during the Roman era, uh, Roman uh, Imperial Roman era, yogurt is not a part of the diet. Dried yogurt, uh, some um, cured and spiced beef that we know today as pastrama, but of course today's pastrama is totally different because it is covered with red pepper, etc. And at this age, red pepper did not exist, etc. Uh, the famous Turkish ravioli that we called mantı, the technique of making tin uh, sheet of bread that we called yufka. Here we see how it is prepared, and all of them a big file of yufka flat bread still made in Anatolia. And these flatbreads are prepared, they became dry. And in order to eat, you can sprinkle a little bit water at the end, they became softer. And then uh, you can use in the preparation of savory pastry or sweet pastry, or just it can be consumed as a bread. Still, yufka bread is a core part, a staple food in Turkish food culture in all over Anatolia and also yogurt also is important. These are some of the examples of food items inherited from the uh, nomadic Central Asian food culture uh, 
as witnessed by sources like Divan Lugatı, Türk written in the 11th century in Karahanlı era. And some of the food items inherited from medieval Arab cuisine, already which, become, which became a part of Selçuk cuisine, I mean 13th century. Um, even in today's Turkish cuisine, börek, börek is savory pastry different, prepared in different shape. This terminology exists since this era. Rice pilaf called dane, kebabs, uh, herise, keşkek, helva, all of them exist since, existed since the Selçuk era. Here we have a rose sherbet. Of course, the preparation of sherbet will be always um, a privilege of the elites because the use of sugar is really expensive and un in, until the end of the 19th century and in Turkish case I think until the Republican era sugar will be always a luxury food item and sherbets pre pre prepared with different fruit juice um, flower petals or spices uh, will be an important part uh, was an important part of the Ottoman elite cuisine in the past, since the Selçuk era, and the variety will be developed in the Ottoman palace. Here, this is an example of rice pilaf, uh, which will be the emblematic dish of the Ottoman uh, palace cuisine, um, and also Istanbul cuisine. Rice is much more rare and expensive compared to bulgur cracked wheat. In Anatolian cuisine, cracked wheat bulgur will substitute rice. And we see that during all of the imperial banquets organized in Ottoman palace or on the, and also in Istanbul household, always rice pilaf uh, is served. Keşkek and herise. Keşkek is an important dish um, prepared and made with some wheat and some lamb. Uh, wheat and lamb are cooked for a long time. And then uh, at the end, there is a kind of a paste, a kind of porridge. Um, the first recipe of keşkek is from the medieval era, from the 13th century. And it will be continue to a part of um, Turkish cuisine uh, during the following era. Next. Sorry. So um, in the Ottoman palace, the construction of the Topkapi palace is important because it marks also um, the beginning and or the development of an imperial cuisine. Already, already, um, already uh, um, constructed in the 15th century, uh, the cuisine at the, at the beginning there was there was four cuisine and toward the <clears throat> toward the following century the number of the cuisine will be increased to the ten. Um, as uh, written by Gülru Necipoğlu in her book Topkapı Palace, the Topkapı Palace kitchen represented the power of the Ottoman Sultan, the generosity of the Ottoman Sultan. The food prepared in the palace was not only uh, inhabitants, the people who live in the palace, but the food was distributed also to the people, to the soldiers, to the common people during the imperial festival. And we, we are not sure to how many how many people food is cooked in the top of the palace, but according to some of the traveler accounts, for example, we know that in the 16th century for uh, 3,000 people, food was cooked uh, daily in the Ottoman palace. Um, the classical era from 15th to 18th century represent a much more a unique homogen food culture. Uh, after the, toward the end of the 18th century and during the 19th century, uh, with the modernization era, we see also the changes in food habits 
uh, a passage from traditional table manner to modern table manner, uh, a change of preference uh, in tableware instead of Chinese table uh, porcelains, European porcelains will be important, etc. So that's why we prefer to separate the um, Ottoman palace cuisine and also Istanbul cuisine um, as the um, classical era and the modern era. Um, as I mentioned before, the existence of the palace gives a privilege to Istanbul. In on this map, made by Arif Bilgin in her in his book called Top, uh, Ottoman Palace Kitchen, uh, we can see different types of vegetables and food items provided from different parts of the empire. It is too small, but at least it gives us an idea. It gives us an idea that from the even from the remote places of the empire. Uh, food items are important to the city and to the palace. For the exam, for an example of archival document, I give this one vegetables and fruits cultivated in the gardens of the Ottoman palace. These types of documents are abundant in the Ottoman archives and while we read them, we construct and we unite all of the information and we have a result. Matbahu Amri Imperial Kitchen, symbolically important, constituted of 10 parts. Uh, each of the kitchen is devoted to a group of people resident who live in the top of the palace. Cuisine and the food items consumed by everyone is not equal, of course, in the palace. And the tent kitchen is called as Helvahane, um, confectionery kitchen, in which not only uh, sweet dishes are prepared, but also medicinal preparation are prepared uh, is important. From the 18th century, we have some illustration of the cooks who works in the kitchen. In the middle, we see a Helvaji, a dessert maker. He's holding in his hand um, a pot in which I think there is helva. So I won't go into the details of the Ottoman palace cuisine. I want to give you a generally Istanbul cuisine taste, which is which can, can't be separated directly from the Ottoman palace cuisine because there are lots of similarities. There is a continuation. We shouldn't think that in the palace there is a really extravagant and different cuisine which has no uh, common things with Istanbul inhabitants. No, uh, there are lots of common things, but only the quantity of the ingredients used in the palace was remarkable, or the continuity of the dishes, or the presence of the desserts or the luxury food items are important. But within the palace also, uh, there is always a hierarchy and the food uh, of the sultan is not the same as um, as the member of the harem or as the people who work in the palace. Istanbul provided some of the food items from its sources and most of the food items from outside. So the provision of Istanbul is regulated by law and um, the provision of a special wheat and meat, I mean, a live animal, sheep, uh, was one of the priority, which is controlled by the Ottoman government. So Imperial City of Istanbul hosted the best ingredients and it, this privilege enabled the development of a sophisticated cuisine there. Products such as cereals, animals, dairy products, coffee since 16th century, Olive oil, butter, vegetables, fruits, spices arrived at the port of Istanbul from different regions of the empire. But at the same time, most of the vegetables and fruits consumed in Istanbul were grown also in the city because Istanbul has vegetable gardens, wineries, uh, and also uh, fruit gardens. And these food items are, are also important for the city. Milk, yogurt, and dairy products, some of them, were supplied from the small dairy farms in Istanbul. For example, Eyüp Üsküdar, uh, two famous neighborhood for the production of dairy products like kaymak and yogurt. Fish and shellfish, of course, abundant from Bosphor, from Marmara Sea. Uh, this carpostal is from 19th century, not before, but 
just to give an idea. Uh, so of course, street food sellers are important. Markets markets became an important are important part of daily life, and also street food and also small food shops, not restaurants. Of course, not, the restaurants is a new thing, but small um, shops in which one. Uh, person can go and can eat kebab, for example. This is uh, one of the miniature which depict inside of a kebab shop from the 17th century. Uh, it is from the procession of the guilds organized in order to celebrate a um, festival, um, festival, an imperial festival organized for the circumcision of the sons of the Sultan. And, but this miniature gives us very uh, information about how was the um, food preparation or how was the old food shops in this era. Charlotte makers here we see, for example, and then we have a uh, palouze. Palouze is a kind of um, pudding, uh, pudding in English, but in real term, it is a kind of uh, pudding made with starch and fruit juice and sugar. And soup makers, we receive kebab shops. I really enjoy to watch, to look to this miniature because I can see how the habits are really same even today. We have some kebab on skewers here and bread and people, they enjoy eating their lamb and mutton kebab. But this is something really interesting. This is something that we can't find anymore in Istanbul. Caviar, black caviar obtained from the storage in Mersin was uh, an important part of the diet in Istanbul in the Ottoman era, I assume also in the Byzantine era. And today in Karakur, there is a Han called Havyar Han. Probably it was the place where the um, trade of caviar is organized. Uh, this is uh, mm, this is from the 18th century, unknown. Uh, I have this from Marianne Yerasimos, and it is known as caviar seller, Marche, Marchand de Caviar, really strange, but the consumption of black caviar was quite different in the past. Even in the Ottoman palace during the Ramadan, uh, black caviar was served as iftariyelik, just before, just on the, at the beginning uh, during the break of the fast. So it was really uh, normal to consume caviar among the Muslims because today people, I don't know why people, they think that maybe the consumption of fish or shellfish was not really popular among the Ottoman Muslim in the past. But according to our research, we understand that no, uh, the boat in the Ottoman palace, the consumption of fish was popular. Of course, from century to century, it may be different, but at least for the 19th century, I see that, yes, there was. Greek fish seller, again, from the 18th century. And the coffee, uh, as you know, coffee is a part of the Ottoman culture since the middle of the uh, 16th century, since the 1553. Uh, the first coffee houses is opened at Tahtakale. And since then, uh, of course, it is a long story. At the beginning, it will be forbidden. It will be treated as a unknown uh, beverage, which should be uh, understand. But at the end, coffee is accepted for from everyone. And coffee became an important part of the Ottoman culture uh, in Istanbul, in the Istanbul household, in the Ottoman palace, and also coffee houses became important as places of sociability in which uh, men, they meet and they chat and they make politics or they play chess and black gammon, etc. And this miniature is from the 16th century. Since the Byzantine era, um, apart from uh, street food sellers, small food shops in which one type of food item is sold, tavern that we call in Turkish mehane uh, existed. During the Ottoman era also, mehane will continue to a part of the uh, city, especially in neighborhood um, where non-Muslim or sailors were present, like in Galata or Fera, taverns um, will continue to exist. 
uh, until the 19th century, the major kind of alcoholic beverage consumed in Istanbul will be wine. Uh, it is surprising for most of the people because today rak that we can define as a kind of uzo or arak um, defined as the um, most um, popular alcoholic beverage in Turkey uh, is not popular before the 19th century. And uh, the production of wine and uh, the production of wine, the trade of wine uh, was allowed to non-Muslims. Um, they pay tax and that's why Ottoman government supported uh, the continuation of production of wine or the existence of taran. The non-Muslims normally they are not allowed to drink but according to lots of sources we, are, we understand that Muslim people also they consume wine and alcoholic beverage. Most of the dishes which, which are a part of today's traditional Turkish cuisine and Istanbul cuisine existed since the 15th century. Some of them are originated from Central Asia. Some of them are originated from medieval Arab cuisine, Seljuk cuisine or Byzantine cuisine. When we consulted the sources, we, are, we see that soups called shorba, uh, pilaf called dane, kebabs and stews, yahni and kebab prepared with both mutton, lamb, poultry, and fish are present in the cuisine. Meatballs, köfte, uh, as you may see the list, uh, eggs, dishes, stuffed vegetable and fruits called dolma. Today, um, mostly uh, dolma, stuffed um, zucchini or stuffed eggplant or stuffed wine leaves are the most known types of dolma and sarma in Turkish cuisine. In the past, Queens or melon or apple fruits also can be stuffed. This is something interesting that is not practiced anymore today. Bereks, pickles of vegetable and different types of desserts from baklava to kadayif, from shura to sütlaç existed since the 16th, 15th century. The food is served in a different manner until the Tanzimat era. On a low table, no chairs, no high table, no individual plates, no individual uh, cutlery, only some spoons, spoons for soup, for pilaf, dane, and for fruit compote called hoshab. And um, people, they eat from the same plate, from the same dish. And that's why washing hands before and after um, is an important part of the table manners. And uh, according to lots of uh, book of uh, table manners, we understand that the ceremony of eating did not last for a long time. The food is something to be respected and people don't speak too much, just they eat. Once they finish the meal, the con conversation starts with coffee and sherbet on a different table. Because table is portable and can be prepared anywhere we want, uh, the concept of yemek odası à manger in English, um, a special room for the end of 19th century. It, it will be a part of the modernization era. So for a long time, the food will be served in that manner, but as you know, it is not surprising. The food is shared also in Europe until the um, 17th century. The use of forks and knives won't be a part of French food culture until the 18th century. So other examples of table manners, eating fish from the middle, baklava procession, a ceremonial dish. Hmm. Um, I hope I'm not too late. I need again a 15 minutes. You need 15 more minutes, Özge Hocam, if I hear you clearly. Uh, first, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, I, yeah, I need 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, yes. for you. Please. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Please tamam, please teşekkürler. Yes. Okay. Mentioned about the mentioned about the importance of land dishes inherited from the Byzantine culture. Land dishes will be a part of the Ottoman food culture, of course, during the following centuries, because among the uh, Christian communities, both in Armenian and in Greek communities, um, during a, uh, lots of days per year, people, they are not allowed to eat animal and animal-based product, and they created new dishes. Yalancı dolma in Turkish is one of them. We can translate into Turkish as fake dolma. Why fake? Because there is no meat inside. And yalancı dolma or yalancı sarma today is practiced and prepared everywhere in Turkey, not only in Turkey, but also in all territories of the Ottoman Empire, in Balkan region, in Greece, in Bulgaria. Here we have a nice example that I made for one of my book, flavored with sour cherries. Instead of lemon, sour cherries or green plums, January can be used uh, to serve this uh, stuffed wine leaves. Inside, rice and spices, lots of onions and fresh herbs, pine nuts and currants are present instead of meat. Another dish is pilaki or pileki. Uh, fish is sometimes is allowed. So fish pilaki is defined as a dish prepared by Christian priest uh, during Lent in an Ottoman dictionary from the 18th century. At the beginning, plaki is prepared for with fish and shellfish, but we see that just on the eve of the, uh, maybe at the beginning of the 20th century, in the cookbooks, we started, we start to see plaki made with beans and um, kidney beans. Uh, and so, and then today in Turkish cuisine, 90% of the population know about barbunya pilaki or fasulye pilaki, but fish pilaki became something uh, forgotten. Topik is an Armenian land dish, which became really popular nowadays. One of the famous meze served in Istanbul Meyhane. Uh, outside of this dish is made from chickpea, Chickpea um, became a kind of paste and inside the chickpea paste there is uh, sauteed onions, caramelized onions and uh, mixed with tahini flavored with some raisins and pine nuts and uh, served with a little bit cinnamon. Sweet and sweet and salty taste of topic is really interesting and this, is, this dish also is really typical land dish of Istanbul Armenian community. Uh, which existed from the past. In some of the examples of dishes inherited from the Sephardic cuisines um, became a part of Istanbul cuisine, but some of them are not. I think the community, yani, these Sephardic dishes are the group of dishes which became really um, restrictedly um, produced among the Sephardic communities. I mean, for example, this leek meatball, prasa köftesi, uh, did, not, uh, did not become a part of Istanbul cuisine. Still today, prasa köftesi is practiced by the uh, Sephardic Jewish uh, families, uh, people in their house, in their kitchen. When we arrived to 19th century, we are lucky we had cookbooks. Some of the examples of cookbooks, the first one published in 1844, which will be published in uh, several times. Another one called Housewife and uh, two other one. And also some cookbooks published in Armenian alphabet, but in Turkish. When we compare all of these cookbooks, more than uh, eight cookbooks, we see some similarity, we see some differences, but at the end, the, the, the techniques of the dishes resemble each other. And there are also some differences. For example, in uh, Armenian cookbooks, pork dishes are present or the use of wine in cooking is present. Or uh, one of the important reality of the 19th century is the influence of the Western style of cooking. And so Western style of cooking called Alda Franga is much, more present in uh, Armenian cookbooks. The 19th century witnessed two novelties. Firstly, 
The adaptation and introduction of new vegetables originated from Americas, like tomatoes, potatoes, green peppers, zucchini, green beans, paprika, allspice. These will become common ingredients used in Ottoman cuisine for the, in the 19th century. Cookbooks are published, and in the cookbooks we see also uh, the beginning of the influence of the European style cooking called Alla Franca. And we see the emergence of two concepts, uh, Alla Franca, Alla Turca. Alla Franca cooking, Alla uh, tableways, and Alla Turca cooking, Alla Turca uh, tableways. Alla Turca tableways is on the left. I mean, eating with hands on love table called Sini, sharing from the same plate. Alda Franga, new table manner, uh, adapted from European uh, culture, eating on a raised, high table, raised chair with forks and knives in, in individual uh, plates. And in the 19th century, we see that the preference of the elite for porcelains will change instead of the China ware and um, Iznik ware, we see um, say, uh, porcelains um, of Sèvres, Maison, Limoges will be preferred, and Sèvres and Maison will produce porcelains just for the Ottoman clientele. And when we, you visit the Topkapu Palace, the kitchens, you see this separation of um, taste with the examples of uh, plates and uh, porcelains very well. So these new table manners will be started to be uh, adopted since the end of the reign of the Mahmoud II, I mean 1840s. After the 1850s, we see that among the Ottoman elite, eating with forks and knives became much more accepted. But you know, it is not something easy to be accepted by all of the population in Istanbul, not and also not in the empire. The passage from old table manner to new table manner will continue even on, during the Republican era. Schools, military service, um, newspaper, cookbooks, um, schools for girls will be new uh, places where this new table manner will be taught uh, as a part of modernity. And at the end, eating by hand will be considered as an ugly, unhealthy, unhygienic thing, but the new taught by everyone. 19th century Istanbul is um, has lots of contradiction. On one hand, we have Pera and Galata with a European looking type of Western style architecture with some new establishment like hotels and cafes and restaurants. For example, here I have a list of the restaurants uh, exist in 1868 in Pera. And all of the name of the restaurants uh, here we have some of them we don't have, but these restaurants are modern style restaurants uh, inspired from the French model. So in 19th century Istanbul, both we have street food seller, esnaf lokantaları, cook shops, and also after the 1850s in Pera, in Galata, we have European style restaurants, cafe, hotels, where an Ottoman gentleman may go and may eat his lunch in Alla Franga manner by using forks and knives. And when he returned back to his home in Üsküdar, he may continue to eat on love table as described in Tanzimat. Um, time. So the passage from uh, Alla Turka table manner to Alla Franga table manner uh, inspired also the, uh, the um, adaptation of some new dishes inspired from European style. So when we analyze the cookbooks published at the end of the 19th century in Istanbul and also the menus at, at the same time, we see that some new dishes inspired from European cuisine, especially from, from French cuisine, um, exist in cookbooks and some of them continue to be a part of today's Istanbul cuisine, some of them not. For example, the concept of making a garniture, the concept of making a sauce like a sauce bechamel is an alla franga technique uh, adapt, adopted from French cuisine which become a part of Turkish cuisine today. Most of the cake and pastry tart and uh, shoe pastry, profiterol, eclair, are inspired and in, in adopted from French cuisine. Uh, dishes prepared with veal and beef, 
like roast beef, beefsteak, bonfile are examples of European style of dishes adopted from uh, French cuisine toward the end of 19th century. So these are the examples. So the westernization or modernization in culinary manners and increasing in some degree, not too much, um, is in, was inspired first by the organization of uh, banquets organized for foreign guests in the Ottoman palace. I mean, uh, starting from the end of the Mahmud II, Sultan Mahmud II, foreign guests like high dignitaries uh, will started to be um, welcomed with European style of banquets organized like that one in Beylerbeyi Palace um, in the uh, 19th century. So we see a banquet organized 100% Allah Franga style and the dishes also served during these banquets represent both two cultures, Ottoman and the French one. Here we have an example from the beginning of the 20th century, a menu from the art Archives. On the left, we have the menu written in French. On the right, we have menu written in Ottoman Turkish. Mm -hmm. And when we analyze the uh, content of the dishes, we understand that there are some dishes directly from French cuisine, from 19th century French cuisine, like potage creme royale or supreme de becas clamar. But also there are some traditional dishes like kilal and burek, two important dishes which exists always in these types of menu, even the menus um, represent the Alla Franca style. So lastly, um, image from the Yildiz Palace inside of the dinner hall, again representing how the table manners are changed, how the decoration of the table is changed. So the story of the Istanbul cuisine until the end of the um, 19th century is in that way. Uh, Lastly, since the 1880s, we can see the influence of French cuisine, but don't think that the taste of the French cuisine will be so remarkable and high. Uh, still, the, all of the traditional dishes will constitute the core of the Istanbul cuisine, but with some new taste, the cuisine will be enriched. I always give an example of dish called Hünkar Beyendi in order to represent and uh, the meeting of European and Ottoman cuisine. Uh, Hünkari Beyendi is a dish made of two parts. Uh, we have an eggplant puree cooked with a sauce bechamel flavored with grated cheese. And this eggplant puree is served with a stew of lamb. So inside this Beyendi, the presence of bechamel represents the Aldafranga style of cuisine and um, the rest Ottoman. So at the end, the meeting of West and East represented on the creation of new dishes. So I think that's all. Thank you for listening. Maybe Zeynep, now we can talk a little bit about, about two dishes um, that we will see on video, Queen's Dessert and Karnyarık. Normally, uh, our chef, uh, Eric Rupin, our director, at Cordon Bleu, you know, at Özgen University, uh, we are working with Le Cordon Bleu in our department. Normally, Eric, he, he prepared three recipes representing both in the Ottoman era, we selected uh, together, but because of these circumstances, we can't do this cooking demo. Instead, we have two traditional Turkish recipes, both of them have some come, are rooted back to the ancient Ottoman past. First, karniyarık. Karniyarık is an eggplant dish. Um, literally, karniyarık, how to translate? Split bell or something like this, but... Slice, um, slice it. Slice, Slice yes. belly, öyle bir şey, değil mi? Slice belly. Aylin, she's there. Maybe she can help me. I saw her, Aylin and Eytan. Uh, so, Basically, it is uh, one of the split belly. Normally, they translate it as split belly. Yes, oh. as I mentioned. Thank you, Aiden. So, uh, split belly eggplant. Inside the belly of the eggplant, we prepared a mixture of 
uh, made with minced meat, minced meat. Today, in the recipe, minced beef is used, but traditionally, instead of beef, always mutton is used in Ottoman cuisine or lamb. The consumption of veal and beef is really, really new in Turkish cuisine or in Ottoman cuisine. So minced meat uh, cooked with onions, flavored with some tomatoes and parsley, tomato paste, salt, pepper constitute the uh, stuffing ingredients. And then uh, we fry the aubergine or the eggplant. For this dish, we need a uh, long aubergine. And uh, why split belly? Because we split the belly of the aubergine into uh, the half, but uh, in a vertical way, not horizontal. And we don't cut really, just we cut. And so on one hand, we fry the eggplant. On the other hand, we prepare the stuffing agent made with minced meat and other ingredients. And then we stuff the eggplant and uh, we decorate with some tomato and pasty and still we, we braise it, we cook with the addition of small amount of water uh, in the oven or on flame inside a pot. But let's imagine the Ottoman version from the beginning of the 19th century or the 18th century. Firstly, tomato will be absent because tomatoes and tomato paste did not, did not exist in Istanbul cuisine before the 1800s. And even in 1840s, the presence of tomato or tomato paste is rare. So the taste of the dish should be different. And inside the old recipe, pine nuts, donalık fıstık, uh, and raisins can be present. And the flavor of the minced meat should be a little bit much more sweet and salty. Probably cinnamon will be inside because cinnamon is one of the spices preferred much in 19th century Istanbul cuisine, like black pepper. Today, it is something really strange for us because we like cinnamon with sweet dishes in milk pudding, in sweet lunch, or in apple pie. But it, when we look to 19th century Istanbul recipe, we see that cinnamon is everywhere on grilled fish, in fish pilaki, in meatballs, and I think it will be nice. But this recipe also is really important and nice because uh, eggplant, karnıyarık, is one of the emblematic dish of Turkish cuisine served with rice pilaf and also with jajik, uh, I mean, a kind of yogurt classical lunch dish for summer for spring terms. So I advise you to make this recipe. For the details, I think Eric will explain us during his uh, demo. Queen's dessert. Queen's dessert, I think it's one of the oldest type of dessert in Ottoman cuisine, rooted back because uh, fruits are used in cuisine, in Ottoman cuisine. Um, it is one of the uh, examples of uh, confi uh, fruit confit. I mean, queens are uh, cooked inside uh, of a sugar. Uh, so the idea, I don't know, the, yes. You know, the color of the queen's dessert is important. It shouldn't be pale. It should be a little bit slightly red color. So when you cook the queens, don't throw away the seeds, but you can put some of the seeds inside the pan because it will give a color and also the peels of the queens is important. So there are different techniques. I don't know which technique uh, chef he practiced. I think the best technique, but my technique is much more different. I have the queens, I cut them into a half. And of course, um, I deceit, I mean, um, I peel the queens, I cut into half, and inside of each uh, half cut queens, I put one tablespoon of sugar. And then, uh, for example, let's think that I prepare with three queens again. Yes, again, the same thing. I don't put too much water, just um, 
100 milliliter water, maybe. And I cook on flame for long time, two hours, on a little, little slow. Um, at the end, the quince became caramelized and the color returned into a kind of red and it is really nice, I advise, but this recipe also is great. And serving the quince with clotted cream is important. Clotted cream called kaymak is one of the delicacy, classical delicacy of Istanbul Ottoman cuisine made from buffalo milk. Kaymak contain 80% of fat so um, it gives a nice flavor um, and still we can find good kaymak in Istanbul in some shops. So I hope you will enjoy the recipes. So if you have any question, it, it's, it's a pleasure for me. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Sabancı. It was very delicious presentation. <laughs> um, is, is there any uh, question? Uh, uh, to Professor Samanji uh, from the there are some uh, chatting uh, amazing and those kind of uh, uh, comments that I have it okay <laughs> there is the... okay okay uh, I think it's the, no no question uh, uh, we can okay. see the videos if you like. Yeah, okay. Yes. Let me share my screen first with the recipe of Fukarni Eric. So it's it's Eric Rupan who cooks it, right? Uh, as Goja. Uh, just let us know. Yes. Today I'm going to cook the second main dish for the Turkish cuisine and we will prepare a very classical dish so-called karnyarik stuffed eggplant in tomato sauce it is a very classic dish and uh, cooked in every home in Turkey so your mother or grandmother may have different recipes so we have a little bit of more modern variation here the ingredients we use for this dish is the Kemmer patlijan, it's the long one, the round one is the postan. Then you need sweet pepper, we need butter for the rice, we need onions, and we need minced lamb. We have here a red pepper paste. In some recipe you would use normal tomato paste. And we have also some red pepper flakes, meaning chili, bull pepper. Good. As a first part, we're going to do start frying the eggplants. You need to heat a generous amount of vegetable oil in a flat frying pan. To cut the eggplant, you remove the, the green on the top and you peel off stripes. Ajak means you leave always one free. So partly the skin stays, partly it's removed. In many recipe, we get the advice to put the aubergine in salted water, soak it for 20 minutes to remove the bitterness. However, the new breeds of eggplant, they don't need to be soaked anymore. We're going to cut, leaving one centimeter from the beginning, one centimeter for the eight. You make an in insertion, you cut with your small knife, but you don't cut through. You just cut a little bit more than half down the aubergine. As you can see here, one centimeter from here, one centimeter from here. At this stage, if you really feel you need to, you have some bitterness or your type of aubergine, yeah, you would add salt and leave it for 20 minutes. 
then you would rinse it with water. Okay. Now I have heated the oil. Now we're going to pan fry them on all sides. Medium heat. Then we're going to prepare the tomatoes. We're going to remove the skin. So we use the French technique and Monde. In some recipe, tomatoes are used with the skin. In Turkish cuisine, you would peel it off with a knife like this. However, I use the French version where we blanch it for a few seconds and then refresh in iced water. You have to soak the rice in warm water and leave it for 10-15 minutes and change regularly the water until it becomes clear. After refreshing the tomatoes, we're going to peel them. So after peeling, removing the skins of the tomatoes, we're going to cut them in quarters and we remove the seeds. Half of a tomato we keep back, we will use as the decoration on the carniarek. Then we're going to cut the tomato petals into concasse, meaning we dicing the tomato. So, after the tomatoes, we keep them on site. They will be later added to the filling. Regularly turn the aubergine. Okay, let's cook the rice. After rinsing the rice a few times, I strain the rice and let it properly drain. Then I melt the butter. Just a little bit of vegetable oil. And then we're going to toast the rice. In the meantime, the chicken stock is slowly heated on the side. Keep an eye on your aubergine. Regularly turn them around. You can see they're getting softer. Soon they will be cooked. This one is nearly ready. This one needs still some more. Now the rice has to be well toasted over a medium heat. So after uh, the rice gets drier, crispy, it is time to add the hot chicken stock. We add some salt. No pepper.
We cover the rice, bring to boil, and then on low, very low heat, we simmer for 15 minutes. In the meantime, the eggplants are cooked. We remove them from the fat, put them on tissue paper, to remove the excess fat. So in the same oil, we're gonna do fry the peppers. It's a long green pepper, can be also a sivri biber, but it should be a sweet pepper, not a spicy one. Now we're gonna do start with the filling. We have here a minced lamb, the concasse tomatoes which we prepared beforehand. We have some red pepper paste, some chili paste, some onions diced, and we need also a little bit of lemon. We heat the saute pan just put a little bit of vegetable oil. Then we start with sweating the onions. Then we add the meat. After the meat is browned, we add the red pepper paste. Some of the chili flakes. Be careful with the amount, just like two pinches. And then, some of the tomatoes. Or all of them. If you don't want to cut the tomatoes into dices or like concasse, you can also take the whole tomato and grate it on a box grater and add to the meat filling. Add some seasoning, salt, pepper, if it's too dry you can just give half spoon of water just to have some moist. Keep an eye on the rice. It's nicely cooking on the side. It shouldn't boil too much. Just bring it to the boil. Keep it on the side over very low temperature. You could also add garlic, that's optional. A little bit lemon juice. So after simmering the filling for five to ten minutes, we check the test seasoning.
Then we transfer the fried aubergine to a tray or a casserole to where we're going to cook it. With the help of two spoons, we spread the aubergine apart to make room for the filling. Now we can spoon in the filling. The filling should be more dry than a bolognese sauce. Then we place the fried peppers on top and the tomato slice. Then for the sauce, in our recipe it's asked for beef stock. In more traditional Turkish recipes you would find water mixed with tomato paste and then you would add this kind of tomato sauce around the aubergine. In our, in our recipe today, we use a brown stock. Then it goes, goes uncovered into the oven for about half an hour at a temperature of 180 degrees. So after 15 minutes, we check the rice. All the liquid should be gone. So you take it off the, off the heat. You stir it. You loosen the grains. And then either you use a, a towel in a kitchen towel, in our case I use kitchen tissue and then you let it rest on the side. This will absorb the steam of the rice and makes it more grainy, less like lapa type. Now one half an hour is finished. We can remove the patlijan from the oven. Which is gonna do reduce the cooking liquid. If it's too much reduced, you can add a spoon of of water. Then we strain off the sauce. Seasoning is okay. Now we come to the portioning. You can even choose to make it on the same plate or you can serve it separately, a little bit more elegant. It 
See, when you rest the rice, it becomes fluffy. It doesn't stick together. That's how a good rice should be. Voila, chefs, that's an interpretation of the carniaric dish. Bon appétit. So that was the first dish, carniaric. Now, if I may, I'm going to share uh, the second dish, the dessert, uh, the queen's dessert. Wait. Let me share. Hello, everybody. Today we are going to make the Queen's Ayva uh, Tatlesa, um, which is the Turkish uh, dessert. So for this, we will need a pan, saucepan. We need the uh, apple, uh, clove, cinnamon, and for the uh, sugar and for decoration, some uh, pistachio. We need also a cheese cloth to put the spice and the seeds of the uh, quince. And uh, uh, that's it. And we we'll need a, a Parisienne a spoon, a peeler, and an office knife. So we are going to peel the, the quince first. We cut the bottom and the top in order to make it flat. We peel it. We cut it in two. And we remove the seeds separately. These seeds will be used within with the spices, within the syrup. And the seeds are actually have some pectin that actually will give some uh, gelatin for the syrup that we will use afterwards for the dish. So it's important to keep the seeds. Also, uh, it might give also a little color to the uh, sauce. So once this is done, we are going to display the quince into the saucepan, cover it with water and cook it for about seven minutes. Once it has been boiling for seven minutes, we are going to add sugar inside. As well as the spice, the seeds, which we will wrap into a cheesecloth. So we do it, so we take a a square cheese cloth and take the angles in order to wrap it properly up and 
and we put it into the syrup and we are going to boil it again about seven eight minutes so once it has been boiling long enough and that they are already slightly softened we are removing the queens into a dish and we are going to cook it into the oven from 30 minutes to one hour. This will depend, of course, of your uh, queens, how mature they are, and so it is very important to keep the seeds in order that it gives the color and brings all the pectin for the dish. Now we are going to fill it up with grated apple. So we take the granny smith with the big uh, grating side. And we fill up the quince with the grated granny smith. And we put it for cooking in an oven at 160 degrees. So once the uh, queens are soft enough, we see how they are soft and then we will move from the oven and we are going to put it into a fridge. We will serve it cool. So once the uh, queens are cold, uh, we are going to plate the dessert. Uh, one point to notice is that the color of the, uh, the sauce might be uh, brownish or reddish. This will depend on the queens and the seeds especially. So you might, if it's not up to your liking, put a dot, a small dot of red, if you want to have it slightly pink for your presentation. So we, we might also glaze the queens before plating in order that the whole queens get shiny and appealing. Then we display on the plate. And put all around this gelified syrup. One can as well keep the seeds in order to give some small dots into the syrup. And we add for the color and creating a contrast a little bit uh, grated pistachio bon appetit Marika. so 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 I think it's finished, right? Yes, yes, I got <laughs> it. was very delicious. Very delicious. <laughs> I think now, it was. I, I, so I'm going to the kitchen now. <laughs> Harika, it's amazing. It was, it was though, although I would, uh, I must mention that my aunt uh, cooks the queen's dessert uh, somehow different. For instance, we don't put right. this green apple in the middle. Right. I mean, uh, yeah, right. you can, right. yeah. I hope you enjoyed, everybody uh, enjoyed the, the, these recipes. We also shared them uh, via chat. So if you would like to try in your kitchen, uh, <laughs> They are guests. Uh, so we uh, still have some time for any comments or uh, questions and answers. Uh, 
I don't know if, yes, Özgehojam is also here. Uh, from the audience, so would you like to share your comments on, on the, the specific, specific uh, uh, recipes of Turkish cuisine? Uh, let me remind you uh, that uh, we were planning a uh, autumn Byzantine recipe, which we shared the, the, the recipe with you already. But due to the lockdown that started today in Turkey, our chefs were not be able to go to the kitchen in our campus. Uh, but we had the, uh, the possibility, uh, thankfully, to share with you this, uh, again, very specific uh, recipes, Karniyarık and Ayva Tatlısı. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, if you have any comments, anything you would like to share? Well, uh, hello, my name is Tomasz Bolecki. Uh, it's really funny. I mean, I understand the lockdown isn't good at the moment in Poland. We are finishing the lockdown and we're opening. So that's the opposite. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed <laughs> that uh, it will happen soon in Turkey. But I'm a big fan of Turkish kitchen. So uh, it's just a shame, but it was very, very, very nice. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, this desert uh, Quincy seems to be uh, reddish, but uh, mm -hmm. in the kitchen it seems to be yellowish. Uh, how do you, uh, is that, I mean, uh, is that reddish that we eat in the restaurants is uh, fake or the other thing is correct? What is the... <laughs> <laughs> the technique. I tried to explain at the beginning, you know, what makes queens red is the seeds and the peel of the queens. So, ayva kabu ve çekirde. If we put also the seeds and the peel um, in the tangere, in the pot, um, the color will turn into a red. And I'm against boiling queens. As I mentioned, if we put the queens inside the, of a tangere, and if we don't put too much water, just um, 100 milliliter, even less water over a low flame, but for a long time, one and a half hour, it will turn out to be red red. But in the restaurants, most of the time they use red dye, organic red dye also. I see, I see, I see. But you can do without putting um, um, a red dye inside the... I will show you the photo if you want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Also, clove. Clover. Clove. What is yeah. karanfil? Right? Clove gives a taste. Clove you can put, but it doesn't change the color. Ah. It's a nice um, scent. It gives a nice odor uh, to the dish. So, uh, any other questions? I hope you will come to Istanbul and you will have possibility to eat uh, real dishes <laughs> <laughs> in restaurants in Mehane. Uh, yeah, I think it is best with when served with chantilly with whipped cream. It is, you know, it is uh, Alla Franca style, uh, hocam, uh, chantilly, creme chantilly. Yes, good, but I prefer with kaymak. Oh, kaymak, kaymak. Cream. Kaymak is the better. Best, better. Best. And yani it, it is not the same thing as uh, creme chantilly. Creme chantilly. And also maybe um, ice cream. You know, uh, uh, milk ice cream. Kaymaklı dondurma in, made in Turkey style with salep. Salep, what is salep? Salep is the powdered extracts from the root of a kind of an orchid. So it gives a texture uh, to the uh, milk. It makes thicken the milk. So the Turkish style ice cream is quite different from the Italian one. In Italian gelato, you know, there are some eggs and uh, um, cream, but in Turkish style, no. Buçin Hanım, Professor Özge, there is a question. Could you please elaborate on the usage of cinnamon in dishes? With connection to rumeli and Crete, my mother used to put cinnamon in köfte, patates, and chicken dishes, yes. It is an Ottoman taste, uh, Burçin Hanım. 
the use of cinnamon in 19th century Ottoman recipe is popular, very abundant. In köfte, in fish pilaki, in grilled fish, for example, you grill the fish in the oven and you sprinkle a little bit cinnamon. So with some kebab, uh, meat kebab on skewers. So the idea to separate cinnamon as a taste suitable for dessert is a modern preference. This is the same thing also in Western kitchen also in medieval European cuisine also we see the use of cinnamon everywhere. So I think your uh, connection with Rumeli and Crete reminds me Ottoman taste more. Yes. Uh, you know, we try to understand the past of the uh, the flavor of the past with our modern understanding. For example, for us, a meal starts with a soup or with an entree and ends with a dessert. But in the past, it wasn't the case, especially in the Ottoman era. We don't know really well the order of the dishes served to the table. A meal may start with a rice pilaf, we will continue with a kebab, and then a baklava may come, and then a stuffed vegetable dolma and burek. So a mixture of taste, a sweet and salty and sour together. But with the Western style of service, it means starting with soup, with um, dessert, it's a French service that we adapted also our menu service in Turkey also in that. So I think cinnamon has a relation with this. So uh, are there any um, comments? Uh, I would like to thank uh, Tomas, uh, if I'm pronouncing correctly, for uh, your good wishes. <laughs> uh, we have still three weeks, at least three weeks to go. Um, but who knows? Uh, hopefully after that, uh, we will uh, be opportunity to get together, uh, maybe. maybe. Uh, Alessandro Kamitz. Uh, the question is, why alla franga e alla turca is actually in Italian? The two, these two sayings are in <laughs> Italian. Alla franga, alla turca, alla tedesca. This is Italian. Why is it in Italian? Before the 19th century, the Italian language is much more, um, how to say, uh, influenced much more uh, Ottoman language in 17th, 18th century. And the, I think it can be a continuation of this or, so the, the answer is not really clear. I don't know. I may suppose some things, but maybe, you know, some nautical terms are uh, uh, borrowed from Italian, the present, the use of Italian language in Galata, maybe. Maybe, I don't know, we should think. Yeah, maybe maybe it's part of the commercial life, you know. Yes. Uh, many years, is Italians and uh, commerce people is uh, governing. That's the, and it, uh, they have a good relationship with the Ottoman Empire. Uh, French dominion, not dominion. I mean, French influence is started late lately, yes. but before before Italians and Latin culture. Yes, I exactly. It, it, it was very dominant. Yes, I tried to say this. Point. Right. <laughs> but um, yes, I think. And in Alla Franca, uh, you know, uh, in Frank style. Yeah, do you have anything such as Alla Greca in the Greek style? Uh, what does it mean? In the Greek style. Okay. Alla Greca. I understand. I mean, what kind of habits the, or yeah. styles are part no, no, of No, no, as a wording. The, uh, uh, Otto Ottomans are not uh, uh, anticipating to uh, to use Greek, uh, the word of Greek. Uh, instead of uh, they were accepting Byzantine, so that's a kind of a big difference. So that's uh, there is not a too much Greek uh, or Greco type of words in our language. Instead of we have Roman, Rome, or Rome, those kind of words. We have. Yeah, but I, when I was asking, alla, alla franca. Also, alla Francesca, we used to say in Italian. Ah, Francesca. Alla Franca, alla Turca. This is Italian. 
So in the same style, yeah, yeah. you could have alla greca, alla araba, <laughs> alla tedesca. Alla arabia. The examples, <laughs> yes. So I was wondering if there is such a thing as alla greca or alla bulgara, alla russa, you know? It, it depends those on the influence, I think. Those who wants to practice the original recipe that we plan to do, maybe I may advise some things. These are easy recipe to do. The first one is fava, great broad bean. Uh, just if you follow the recipe, you will be successful. Just you you boil the broad bean with onions and then you mix it with olive oil, etc. The second recipe is grilled. Uh, I think grilled swordfish in bay leaf and bay fish. Yeah, defne dalu and yapra served with a kind of hazelnut puree called tarator. Tarator made with some nuts like hazelnut, walnut, or pine nut, one of the popular uh, sauce of 19th century Istanbul, probably originated from the Byzantine era, which became really popular in the 19th century. And also a kind of salad, I think I remember, it's made from spinach, again with, with the tarator. Uh, Özge Hocam, you mentioned about the mantı. Uh... So is it derived from that is the Chinese wonton? Uh, can be. <laughs> Originally, the word manta is Chinese, Alper Hocam. And etymologically, it is a Chinese word. Firstly, known, yani the first manta recipe is from the 200 uh, before, uh, after Christ in China. But this manta is a stuffed kind of dough, but we are not sure what is it. And then we should wait until the 13th century um, in a poem written uh, for um, Chinese emperor originated from Mongolia. You know, 13th century in China, there is the Mongolian Empire. Uh, we see again the Mantu. And so it can be the original uh, inspiration of Mantu is from northern China, but it is another question. You know, there is an interaction of culture between the Mongol and Turkic tribe on the northern part of China and the Chinese people, and maybe it is a result of that. The service style of manta with yogurt is nomadic Mongol-Turkic contribution. And then um, manta is called as uh, tutumashi firstly, and then tutmach and tatar böreği different uh, names. Uh, why I'm talking too much about Mantı? Because recently I wrote a short article for Mantı for Istanbul Biennale next week, next year. <laughs> so there I, I explored the different um, historical period in Mantı history. Yes. Uh, may I interrupt you? Uh, thank you for the presentation and also for these uh, recipes. I've already tried to cook that fava. This was my first time, actually. I've already uh, bought the ingredients uh, for the recipe. And uh, I was wondering about these uh, old techniques of cooking, actually. Do you uh, have a, a plan or do you have a study or a project at Özyen University? Do you plan to, uh, maybe you are doing so, uh, to analyze and uh, actually to study in detail those old techniques and how to maybe reuse or modernize or revitalize those mm -hmm. techniques. I, I was really wondering that. Uh, of thing. course, it is, it is one of my major interest area. Um, for the beginning, uh, I I already tried to adapt the old technique to modern era. And I, in 2006, with a chef, with a friend, we prepared a book called Flavors of Istanbul. We selected some recipes from the old cookbooks because, you know, in the old cookbooks, there are no uh, quantities, no details, just it is like a story. And you try to understand. We adapted them. And also it's a part of research, of course, to analyze the changes in culinary techniques. I mean, uh, to identify different kitchen equipment, different uh, words, um, language used in cooking. All of them, I try to study uh, with my um, 
graduate student. You know, uh, we don't have a graduate program at gastronomy department, but we have another one in uh, architecture faculty, design technology yes. and society. Within this program, we have a gastronomy track. And there, uh, with some of my students, we try to explore this unanswered question. For example, with one of my students, we are working about kebab. <laughs> I mean, how kebab became a kind of Adana kebab and how was the changes from past to present, yes. But there are lots of subjects uh, needs to be studied in this field. Uh, from the uh, kitchen, kitchen equipment, techniques, taste, uh, rituals, etc. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, merhaba. <laughs> so, uh, are there any uh, comments or? Uh... There is a one question in chatting. Good. Uh, Burçin hocam, uh, would you like to? Uh, Turn on your microphone and, uh, you know, part, um, uh, ask your question yourself or may I read it? Oh, there you are. Hello. Okay, hello to everyone again. Uh, I was wondering, since in the university, in Ozean University, you both have the gastronomy department and also architectural heritage mm -hmm. or architectural department, it is a very... Um, interesting subject to look into the spaces, the heritage of the um, spaces of cooking or food production. I was wondering if you have that kind of collaboration or students work on that. So can you repeat your question, sorry? A collaboration between two departments. Between the architectural two, two, two faculty faculties. or the... Uh, uh, people who are related to heritage in, in the architectural faculty. It is, a, uh, it is something that to be researched more, the spaces of cooking or spaces of food production, the heritage spaces. Yes. That's, I was wondering if there is a collaboration because you have both of these uh, faculties in the, the same university. So uh, it would be good to maybe connect them through that. That's a question to the university, actually. <laughs> well, I think it's a, uh, some, some students are coming and uh, taking our classes, especially in research methods from gas, gastronomy. Uh, they are very successful students, and uh, especially for making the research. Uh, but uh, uh, I think the kitchen is an important research area for us, for architect Department of Architecture, according to the uh, evolution of the uh, this uh, unique spaces, but on the other hand, it is highly uh, connected to the technological devices and the innovation of the technological de devices uh, according to the history. Um, we need a kind of a more research. I think might be a kind of a good good bridge with the uh, Department of Gastronomy and the Department of Architecture. We can do a kind of a bridge. Team, hocam, yeah. you, hocam. Yes. maybe yes. in the future. Exactly, because I have lots of colleagues, uh, architect, uh, histori historians of architecture, uh, who have a deep interest in food culture studies. And also, for example, Tülay Artan, one of the famous Ottoman historians, originally she's, an, uh, she's from the architecture. <laughs> and also uh, Stefan Yerasimov, he has an interest. So always there is... There, we we here we, I have Eileen. She's an architecture. I saw Typhoon. And he is also an interest in cuisine. There is lots of common things between the discipline of architecture and how to say food history. And yes, the, I'm, yani, yeah. in terms of uh, yani, kitchen as a space is one sub subject, uh, and also um, spaces where food is eaten is another subject. So when I try to analyze the changes in 19th century Istanbul Ottoman public cuisine, I also um, inspired from the architectural changes in palace. I mean, I compare Topkapı Palace with Dolma Bahçe Palace. When we compare, this is the same thing in food. I hope um, may I say something else? Yes. Uh, 
I know that tomorrow there will be a tour of the uh, orphanage building in Bukada. On I Sunday, think. on Sunday, yes. On Sunday, yes. Uh, well, in that building, actually, there is a full um, kitchen uh, with all the uh, equipment uh, of uh, ovens and uh, ranges, etc., which was built for a, to be a hotel, as you all know. Uh, that is a very interesting space, and it is a little bit um, in a uh, in a poor condition, unfortunately, because maybe it has not uh, attracted that much attention within the general uh, entity of the building. But it's a very interesting kitchen, and all the equipment they are, of course, from nineteenth late nineteenth century. Uh, but uh, still, it's somewhere to really look into. It's very precious, I think, because there is no other example that I know of uh, in Turkey, at least, uh, of such an uh, almost, uh, almost, well, it's not industrial, but it is for a, a hotel building. So it's a hu huge kitchen uh, and the equipments are all rusting, etc. It's, it's in a very poor condition. So this could be uh, something maybe to look into uh, in um, in future studies. Interesting. I, I want to... Uh, yes, it, it's very interesting, all the equipment, uh, and they, they have the makers' names on them as well. Uh, so I just wanted to remind you that there is a lovely place there, rusting away. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Vurcin uh, Hocam. And uh, by this way, we would like to remind uh, all our uh, participants that we have this uh, Vukada Orphanage tour uh, mm -hmm. on, on uh, Sunday. Uh, again, uh, pre-recorded, unfortunately, due to the, um, due to the lockdown. lockdown. Yes. Uh, uh, so, um, Alper Hocam, maybe we can wrap it up. Yes. And uh, then maybe uh, until our next session, which begins uh, like in 10 minutes, uh, we okay. can ask uh, Professor Kamis to put us into again breakout rooms so we can interact until the next session. Alper uh, Hocam. Thank you very much, uh, Özge Hocam. And then the, uh, thank you for uh, contribution. Uh, uh, it was very interesting uh, speech and the presentation. Not only gastronomy, I think is a eating habits, furniture, pottery, dishes, and even though there's postures of the per people, I mean, it's a kinesthetics and kinesthesia, I think is a, it was very interesting for us. Thank you very much for everything, Hocam. It was a pleasure. <laughs> it was, uh, thank you for listening and to, for meeting here. <laughs> Okay, you, uh, it's going to take one minute for me to open the breakout rooms and send you there. You're going to see in one minute an invitation to join the breakout room, and you can go there and have a chat with the friends. But in this minute, you can take a look at the results of our poll, to which you can also answer, if you wish, by clicking on the link that was provided in the chat, or scanning the QR code over there with your phone, or even writing slido.com on your computer, tablet, phone, and uh, entering the code AACCP2021. We're asking you to give us more than one answer to this question. What is the future of archaeological sites? Some people say they should be virtually accessible. Other are looking into the resurrection of the archaeological sites. So you might want to join the skeptical party or the <laughs> enthusiast party of virtualization by giving your any comment, you know, on this uh, poll, which will be we will be sharing also with the other uh, delegates in the symposium. So allow me, uh, I don't know, one minute or so, and you're going to get 
that invitation. Uh, the room will close in huh, actually five minutes. So yes, very quick. Okay, see you later. So, bye. Okay, bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.
Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our symposium. Um, we're going to begin in one minute. Just as a reminder, you might want to answer to our poll, what is the future of archaeological sites? You can provide even more than one answer. You can do this by uh, scanning the QR code there with your phone and enter, entering the answer, or even going to slido.com and entering the code AACCP2021. This will be active throughout the symposium, so we're going to be sharing our opinions about the future of archaeological sites, small towns, and other issues. Um, and, and I'm going to give you the link to do this quickly, if you wish, in a second. But now we have one session dedicated to vernacular architecture and landscape from development to regeneration, which is going to be chaired by Thomas Bradecki from Silesian University of Technology and Claudia Pesco Solido from University of Ferrara. So the floor is yours. Hello, nice to meet you. My name is Tomasz Brzezki. Thank you, Professor Alexander Kamis. Uh, please also meet uh, Professor Claudia Pascolido. You're also here. Um, I'm here. Thank you, yeah. Thomas. Yeah, you're here. So uh, the first person who is going to present is Mandio Monturi. And uh, Mr. Mandio, are you here? Can you hear us? Because at the moment, unfortunately, we don't see you. So in that case, I assume that we will have to skip uh, Mr. Monturi and we'll get to the um, to the second presentation. And the second presentation is going to be led by a team of three. At least the article is, uh, is presented by a team of uh, three. Am I correct? This is, um, this is uh, Antonello Capo di Ferro, Anna Laba Taglia, and Chiara Tosto. Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Yes, good morning. Uh, I'm sorry for my pronunciation. I'm Polish and uh, probably uh, that wasn't the best. Yes, so good morning. <laughs> good morning, nice to see you. In the beginning, I'm going to, um, just to introduce uh, three of you for the rest. And um, okay, you should see my screen now. So I'll yes. try to make a short brief few free guys here. So um, uh, Antonello Capitifiera uh, was born in Matera, graduated in architecture at the Polytechnic of Bari, specialized in School of Beni, Architecture and and El Passage Polytechnic of Bari. Uh, a founder in Matera since 2013 of Kazan Partners studying architecture, now tutor of Atelier of city planning and landscape and DSM Department of Architecture and University of Basculata. Uh, the Chiara Tosto. Chiara Tosto also was born in Matera, um, graduated in architecture at the Polytechnic of Bari, specialized in School of Beni Architecture de Passeggio, so I, I assume it's the, the same. Now PhD student at the decade of Polytechnic of Bari, studying a seismic risk and vulnerability of historical buildings on a territorial and building scale. Now based in Matra as architect, collaborating with particular with other colleagues on the territory between Basquilat and Puglia and Anna Laba Taglia. Anna, born in Bari, graduated uh, in the architecture at the Polytechnic of Bari in 2017 um, specialized in School of Bani Architecture at El Passeggio at the Polytechnic of Bari with a specialization in history and restoration of ancient monuments. Now PhD student in history of ancient architecture at the University of Bari, studying the spread and development of amphitheater in the Roman Greek East. So, uh, Claudia, do you want to add anything? Um... Okay, first of all, I would like to thank you, Thomas, for the introduction of the, the speakers. And uh, I think that um, I, I will can remind 
all of you to uh, um, turn off your microphone during the session and also uh, maybe for the question, Thomas, uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, the, the question maybe at the end of the session, oh, it's okay. Yeah. Yes, please. So, um, okay. Antonello, Caro, and Anna, uh, you can share your screen. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, Antonella, Caro, and Anna, can you please share the the this the screen your screen your presentation i'm wondering if uh, you are both uh, using the same internet connection because i think we lost them somehow they seem frozen yes we lost them yeah. so no, actually we're in different places so i think that antonello has some problems too it's, um, i don't know just a oh, I'm here. Moment. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> okay, so if you're having any uh, technical difficulties, you see me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, uh, will you be able to share your okay. screen? Can you share your screen, please? I'm here. If you are having any technical difficulties, we can take yeah. you to the backstage, try to solve your problem. Meanwhile, we can get to uh, the other uh, uh, presenter not to uh, you know, lose uh, time, if it's OK. Because I don't know, I, I didn't understand. You have a problem with sharing your screen? Maybe with the connection, I think. You see me? I see you, but I don't see your screen. No, okay. I could I share my screen. I'm going to share. Okay. Okay. Great. You see my screen? Yes. yes. Can you make Go it ahead. a full screen, please? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Uh, for introducing, but I have a problem with the connection. Okay, um, I'm uh, going to present my uh, our works with uh, Anna La Battaglia and Chiara Tosto. And uh, this work is based on my third level specialization thesis at Politecnico di Bari. And the aim the, is the Quarries Landscape of Matera proposal for an original study of neglected area. The present work is focused on the study of a border area. The aim of this work is to connect the historical and physical interpretation to a development proposed guideline and vision. This is a typical approach, but for an original context never considered before. In this place, it has been possible to observe the coexistence of heterogeneous elements that do not interact each at currently in a multi-level study. The following analysis led us to highlight cultural values as basis for the development for, of the entire area. In the end, this work could design a strategy to revitalize this area. Matera is a city, is a city in the south of Italy. The research are focused on a part of the Murgia Materana where many natural and anthropic elements are correlated. It includes the territory of Matera and several neighboring Apulian towns in the road of it. The deepest and widest incision of the Gravina di Matera starts there from the Pantano Bridge and the uh, uh, widest incision of uh, uh, enclosed from the east with the beginning of the Gravina di Matera, Gravinella Canal. There are also some territorial axes capturing this area, the Appia, which connects Matera to Taranto, and the younger statal road Matera to Altamura. Other character design elements are the remains of the extinct, extinct quarries of Calcarenite, and uh, all lower age, the area is enclosed by the, the railway and the expansion of the new quadrifoglio district. 
It is important to have a look on the territorial anthropization process to understand that there is a reason why matter is a nodal point and why the items are in such position in this area. The anthropization process refers to migratory process and long distance territorial communication routes. The Murja region, the Murja region has always had the characteristic for facilitating the human permanent settlement. There are attestations since the middle lower Paleolithic of the anthropic presence on these territories. The first population settled at the crossroad of the guiding paths along the ridge and then along the coast. This shows how the confluence of the two penetration paths from the sea generated the first settlements near Matera. And there are archaeological excavations confirm this theory. There are Bronze Ages villages, rests in the surrounding of Matera, but also in the urban area. In classic period, right roads, the interterritory saw a regression while the commerce were constant. During this time, routes started from the colonies on the coast and went to the north, siding the main courses of the rivers. In the Roman age, with the construction of the Appia, the previous main routes become secondary. The Appian Antica borders the Matera area, but the urban center is marginal. The presence of the Appian Antica on the current route can be confirmed by historical sources and by the presence of the architectural emergency. With the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, the process of marginalization was outranted and there began a turnaround of, for the internal routes. With the fall of the Western Roman Empire, with the beginning of the pilgrimages and crusades to Holy End, the Via Appia, in white, becomes an European route. Matera is a path became an hub of stopping and exchange. Along this route, we can find important religious sites as follows. All these emergencies highlight and reinforce the route importance persisted in Roman times. Throughout the 18th century, Supplied the construction material from the quarries located via near Appia. At the end of the 19th century, in this, in this strategic position near the communication routes with Puglia, there was built the first industry for the transformation of grain. We will have to wait until the 20th century for new infrastructural intervention as the railway. In recent years, there are, have only been upgraded and extension of the existing infrastructure, with particular reference to connection road from to Bari. It is important to have an historical view on the city of Matera, to understand large scale events interact to the city scale. Archaeology, archaeological uh, uh, evidence has highlighted the present settlement since the Neolithic in both sides of the Gravina. The only Neolithic settlement in the South Sea that survived with the com continued it was a different place, but at the same time, not even peripheral. The most important uh, testimony of the economic there has been a construction of a cathedral. Also, the Ecclesiastes power strongly influenced the development of the city with the monastery seats at Italo Greek, Latin Benedictine, but also later the mendicant orders in extremia mania position. In the second half of the 16th century, there were some significant events that led to an expansion towards Tupiano. The Sassi and the Piano were complementary to each other, but this equilibrium was broken in the 19th century. With the unification of Italy, there was a progressive weakening of ecclesiastic power in favor of liberalism that also causes strong migrations. The 20th century opened with the situation of social and economic tragedy, which will last until after the Second World War. Because of hygienic condition, people were forced to leave their hours, houses there. The community was spread over rural villages far from the Sassi. The study area that we see at 
as an east-west section show a lot of signs of its history connecting each other from the most ancient and natural geological characters to the youngest anthropic sites. From the study of them, the aim of this work is to pursue some guidelines for the future development of the area. About the general African characters, the Murge, the Murge are the terrace plateau formed by material signs of marine ingression. About two and a half million years ago, the region of Puglia was an archipelago of ancient carbonated rocks of the Cretaceous period. The continuous lowering of the Apulian region caused the submersion uh, uh, archipelago and coastal deposits accumulated on the side of the island with a planar geometry. Later, they become carbonate rocks, commercially called tufo. So the valley of the Garina, the Matera, is testimony of a recession of slopes. Also, the Graviglioni valleys are the contact between the limestones of the Cretaceous period and the tufo. The survey area has always been characterized by an anthropic continuing presence uh, defined by the Neolithic villages of Murgia Timone and Murgecchia. Both of them were discovered at the beginning of the last century from Dr. Domenico Ridola. These bone age villages are characterized by circular or elliptical shaped trenches dug in the ground with the fences proposed and the furrow structure. The Neolithic and and uh, uh, where the structure for um, residential use, burials and water wells. The trench is uh, excavated in the rocks. The first major trench has a circle shape, while the second smaller is an elliptical one. This. Nowadays, fauro in the ground remains as reference uh, of these defensive fox walls, there are some post walls for the cement and the burial structure too, and the other material coming from the excavation as well. The territory is distinguishable by the presence of seven worship places and religious buildings from the 20th, 12th to the 18th centuries and the architectural features are symptomatic of anthropic transformation. These seven buildings are categorized in three groups considered their architectonic elements. The first group is about the Rupestrian churches, completely excavated in the rocks, sometimes decorated with frescoes. In this first category, there are the Chiesa del Pantano, a church completely carved in the rock, and the Church of Sant'Antonio degli Apissi. Today, only the rock excavated at remain of the church because it was used as square quarry, quarry front in the 17th century. Another interesting building of this typology in the Chiesa del Sole, of Doubt, despite its name, it isn't a real church. The name comes from the presence of uh, symbol of the sun sculpting on the ceiling of the main uh, main room. And uh, um, some recent analysis suggest that it may be an apiary. The Cappella de Spirito Santo is another kind of European church. It is a built mastering facade. It's located at the end of a narrow path carved in the rock. And uh, while on the main wall is uh, mm, the altar sculpted in, in the rock and decorated with icons and frescoes. The Chiesa uh, di Cristo la Gravinella is a still pilgrimage destination in the month of March for all citizens. All the aisles are excavated in the rock, and uh, as the other architectural elements, elements are decorated with frescoes. The facade is made of tufa with sculpted details. The last type are the sanctuaries. The Santuario della Palomba rises on a rocky hill, and it is composed of buildings dated in different times. The 5083 building represents the largest uh, and the most majestic building under the whole complex. It was built on the 13th century crypt dedicated. 
and then was uh, the fences wall. And then uh, Santa Maria La Vaglia, located in the western part of the area. The main church belongs to a religious complex that involved the monastery. Frescoes in the inside can be dated on the 13th century. Now it is closed and inaccessible. The study area was frequently inside the 12th century due to the two four quarries and the rural settlements with attached chapels. The presence of the path that connected the Via Appia to the urban center of Matera going through the quarries are certain. While main roads remain during the years, the smaller paths disappear and because extinction of quarries in a, uh, the, as because the exist of course as because the town expansion. In fact, what is between the railway, the railway and the Appia Road in the east of Partia today, the quadrifoglio district, new quarries born, born going to east. At this may, this may show quarries left in precise sunny of the ground. Until the 1915, also the landscape was quite in three. The futures of the course and around the landscape express the change of expression techniques at different times on the wall. As, and the detection and excavation of store that was disfiguring the landscape since the 1917. But often this critical is also created some potential police. So the first result of this work is dipping over relation to all all of these factors, the historical future, the quarries, the religious, the historic are linked to the geomorphic character. We investigated the relation, the relation and saw that in their correlation, there is a natural consequence to the use criticalism and cultural values expressed. In the end, all of the factors are essential for designing a strategy to revitalize this area. The most common aspect about critical is the neglection. There are no connection with the urban context, empty of value. There are several interventions that don't, don't dialogue with each other. Another critically is the danger of some crossing road. road. In fact, the area is not suitable for pedestrians. Facing these negative aspects, there are several potentialities of the place, lean on the culture, culture values. The, the regional park of Vichese Rupesti is not a limit, but an opportunity, as in another area already more appreciated. This work ends with an idea of guidelines as for exceeded objects as for ones that could populate the area, as this hypothesis of master plan can suggest it. The best restoration project should follow two principles, the coexistence and the continuity. The coexistence of all the elements that should we be current which are which other, also for a usable and for a visual point of view. Coherence because there should be the valorization of quarries, the encouraging of landscape care and no more neglect. The continuity should be should lead to connection and not separation. There should be the recognition of urban roads and paths with the with the landscape. The rehabilitation of ancient paths should introduce the continuity between the ancient landscape of Murgia within the new town of Quadrifoglio district. In conclusion, the show approach and the results could be a useful tool for the local government to benefit the property of the value of this place, betting on religious, historical, and landscape aspects. Some visions are provided not so far from what is already happening in other area of the same Murgia di Matera. And this is a signal that this process is possible, even more than it is behind strong studied motivation. Thank you for kind attention. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, you have been speaking very well, uh, perfect timing. But uh, how about Thank Anna you. or Chiara? Do you want to add anything? Because it was just, uh, just Antonella who was speaking. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes, we arranged um, about um, Antonello could uh, present you our work. So thanks okay. for, uh, for your attention. Okay. Thank you.
We still have got uh, several minutes left, uh, well, three minutes left. Are there any questions right now at the moment and anyone would like to ask anything? Because I have a question, but I should be the last one. Yeah, let me come up with this question. What is the relationship between your uh, analysis and, and the project? Can you please answer? Yeah. Mm, um, uh, relationship is uh, the connection, the coexistence uh, for, because uh, we study the territory for, um, to have uh, a, a proposal. Because uh, don't study the territory or connection is not uh, the recent uh, project. Uh, can I answer the or oh, Chiara, uh, you do. Yes, we used um, we use this study um, principally for uh, as as basis as basis for um, the process um, to be um, for um, not for the the project but for some guidelines for several uh, kind of um, of project that that could be. Um, so, um, the, the result is uh, guidelines. So, it's just the guidelines that you propose. Yes, but, um, it was an example. Mm -hmm. uh, how are the queries used at the moment? Because for me, it was very interesting, very nice, but how do you use day by day? You want to, you want to generate some guidelines, so probably there's much more to do in the future than uh, this today. Mm, yes, no. can I, can oh, I answer? No. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, there is uh, one main query that uh, right now is a sort of um, open auditorium. It's, um, uh, we call it Cava del Sol and it's connected to the um, sun cave that we show you uh, with the anthropomorphic sun on the ceiling. And right now it's used for um, events or a concert uh, but it's just the only quarry that now is used. Uh, actually, in the same in, um, in the same area, there are um, contemporary projects, but they are completely uh, different from each other. They doesn't dialogue between the, um, they don't dialogue between between them. So um, our um, uh, our uh, guidelines are. For, for the future and maybe for connect all these uh, micro projects to uh, one and um, it has to be coherent, you know, with the, also with all the um, anthropomorphic uh, uh, presence that we have in the area because the, um, the main characteristic of these places is that uh, uh, there is uh, an anthropic presence from the Paleolithic age, from the Bronze Age, and there is from the Bronze Age to the uh, 17th century. Uh, it's uh, you know uh, a sort of uh, um, uh, con continuity. It's um, they 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 keep on living in this area, but right now it's completely um, abandoned. And uh, there are also uh, different kinds of languages of architecture that we are inside. Um, a lot of project that doesn't dialogue between them. Okay, so you've got a strong reason. I uh, congratulate your idea. We have run out of time. Uh, Claudia, do you have anything to add? Is um, there anyone more questions or not? Uh, so for me, um, I, I think that is very interesting uh, uh, analysis of uh, the, the situation and the context. Um, for me, I think uh, um, I, I ask if the um, uh, if the project is also focused uh, or your guidelines are, um, do you think that in future uh, there will be a connection with the, the, um, the economy and the social interaction uh, because the regeneration project uh, um, goes also in, in a strategic way uh, for the economy and the social. Or, um, so my, my question, is, I don't know if you, um, if you, 
in future things about uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, themes. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, maybe we can, um, maybe we can um, get to the answer for the questions by the end, because I can see that uh, Mr. Manu Monturi is here. Are you here? Yes, sir. Oh, you are here. Uh, that's very nice. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very sorry. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. It's my fault. I, I missed the uh, no problem. The no problem. I'm very sorry. Uh, no problem. In that case, we will get back to you if possible. Yeah, uh, of course. So, Thank you. So, uh, in the beginning, I would like to present uh, Mr. Manio Monturi, uh, born in 72. Uh, Manio graduated in architecture at the University of Naples. Uh, with a thesis on the regeneration of Sa Salerno Seafront. In 2005, he won the selection for the 21st cycle of the Doctorate in Conservation of Architectural Heritage at the Second University of Naples. His PhD research focused on the restoration of the activity in Tuscany between the 19th and 20th centuries. In 2008, he defended a thesis entitled Giuseppe Castellucci and figurative interpretation of the restoration in Tuscany in 2010. He was an assistant professor in restoration and the Techne Hub Technopolito of the University of Ferrara, being a member of a department of architecture where he teaches restoration of monuments. At the moment, he's assistant researchers of the Techne Hub. Uh, so that was an uh, introduction for your um, presentation. Can you please share the screen? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction. So I'm going to share my screen. Just one moment. Do you see my PowerPoint? Working OK. okay. Go on. So um, do you see my PowerPoint? Yes. You should just uh, make the full screen, please. Now? Perfect. OK, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, the first stage of my research in the, in the field of the, um, of the uh, Amalfitan coast. Uh, it's linked with the. Uh, um, um, sorry, Manlio. Uh, your screen is not full. Uh, um, would you please? Yeah, of course. Uh, I lost my. Just get back to the presentation. Yes. Please. Mm -hmm. perfect. Okay, perfect. So I, I was talking, I was saying that um, this is the first stage of my research activities on, um, uh, on a particular side of the Amalfitan coast. Uh, it belongs to um, uh, mainly on uh, three aspects that are linked uh, with the, uh, with the um, pe 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 peculiar uh, type of uh, construction typologies. Uh, in the Amalfitan coast. And they are linked mainly with the uh, terraces, uh, terraced buildings uh, and, uh, uh, and houses. And of course, um, one of them are the uh, um, I'm sorry, I was... Um, uh, and uh, um, uh, the, the terrace staircases and the, uh, the, the way of, of uh, arranging the, 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 the agricultural activities in, inside the, the Amalfitan coast. So uh, one of the uh, main um, topic of this uh, on-field research is linked with the um, terraced fields. They are uh, a, a, a very interesting uh, topic uh, in um, construction topology because 
uh, they are the uh, settlements, they are the, um, as I can say, the uh, syntactic uh, elements of the um, construction techniques in the Amalfitan coast. So uh, they shape all the, um, the, the landscape in the uh, all along the, the coast, and they are and they are focused and are implemented by uh, a tough construction techniques that um, um, reduce the, the slope of the uh, of the hills and uh, brings the uh, um, a level plan to uh, implement uh, the um, level groves and uh, the wine yards as, as well. Uh, so um, mainly uh, what I'm going to to show is uh, is, is linked to a, a previous my, a previous grant that I uh, I received from the uh, municipality of uh, uh, Scala. It's a little uh, uh, it's a little town in uh, Amalfitan Coast to uh, identify the um, peculiar characteristics of this uh, construction techniques and to identify the uh, the way to um, to preserve uh, this. Uh, these elements also the way to uh, consolidate when the, um, there are uh, problems linked with uh, with floods or uh, even rainfall. So uh, um, I think that uh, these are uh, some views of this uh, these elements, and of course uh, they are um, uh, a very a very interesting element that. Uh, is going to um, is going to be preserved also because uh, the Amalfitan Coast is linked in the UNESCO uh, in UNESCO heritage list. And uh, another um, element that I find very interesting is is also because it's linked to the the, the topic the, the issues that uh, some of these um, timber structures uh, belongs not not only to the um, agricultural activities of the uh, of the craftsmen uh, implement, involved in the um, in the lemon uh, in the lemon industry, but they uh, take from the uh, from the uh, shipyard from the um, from the um, from the um, from from the sea activity from the fisherman's activities all the um, ideas and all the techniques to join timber uh, timber elements and these are uh, some values that uh, we are going to um, to preserve in the um, consolidations activities activities also because uh, many of the uh, of these um, um, terraced um, places are going to uh, substitute by uh, um, uh, iron elements and so it's going to change uh, in a very uh, tough way the landscape um, characteristics um, another uh, um, Tough element in the um, preservation activities inside the uh, Malfitan Coast is the preservation of uh, terraced uh, state cases because uh, when uh, the terraced are bu built and uh, on the terraced also uh, on not only they are implemented um, um, lemon groves but also they are implemented of course house buildings and um, this. Um, tissue, these uh, um, fabric elements are a, a characteristic element that uh, brings together all the terraces, uh, terraced uh, levels. And when um, people uh, try to uh, go inside this, um, these staircases, they, they change uh, all the um, characteristics of the site. So these are uh, other elements that should, uh, needs to be preserved and uh, consolidate, of course. Uh, on the left, you can see as uh, it's a, a, a tough element in the. Um, it's a, a, uh, a topic inside the construction of the anthropocene landscape. Uh, I mean the um, the terraced elements. So uh, this is another um, element of the 
uh, of the strategy for the conservation of the landscape in the Amalfitan coast. Another element is linked to the um, to the uh, to the rivers and the torrents inside the um, the, the territory because um, mainly uh, many activities and uh, former activities uh, industrial activities were linked with the with the water uh, with the water elements just like the uh, production of the amalfitan paper for example for example but not only because uh, uh, on this pathway, there were a lot of um, industries um, linked with the production of, uh, uh, of creta and uh, plates and uh, ceramics uh, elements. And uh, the last element of this, uh, this ongoing research is linked to the uh, estrados and uh, um, 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 uh, the, the estrados measuring walls, just like the apps of the um, uh, worship places, uh, just like this one uh, in uh, in Ravello, or this one in uh, again in Ravello in the Annunziata Church, or uh, this one in the um, in Scala and uh, the Church of Santa Eustachio. These are all all elements. These um, two-dimensional apses are all elements that shape the. the the territory and and this and this um, and uh, uh, landscape of the of the area, and uh, on 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 this case, for example, uh, I think on the on this summer I'm going to implement uh, uh, an, uh, an on-site activity for document uh, those uh, those structures and. Uh, uh, how, uh, how, what, what were the, the construction techniques that uh, helped to implement such an interesting, uh, an interesting place? So uh, again, uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm very sorry for being so late again. Not a problem. Um, so thank you for thank your you. presentation. We still have got some time. So, um, are there any uh, direct questions for the presentation we have just seen? Anyone? Uh, then a question, that, in that case, I have a question, possibly. I'm a big fan, actually, of the Italian um, landscape, and especially the, the, this terrace landscape that you have shown is very, very interesting. But um, the, the subject of our um, session is uh, from redevelopment for, to regeneration. My question would be, because all the, all the elements you have shown to us, very nice pictures, thank you. Uh, it, this, these elements mostly look old, or at least it, it, they need regeneration. Do you I, possibly... I think that see the, 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 the option for regeneration in the, in, the, in, the, in the future? They need to be regenerated. I don't think it's the, the, um, the, the right topic to be regenerated. They need to be preserved. They need to be consolidated. They need to be um, uh, reused because many of these terraced places are not used yet. Um, I am in my, I am one of the luckiest person that uh, holds one of these terras, terraced places, and uh, I know how it's tough to um, to uh, to implement to have uh, take care of this land. Also, because you should, you need to uh, to focus on each of one of the of the stones that. Um, uh, bring up uh, these uh, this walls. So uh, I don't think that the, the correct term is to uh, regenerate. It needs to be preserved and consolidated, yes, of course. And uh, another, another topic is to, uh, to um, the reuse, to reuse. Uh, sometimes we uh, reuse them with um, uh, changing the, the the agricultural activities from lemons to, to wine, of course, because uh, it's, 
it's more efficient, uh, economically efficient. But there are other, other in other occasions, they, they are in, in used as a, a parkway. And I don't think it, it's, the, it's the right use for uh, this um, particular um, landscape categories. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any more questions? There are no more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in that case, uh, we are on the schedule time, I think. So I think we can move um, to the uh, next presenter. And the next person is uh, Maria Vitiello. Are you here with us? I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Hello. I'll just to give you a short brief presentation of Maria Vitiello. Uh, Maria Vitiello has a degree in architecture from the Sapienza University of Rome, a postgraduate diploma in restoration of monuments and a PhD in conservation of architectural heritage from the same university. Where she is currently a researcher, she's a member of e-commerce Italia and is currently conducting a project to catalog vernacular architecture in the Molise region. That would be all from my side. Uh, so please, the, 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 the floor, the, the, the screen is yours, actually. The screen oh, is yours. Yes. Can you share the screen, please? Be there? Yes, we can see, but uh, it's very, um, the proportion is very small. Is there an option to make? Oh yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Okay. Oh, and so. Um, Molise region and the landscape of the uh, vernacular architecture on the Tratturi. Um, <clears throat> and the Tratturi are um, heritage um, landscaping, ecological, political, social, social and even religious important. Uh, the Tratturi are um, an authentic monument uh, full of many stories uh, of the surfer, the merchant, and pilgrim who traveled along with them. Uh, but they are also reached many buildings built along with them and the village and grew up at the confluence of uh, this dense network of road. Uh, the transplant is an ancient phenomenon. Uh, it was already being practiced in protostoric world of the Italic people and the Roman preserved the, this tradition and implemented it. Um, there were posts, farm, towers, mungituri, and uh, um, church that uh, uh, contract this particular pasture system and uh, around which the financial world of this land uh, revolve uh, along this road. Um, before talking uh, about architecture, let's see uh, that this great uh, um, road consists of. Um, the ship track uh, that we know today, those are um, recognized on uh, uh, 1447 uh, by Alfonso I of Aragon. Predate with, uh, with institutionalizing an ancient practice of uh, organizing a complex um, administrative, judicial, and commercial system, the Dogana delle Pecore. Alongside this road, church, taverns, and post house began to be built a central structure for the rest of suffered and flocks and the trade uh, that could carry out on them. Um, there were uh, 14 registraturi, along with this, there were also seven roads made by Tratturelli 
and uh, 14 Bracci. I use a cross connection uh, uh, with the function of a road system uh, on a local scale and the server to connect the ship track with a certain uh, uh, locality, welfare and the cross section uh, of the um, Tarturo um, is varied according to the level of the route. And the Tratturi measured the seventh Napolitan passes uh, um, about uh, 111 meter. And the Tratturelli were from uh, 37 to uh, 18 meter, uh, depending on the area. Uh, this interior network um, of ship track across the Adriatic uh, side of Apennine, Italy from the Abruzzo to Apulia. And this is a particular um, map of Molise. Look, these are the ship track across uh, this land. And these are the route uh, of the three great uh, Traturi. Uh, you can see in this graph the um, they are transversal route and uh, across ridge and river. Uh, river and spring are very important, but suffered and sheep. Uh, but the Traturi network only takes uh, on its full meaning on the word. Uh, a territorial system. In fact, within this complete, um, complex administrative and ter territorial organization of the Kingdom of Naples, the types and the location of resting place were also uh, established. Uh, that is, fountain, shelters, wide grass meadow, poste, jacci, riposi, and resting place are place where um, people stop and then change good. And the most important resting place, town also development. Um, and also um, there are a scene which made the road uh, works uh, or bridge and um, structure or uh, fountain and the uh, building uh, are intentionally built um, near the sheep track uh, <clears throat> as uh, uh, transit use for uh, and use for foreign. Uh, the building and the artifacts are popular devotion linked by uh, to the pastoral life and rural chapel and uh, oratories um, and factory for Um, there are the um, church, little church of Sant'Antonio, San Nicola, San Elena, um, Santa Maria. Uh, um, there's along uh, the road of um, the Tratturi. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in importance, uh, uh, the, uh, this road is given the uh, capacity to have collect the residents. It's the town of Sepino, it's the Roman city founded along the ship track. Indeed, in the ship track um, is Cardo Massimo of the city. Um, this is another uh, example. Um, our settlement are generated along uh, the Traturo. Uh, this uh, is uh, um, Pescolanciano city. Here is the castle and the medieval core, and then the modern extension and around uh, a contemporary uh, town. Um, in addition, uh, uh, this element uh, would be considered uh, uh, constituent elements of ship track route uh, um, as they are commercially conserved to support uh, the praises of 
transmits a whole series to, of external visual reference. Um, the Tratturi are a scene of landscape of great interest because they are characteristic traits on the territory, which articulate complex system of artifacts and symbolic relation. For this reason, they become the constitutive element for understanding the phenomenon and the possible protection of the abandoned transmit system. Um, the nomadic character of the suffered life produced it um, building that was linked to temporary nature of living along the route. The journey, in fact, had been treated on a long period of time, and for this reason, they had to be interspersed with place to stop for a short or longer period of time. Place uh, where there was spring and space to contain the flux. Um, <clears throat> Um, so stands, uh, the, the heritage of the ship track consists of uh, cultural heritage for two reasons. Uh, because it's a material heritage, because its value also concerned social and anthropological spheres, and material heritage, um, because it contains values inherent uh, to its physically, its historicity, concerning the material elements and distinguish it about the archaeological, botanical, and architectural heritage. Um, <clears throat> the, the service um, offered uh, to the transmantist uh, obviously, obviously of those rate uh, shelter and refreshment. Um, according uh, to the times there are Obviously, different technology and type, and all these elements were linked to models, to cultural of, and economic development. There are stats in area in which the sefer stayed initially built around a natural cave, adapted to the best of their ability to accommodate the sefer's living need and built around a truly heart, larger composed of real dwelling, which over time were enriched with the space for milking and milking for her. Uh, but the most important architectural structure is the taverna. The tavern are located near the past um, near it passed over for area and marked the characteristic point of the territory. It was useful and orientation to travel along the ship track. This architecture has complex function, not limited only the rest of the suffered and hurt, but also as place for enchanting good and begrudging and were named after the field or the local square of the district. Uh, the tavern of, um, on Castel di Sangro Ruscera ship track um, were in fact the Taverna del Barone di Ripa. Uh, below Pietra Catella, uh, the village recalled uh, the Taverna di Predicatello. Uh, on the Celano Foggia, uh, near Pietra Abbondante, there was the Taverna Sfornapane. In general, um, most of these buildings are built with a uh, wall structure of local stone, well, a point and usual plastered, but not always. The most uh, widespread topology is made up of building that develop um, longitudinally aligned with the age of Traturi. Uh, these are usually the oldest body to the which other elements have been added of time, making the typological structure rich and articulated. Uh, this is the and the one which corner of including uh, the double coat and was added the first body and um, another body. Uh, with the last one, the Sudas front, which the name hates and um, no west front. Uh, 
di questa taverna del cortile, un courtyard in agro di Campobasso, è un progetto di longitudinal development, con due facciate, being at different age with uh, a different uh, uh, of the first floor. Um, it's not clear, but um, <clears throat> it seems that the building was contracted in two phase and different time and generated by amalgamation uh, of two existing buildings with different in their construction techniques. Um, this is the Taverna of Castropignano. It's a compact, no longitudinal two story building, wooden ceiling. Um, a split in two floors two floor, uh, with an external staircase, recently restored and in excellent condition. Uh, but um, we don't know if um, how much this work have hardware room inside. Um, in this case, uh, there is a um, wooden siling inside there and also chapel uh, with some significant decorative elements. Uh, this is a taverna. Um, of courtyard in uh, Trivento. It's uh, one uh, um, also in state of ruin, but a special for um, several reasons. Uh, because it's not strictly close to Traturo. It don't have a longitudinal development, but show an L-shaped architectural structure. Uh, both break to the quadrangular shape uh, by the present a large fence courtyard. Uh, the front of the facing of the road has a wide arch opening uh, through which carriage of cattle with found shelter inside the fenced courtyard must have passed. Uh, in external private area, there is a well drinking draw. Uh, with uh, is no format only the um, ring, but as a larger and more massive structure. On the ground floor um, were the stable, on the first floor with access by standard staircase. Um, the restaurant at the uh, night quarter. Yes. Um, in most uh, cases, the floor are made in wood, um, except in replacement or localization, uh, uh, consolidation, construction uh, of a simple frame. Um, the binder which, uh, uh, with which the architectural structure are built is a, a lima and uh, also use uh, the external plaster for internal plaster their gypsum. Still, it's not uncommon to find bastard mortar mixed with the um, lime and mud. Uh, obviously, it's a very friable mixture, uh, but give the mixture is a very warm uh, yellowish color. Mm. So stone, wood, uh, and the earth are uh, therefore the main material. A stone mentory is a predominant construction technique in architecture linked to the transmans. It uh, not only for technical or uh, economical reason, but because it's a close representation on the link between architecture and environment. A link around which the life of the separate is born and develops. I would say identify itself. So uh, architecture could um, only be the result of this cultural and environmental approach to everyday life. Um, uh, for uh, this reason, the first step uh, was to formulate a project for planning the knowledge 
uh, this asset by setting up a geographical information platform capable of um, highlighting the quality and the quantity expressed in typological, constructional, and dimensional terms of this important ruler architecture structure to be preserved. Uh, it will also be necessary to assess the, their state of Hello, Maria, can you hear us? Um, then enhancing their value uh, with, uh, while we're um, respecting the landscape system, they are integral part. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, perfect timing. I think we've got still two minutes left uh, for uh, direct questions right after the presentation. Anyone? If there are no questions, then uh, possibly we will uh, move to the next presenter. And we'll have some time for the questions by the end because we are running very tight. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, um, I would like to ask is uh, Alexander Vidanovic is here. I assume that you are here. Yes, I'm here. You're here. So, um, um, I would like to present you Alexander Vidanovic, uh, who is an architect, associate professor at the Department of Architecture, Faculty of Architecture, University of Belgrade, where he graduated in 1989 and also in his uh, master's and PhD degrees. Engaged in teaching, scientific research, professional and artistic work. His research interests are uh, modern regional planning, urban area, regional architecture, activation of natural resources and values, designing new ones, and regeneration of existing contents in rural areas, areas village architecture. Author of monographs, and these are the monographs of, oh, sorry, Black Grass, Life, Crisis and Hope, a renovation of centers in rural areas, co-author of monographs, urbanization processes, tracing the past, they recognize colors, new suns and landscape, city discontinuity. That was the last one, I guess. Uh, that was the presentation of our next presenter. Um, Del Alexander, can you please share the screen? The floor is yours. Yes, of course. Is it okay now? Perfect. Okay, thank you. At the beginning, uh, I would like to greet the participations uh, of the symposium and uh, thank the organizers uh, for their professionalism and kindness. Uh, the topic of our work uh, is part of uh, our many years of dealing with the phenomena of landscaping and architecture architecture uh, in rural uh, areas. There is a need to define some uh, characteristics about the genesis of settlement and the rural centers or centers in villages in Serbia. In the north, uh, in the plains, in the province of uh, Vojvodina, as well as in, in regions of Matra and Srem, Settlements were planned, 
under the influence of the authorities of the then uh, Austro-Hungarian monarchy, uh, depending on the size of the settlement, public uh, facilities in the centers are also planned. In the regions of Sremen Malcha, the centers are based on the intersections of already established and uh, engineered street corridors. In the entire remaining area of Serbia, south of the Danube and Sava rivers, the genesis of settlement is completely spontaneous. Uh, with a great difference in their urban morphological structure, depending on the characteristic of the terrain on uh, which they organize it. Public facilities in the centers were created according to the needs and the growth of the population and uh, not infrequently by order or of the authorities with the intention of affirming the imposed ideology and later with the aim of uh, recovering settlements and preventing immigrations. Observing the hierarchical, hierarchical uh, system of settlements from uh, primary settlements to the city, the right shame from uh, region to the re to region could always be in a new way different from the left ideal matrix. The following tendencies, tendencies are observed in practice. The number of primary villages is uh, drastically re reduced. Uh, the number of centers of rural communities is also declining, uh, uh, whether they have lost the, the gravi gravi gravitational force in the system or whether they have drowned in suburban areas. The only category of settlements uh, that uh, will survive to a certain extent, based on real needs and possibilities, are classic villages with rural centers. It, uh, not all of them, just some. In that sense, uh, we believe that the logical search in uh, the logical search is for those public and necessary contents in the centers and those villages uh, with sufficient centrality that can adapt to the new time and survive in the development sense, flexibly changing their social and spatial character. The real situation uh, with villages in Serbia is uh, burdened with problems in many aspects of life. There is no need to comment on the numbers you can see on the slide, which sufficiently describe the problems in rural areas in Serbia today. Um, what is encouraging that things are likely to get better is a paradigm shift in the view of the countryside and life in the rural environment. It seems that the stand, uh, standard of living in Serbia has reached the level uh, when the quality of healthy life and the need for uh, relaxation in nature are rediscovered. The paradox is uh, that the current global pandemic has contributed to such tendencies and way of thinking. One of the villages uh, that should survive uh, because it has all the necessary elements for that is uh, Gradually, further urbanized is the small town of uh, Crna Trava, translated as Black Grass. The settlement is the administrative center of a wider area and specially imposes itself as a link between many small primary settlements uh, and villages uh, with possibly a branch of a school, an ambulance or a shop, and larger centers, small towns in the wider area. Here are illustrations of the center of uh, the settlement in the range uh, of 75 years as follows. 1925, after the First World War, with the appearance of a serious small town, which in 1923 really received the state status of a small town. Uh, 1950, after the Second World War, uh, with visible elements of the new uh, ideology and the grayness of the communist countries and the atmosphere of the coming years of stagnation. 
1975 at uh, a time of large investments in underdevelopment areas uh, with new infrastructure built, but also the beginning of a large depopulation. Two thousand after regional wars, unfortunately, at the time of uh, transition, resignation, and bringing settlements to the level of a rapidly small population. However, today in 2021, uh, through special uh, infrastructural and superstructural uh, circumstances, it leads to a positive outcome in terms of survival and further development of the settlement and. Uh, the wider area, this time on a changed strategy. In uh, researching the possibilities of renewing rural areas, it is necessary to go back and analyze the period of their true and essential strength. While life activities were based on logic, rationality, and domestic attitude towards natural and created values, the rural environment survived. With the influence of the negative consequences of liberal capitalism from the abandonment of civilization human values to the victory of the consumer mentality, the patri patriarchal rural environment experienced a downtown from which it has not recovered until today. In that sense, sense in this uh, it, it is necessary, among other things, to reach for emotional intelligence and a romanticized view of the rural area so that it can be successfully renewed. The return to respecting the aesthetic values uh, of the vernacular architecture of the village was indicated at the end of the last century by organizing a competition for rural households which was uh, won by the solution from the display. Before that, with the enthusiasm of experts from the Institute for the Protection of the Architectural Heritage of Serbia, a large number of individual buildings uh, of vernacular architecture were saved by, by being transferred to the village of Sirogoino, named Sirogoino in Western Serbia, where the old village open air museum was formed. At the beginning of this century, in the village of Mokragora, in the mountainous re region of Western Serbia, Vud city or Drvengrad on Serbian, was formed a tourist village where festivals from various fields of culture are held four times uh, a, a year. Uh, the village gives uh, the impression of a scenographic process in the formation because the ambience is uh, intentionally hyper-realistic, like in movies. On the Stara Planina, old uh, mountain, eastern Serbia, on the border with, with uh, Bulgaria, the village uh, of Gostusha was uh, recently finally protected by conservation uh, procedures, I said, uh, finally. The roof of these houses are stone slabs from a local source. The village has been neglected for years in terms of conservation treatment of architectural heritage protection. On the residential, uh, residential uh, outdoors and uh, one uh, small picture, economic vernacular building, all the philosophy and approach to traditional construction in Serbia, both folk and uh, educated builders is concerned, considered. It goes without saying that this was the case from antiquity to the middle of the last 20th century, when the influence of unnamed and globalist universal architecture largely affected these areas as well. In the meantime, they were only dedicated, skilled and talented Priced the connection with the people genius and noted the principles of rational, logical, and solid constructions. The centers of rural settlements represent a combination of unfulfilled visions from the past and the adaptation of the existing physical structure 
to a decreasing of state uh, standard number of people who use it. Numerous inconstances, spatial paradoxes, and attempts to suggest a more correct use of space are presented through the following considerations. A special element of urban equipment and the defense against the element, which also has a special aesthetic, are the coastal fortification in the settlement. This element of arranging water courses uh, through settlement is often insufficiently mentioned and cleaned. And given the clima climatic uh, condition, uh, there is a danger of uh, its erosion. Apart from the visual sense, this type of landscaping also has an acoustic experience from the noise created by the water in places of cascades and waterfalls. The practice of arranging small movies and uh, ambiences in the process of urbanization of settlements is very important because they create the dynamics and the changeability of settlement scenography or location intrinsic for people's stay. Apart uh, from the fact that the realization of smaller than large in, uh, in, in, uh, interventions uh, is easier. Now, interesting space uh, relieve the usual space for gathering people and create a feeling of being able to choose and satisfy different characters, affinities and functional requirements. The investment in the underdeveloped areas from the state carried out in the 70s of the last century created the ambience of small towns from several centers, or at least a town with a modern look. At the time, in addition to the mentioned the new uh, ed educational accommodation and tourist service craft facilities, cultural houses with multi-proposed halls were also built. In appropriate forms, in um, Sorry. Inappropriate forms in the centers of rural settlement range from architectural creation of low aesthetic criteria, with elements of kitsch to temporary storage space, barracks, kiosks, uh, containers, and improvised, par improvised parking for lots for trucks and heavy construction machines. The rural area suffers from the terror of the population that everything is allowed in it. The age of the buildings is not important for the con considering the possibility of revitalization of the centers, but the fact that uh, they can be repaired and adapted, they, uh, that they can be assigned a new purpose, all in order to preserve the visual and spiritual continuity. Their aesthetics, uh, which is not monumental, but is vital and essential, represents a tr uh, treasure in an attempt to uh, uh, revitalize the spirit of the place and preserve the spatial logic of the physical structure in the settlements. It is a fortunate custom sense that the villages of Serbia have not yet experienced the aggressive globalist unification of space and ambience. After the Second World War, in many places in Serbia, architecture was built without the obligation to reach aesthetic, aesthetic uh, achievements. It can be assumed, however, then that in, uh, in an attempt to revitalize uh, the settlement space, post-war architecture will have to fit into new concepts. There are several aspects of the problem of multifamily housing in the rural area. Solving housing problems of the clerical, non agricultural population in villages, first. Second, the population resort to their own agricultural activities, uh, and there is a gap between living in an apartment in a building and working on, the, uh, on a farm. Uh, third, uh, there is a visual, customary, sociological, uh, cultural, and other discre discrepancy between living in the multi apartment collective buildings and living in the countryside by the land and in the yard. It is necessary to look for a good design starting point in terms of marketing. Uh, in order to brand the settlement in a recognizable form and to enter the settlement revitalization project with already formed symbols, which will enter people's minds and support them to support the settlement brand. 
the revitalization strategy is articulated. This symbolism should be placed in every shop window, in every visible place and the, in the public space of the settlement. And the practice of preserving tangible and intangible cultural heritage has in significance in the process of village renewal, both of the spiritual sense in terms of personal enlightenment and setting a good example to the environment. And in terms of the cor correctness of the practice of the preser uh, preserving from oblivion, disappearance and collapse and erosion, artifacts of tradition, religion, occupations, customs, peculiarities and values. Design initiate uh, interest people, produce, make, report or build a label, get the necessary approvals so that the realization of the label is positively accepted is an extremely difficult task and requires full commitment to the idea, communication, skills of cooperation with different people and huge dose of enthusiasm and will. Uh, these are artifacts that are not in the rank of basic and commercial life needs, but in the sphere of spiritual upgrading and the mission of living a culture, cultural space in the space and the time of certain environment. And altogether is important the element of spiritual and material renewal and arrangement of space. Well, at the end, as part of the assignment uh, on the elective course named the public facilities in rural areas at the Faculty of Architecture University of Belgrade, students of the, the Master Academic uh, Studies in Architecture design. Uh, you can see here uh, the regeneration of the old of the old cooperative uh, home in the village of Dejan in southeastern Serbia. And now you can see some of their works. You can see that uh, the facility in the student's uh, interpretation can be, could be uh, repurposed, upgraded, remodulated, modernized, fit into a wider program, rehabilitated, reconstructed, whatever. In order to recycle and preserve it, in the structure of the settlement, and in the memory of the people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, since uh, we are slowly running out of time, I would get to the possible questions in the last quarter, possibly, and now uh, I would like to uh, get all attention for the last presenters, who is uh, Vidal Gomez Martinez. Hello. Are you here with us? Hello, here I am. Hello, you are here. So I will just try to make a brief presentation of you. And then we get back because uh, the timing, uh, unfortunately, I've got at least a few questions to the last presenters, but we need to skip to the art, to the, to the timing. And uh, Mr. Vidal Gomez Martinez is made part on if, of initiatives such as Section B, Architectura or Solution Urbana, and is currently a partner of Carlos Pedraza Arquitectos Asociados where develop projects of urban planning, building, and rehabilitation of historical heritage. This career is based on teamwork and continuous training, obtaining the title of architects with a specialization in building and urban planning, as well as the Master of Architecture and Historical Heritage from the Universidad de Sevilla. Internationalization has allowed him to carry out research stays at Camp Architect Ar the Mertopola in Portugal, and at Sapienza Universita di Roma in Italy, 
where he completed his training with studies in Rosauro at the Università degli Studi di Firenze. This intense research activity has resulted in number, numerous international congress participations as well as publications of articles and monographs, mainly focused on documentation, protection, and conservation of vernacular architecture. Since we are uh, running out of time, I would like to ask you to share your skin, uh, your, uh, uh, your um, screen, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... You can see okay? It's okay? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first, of, first of all, big, big, big congratulations to the organization for this huge Congress and thanks again for letting me show you uh, my work. This work is continued to a line of research that has made possible to identify a traditional vernacular house located in Seville province and surrounding areas in southwestern Spain. It was housed. Uh, uh, it was a house. It, it was a house without cultural recognition. A house that didn't even have a name. It's generally based. Uh, is generally based on large block that generate plots with an arrow facade and generous depth with dimensions varying from six to 12 meters of facade and from to 12 uh, to 20 to 40 meters depth. The surfaces vary from one, 100 to 300 square meters. The typology is configured through the juxtaposition of building bodies with domestic free spaces in between, according to a clear typology sequences defined by the presence of a facade body, a patio, an intermediate body, and a stockyard that uh, and a stockyard at the back. The wall structure is registered, um, registered by an independent system of passages consisting of a hallway and passage of the intermediate body, which separates the rooms from the access of animals and tools to the stockyard. These elements correspond to the needs of the inhabitants of these houses who worked the land and needed space for the storage of tools and supplies. The built body consists usually of a double bay, what allows direct ventilation of the rooms from the street or from the inner uh, spaces. They are generally one floor high and incorporate garret called Soberao, a sort of uh, attic or originally destined for the uh, storage that gradually gained high to accommodate a housing use. Auxiliary structures, uh, structures as the kitchen or a staircase, a staircase are often located in the patio, where a side gallery is sometimes integrated to improve, to improve access. The walls are made of tapia, brick or local stone masonry from 40 to 70 meters thick, while the horizontal structures are made of trunks or wooden beams with brick in the space between, covering gaps between two and three meters. The floors and roofs are executed in the same way. The coverings are made of ceramic curved roof tiles, although many of them have suffered a strong so a process of substitution, mainly in the inter internal bodies. Their appearance is simple, is simple based on the ubiquitous white of whitewashed uh, walls. Only the portals of the song ornament and the windows that slightly emerge from the plane of the facade. Through its extensive chronology from uh, 14th century to the first half of 20th century, it has retained uh, the characteristic simplicity, although the portals have in undergone a certain progress of formal adaptation. According to the, the typological characteristics, it has been uh, identified as hallway, patio, and backyard vernacular house, casa popular de patio y corral en español. Vernacular architecture is a vast and complex cultural fact composed of an infinity of analogous elements. Therefore, its documentation is one of the most complex challenges facing the protection policy. Uh, polities. In Spain, the highest resolution studies are offered by the historical ensemble special protection plans. This, pap uh, this paper takes a case of a study house in Lebrija, in whose special plan I had the opportunity to participate, uh, focus 
by, uh, by cataloging the domestic vernacular architecture. The documentation of vernacular architecture uh, of architecture in these plans is done manually, even if digital tools are used. After a parametric analysis, the, the buildings are visited, photogra uh, photographs are taken, and floor plans are sketched. The sketch are then digitalized using CAD tools. The plans and, and photos become part of a database where parametric data and literal description are included. With all this information, the plans and protection cards are drawn up. This working system is a, it has a limitation of offering a limited vision of the subject and it's uh, non accessible to the public. <clears throat> And this is not a little problem. As we see, 58% uh, uh, of buildings in Lebrija, protected buildings in Lebrija, correspond to vernacular architecture. 25% uh, of these protected buildings are, are hallway, patio, and backyard vernacular houses. Now I'm testing a, documenta a documentation system based on a low resolution 3D, 3D survey to have a definition architect uh, to have a high definition architectural documentation to fill the database and his low resolution to make possible to document all the buildings in in its full dimension using infrared survey we obtain a simple simple but complete models that allow us an on-the-go data access and immersive visiting for anyone with internet connections I have used Matterport platform that gives us a complete digital model and virtual visit in which we can also take mis measures of any point. We, uh, I have, you have here the QR code and also I have in the chat, I have, I have insert the link if you want to make the visit. <clears throat> Uh, they are no, these are no little houses. Uh, they are um, from th um, 300 to 400 uh, square meter of, co of, co of constructed area, but these are often ab abandoned and always in fair use. At the same time, each city has a great demand of social housing. We can estimate that no more than uh, 100, uh, 120 people occupy these houses. This paper focuses on, on this house in Antonio de Nebrija Street. As we can see, it, it fits perfectly to the typological scheme uh, described before. It's a, it's a house with near uh, 500 uh, square meters of constructed area and more than uh, three houses. 300 square meter living area offering a 1.45 proportion. If we spend, if we extend its range of the total constructed area of the houses, we obtain a total of more than 10,000 square meter living area. Following the guidelines for the social housing design in Andalusia, we can estimate it's enough to house nearly one. Uh, 120 family, families. Here we can see the possibilities of this kind of building uh, housing, uh, housing 60 willings of different kinds from one to two room. The proposal is made conserving the wall in uh, typological structure and, and nearly all the windows and access preserved to preserve also the formal environment. The images you can see, uh, you can see from, are from works uh, by García Torrente Arquitectos in Seville and Carmona. These are experiences of neighbor vernacular house, housing that we can take as a reference for the uh, hallway, patio and backyard house. As open conclusions, we can see the protection of the hallway, patio, and backyard house preserves a, a, a housing typology of great cultural relevance. At the same time, it will, it will guarantee the revitalization of historical, of historical settlements and also responding the social the will demand. We generate the willing, make possibly the 
co-living and allow the families to arrive to life with all people. We uh, the access system for tools and animals allows to access now with bikes or electric or electric little vehicles. Finally, the conservation of these houses can be a new way to qualify young people and preserve traditional construction system. Vernacular house conservation is not a problem. It's the solution for historical settlements and social housing in middle cities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very interesting presentation. So um, according to the schedule, we've got, I think, five to uh, 10 minutes for a question. So, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gomez, for the link. If you, if you click the link in the chat window, then you've got the link to the Matterport and you can actually visit, uh, make a full 3D visit of the house, which is very nice. Uh, I think you have tested it, I did. Now, um, uh, are there any more questions from, uh, from, from participants or from the guests who are here? Uh, in the link, you can choose uh, a subjective view or plan view, and also you can take measures, what is very, very useful for this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, any questions? Because we've got some time for discussions. Uh, yeah, if I may, I mean, uh, we can talk all the way until 6.30. So that's 34 minutes of discussion if needed. Okay, we don't have to, but if we can, because the next <laughs> session is starting at 6.30. So my comment here is about vernacular architecture, um, a key word that is widely used, but that we do not fancy that much in the ECOMOS Committee for Vernacular Architecture, preferring traditional architecture, uh, more of an original idea of what is tradition rather than an idealized modern version of, of history, which is what vernacular sometimes implies. It is very important uh, sharing um, experiences between different areas, Serbia, Spain, Italy, that is very important. So I'm happy we're doing this session and I just wanted to tell you all that uh, a few years ago, we had a PRIM, a National Interest Research Project on Small Towns. And you will find in the delegate package, the volume that we publish within the unit at University of Rome Sapienza about, about small towns and contemporary design. Because the point is once we have preserved, documented, survey, restored, et cetera, in terms of design, what are we gonna do to make the life make these small centers suitable for the contemporary life. That is the main issue. How is it possible to design something new? You need something new, which is compatible with the traditional character of the, not only in terms of style and materials, but also in terms of form. Finally, one last comment to Alexander. Thank you very much. I was talking on, on, on well, what's up, not the phone. One hour ago with Zoran Djukanovic, with probably uh, a friend of yours, and he asked me, you have Serbians in the conference? I said, quite a few. Uh, we're actually uh, probably, hopefully, starting the Erasmus Agreement with uh, University, uh, Belgrade University, which we proposed, I think, two years ago with Miriana. And now it seems like Zonan is going to handle. So I hope that we can cooperate in the future with your school, which I do like very much, to be honest. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you. Uh, the Zoran and the Miriana, yes, Zoran is a, is a, is a connection maker, a nice connection maker with people. Uh, and uh, he, he uh, I give from, from, from him, I heard a lot of things, uh, uh, nice lot of things about, about uh, some people which I know. I, I think that I know better than, than I know. Thank you. If I may, I've got a question uh, to, um, to Alexander. Um, Professor, um, uh, you mentioned in the beginning there's a problem with people, that more and, and less and less people, less inhabitants in, in the villages. And uh, I would just uh, ask, uh, how is the population now in Serbia? Is that the trend that 
only in villages the population is decreasing or is uh, general in all cities? Well, uh, in Serbia, it is a process uh, which is a try, uh, which is a um, big uh, stay. Uh, the same the same things happens. Uh, uh, I think uh, from Second World War from to today, uh, the population you know you know the the, the sum of of these wards, which which we all know the population, the agrarization, and so and the uh, Asian and Asian. Uh, how to say, uh, but uh, it is not uh, one uh, only one reason for this uh, to going in the, in the big cities. It is, uh, I think, uh, maybe you are right. Uh, it is something in the mentality of uh, in, in people, not only in Serbia, uh, to wish a better better life. Uh, uh, they think that better life is uh, always in a, in a urban. Uh, Environment uh, in 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 a rich environment. Now, I, I said this on uh, my presentation uh, in one sentence. Uh, this pandemic is a paradox that people uh, st uh, stay to, to to watch on life in, in opportunity way uh, because uh, now you you have uh, the, all all people. Uh, Big number of people uh, wants to, to build something in, in uh, nature, uh, try to, to, to buy a, a little ground, a little ground uh, uh, terrain and, and, and buy a house, uh, a cheaper, cheaper house to live. And it is, is, is uh, completely opposite from, from uh, tendencies uh, last decades. Uh, but I think that uh, people, uh, it is process. It is a long process, and uh, process of edu education, and process of uh, pro uh, to propaganda or, or what you, whatever uh, to change uh, minds of uh, of people to to edu uh, first educated people that the life is not not only speed. Uh, the life is um, maybe thinking uh, on. Uh, on way, uh, the, the thinking uh, e in the easy way, uh, I would say. Okay. Yes, uh, definitely. And I would like to add that uh, coronavirus probably uh, has helped buying and uh, trying to do something in a, in a, in a semi-detached houses or in villages. So uh, this process is is, is is growing. I'm I'm very happy that uh, Mr. Gomez has shown a very nice example of uh, new finished uh, reuse or um, re re regeneration of a vernacular architecture. Uh, maybe are there are any more comments in the session from anybody else. Um, maybe Zinep. Yes, please. If I may, uh, thank you very much uh, for these uh, presentations. Uh, well, I would like to link uh, the last presentation, Alexander Videnovich's presentation, and I see Michela. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, because I know that uh, in the previous sessions, in the small town sessions, we also talked about uh, uh, how to um, I won't use the word regenerate, but revitalize the life in these small towns. And uh, Alexander Vidanovic just mentioned that uh, uh, many people are trying to buy these uh, lands or houses in these small uh, villages or small towns. Also, you mentioned the, the, the aesthetics issue that uh, the, the people are building uh, some kitchen structures also the state is you know uh, 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 trying to create some some kind of a language through educational buildings if i'm not mistaken please correct me if i'm wrong so i think maybe we can talk about this issue of uh, again the the uh, actors of these 
villages or the, the, the people who are responsible of the survival of these vernacular architecture. So I would like to raise these questions in order to discuss all together. Uh, uh, Michaela, please join this discussion as well, because I think it's again underlined. I mean, who is using this uh, space? Who is making it to, to survive? Thank you. Yes, Alexander, I thank you, Zanip, to uh, make me enter the discussion because uh, I wrote a note when you, Alexander, was talking, Professor Videnovic was uh, uh, talking us, and so I am grateful um, you, you shared with us uh, your um, survey, your study, and your investigation, and your work with your student. And uh, I wonder to know uh, if uh, um, also here in Serbia, as I find out here in my experience uh, in this uh, small village in Italy, you feel a lack of uh, regulation. And uh, this is my first uh, query. And the second one is uh, if you feel uh, that a sense of community can help uh, to preserve these buildings and this uh, village at the very different level that you see, small village, uh, network of village and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I want to say that uh, it is something good in the, that, uh, not only pandemia, uh, in, in the economic, economic uh, uh, not rich uh, people, uh, to, to try to make a, a small, small uh, uh, buildings, uh, to make a small, uh, to, to try to to, to, to wish uh, small things uh, to be happy. Uh, why? Because I think uh, with with, uh, with a lot with lot of uh, squatter matters, squatter, uh, you have a you have a danger to, to going on on a kitchen. If you if you build if you if you made project or if you think on a on a, a last way a last way uh, if you think about uh, just about happy, just about uh, in enough uh, enough uh, relation. Uh, you can you 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 have not uh, in danger that that you uh, going to other side of the of the good uh, taste or, or uh, good looking architecture or or rational architecture. The whole traditional vernacular, uh, not only in Serbia, I think everywhere. Uh, the, the, the postament or philosophy of vernacular architecture is uh, uh, ratio. Uh, materials uh, around, uh, not from far, and the ratio in build in building, just the ratio, not not uh, no one element uh, plus, no one element uh, uh, what you need in 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 some in some good. Uh, is some uh, good uh, good uh, mission. Well, I, I will say, say it like like this. Uh, but then, just to underline what Michela uh, proposed, what about the regulations? I mean, yes, uh, there is the logic uh, that uh, try to keep it everything at hand, uh, very close by. But the, are there are there any regulations that prevent people to exceed these limits? For the case of Serbia, for instance, uh, Alexander Vidanovic. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, hmm. uh, sorry, can you can you tell me once again, please? Yes. Uh, what about the regulations? Because yes. you mentioned the ratio, you mentioned the nearby materials. That is the logic. I agree with you. But in Serbia, is there a regulation for people to to break these rules? You see, to, to bring out uh, uh, new materials to the uh, to the uh, site or to break this issue of ratio, is there any regulation? Yes, I understand. You can see on the students' work uh, some some interesting. Uh, what is interesting about this? What you're talking? Uh, uh, interesting is that uh, students take uh, modern materials. It is okay. It is okay to to use the modern the modern. Uh, Material in a, in a 
actually uh, in temporary architecture it's uh, completely okay uh, uh, with uh, with the opposite of old uh, uh, new materials is, is is very nice and is very actual but uh, they don't think about uh, about uh, uh, how, how that new material uh, uh, use uh, uh, and, and they don't want to 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 put them uh, near to old house they when we give them that uh, cooperative home in in that village to to make a reconstruction or, or regeneration of this house they uh, all of them uh, want to 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 destroy that house and make a new house they don't have a feeling for for preservate something in uh, to 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 make a, a spirit of or a spirit of a place spirit of a, of a village uh, where, where where people live uh, well, uh, this is a good way in in, uh, in school, in, in faculty, that uh, to give them uh, topics like like this. Uh, always something old, all, always something uh, for uh, for recycling, uh, recycling, uh, recycling uh, always something for regeneration, because the the, um, the aggressive new material and aggressive. Uh, I, I, I uh, if I can say uh, propaganda of new global architecture without without style, without region, without uh, roots, uh, always like water going more and more and more, and it, it is a big danger to to how to say to destroy everything what is local, what is regional, to, uh, destroy the character of the place spirit of the place uh, the, uh, regulation of this is in the dark uh, if you ask me for for regulation uh, when when the, the situation um, uh, make make a new make a rules rules for for a license for everything if you what you want to do in 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 the space uh, from from case to case, if I can say. Thank you. So do you, sorry, I, I enter the discussion again, sorry, I don't want to monopolize, but do you feel there is a gap between academics and the local communities in the uh, way they, um, in, in their approach, in their approach to preservation, isn't it? Yes, uh, here is a, uh, about presentation is uh, preservation is is uh, something interesting um, uh, very nice houses very nice uh, uh, artifacts in space uh, don't have if if the environment is not interesting uh, this uh, part, uh, particular uh, artifacts don't have a big uh, per, uh, preservation but if you have a uh, some less uh, quality or some less historical uh, main uh, for for for, for pre uh, preserve, pre preserving uh, maybe you have uh, put this in the some uh, which named uh, some uh, category which named uh, um, the house in the ambiental uh, ambiental uh, how to say environment this is, and we we have more ambiental environment than than the good houses for for preserving. But uh, I think it, it it is not so bad here. To uh, the, the institute for 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 heritage is uh, very busy, uh, especially in last time when when the some uh, some looks uh, some. Uh, uh, stories about architecture, about uh, what is good, what is uh, not good, uh, changed in in last years. I think uh, the, the, the preser pre preserved institutes are uh, uh, they have work uh, under the, the head in, in in last time. If you ask me that, if I don't, yes, uh, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Vidinovich. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Maybe there are any more questions, ideas, or remarks? If there is no questions, actually, I have one question to uh, Vidal Gomez Martinez. So thank you for this uh, specific link because it's, it is very helpful to me on doing my research. Uh, the part that I was wondering that you showed us a very beautiful typological plan in the beginning of your presentation. Uh, and then you describe these three houses that, as I understand, this is a complex of three houses, which you describe as different part, which are the backyard house, hallway house, and the patio house. But the one in the middle doesn't have any connection with the street. I was dealing with this problem because of the uh, locations of the patios are very interesting inside of the urban tissue. Um, is, there a, is this a common uh, thing that there is a one another building inside of the block that doesn't have any connection with the street and other than the corridor passing through another house? Uh, yes. Um, uh, initially, uh, uh, in the beginning, this house is one house. The whole complex is one house. One house with le generous dimensions uh, for our modern uh, concept of house uh, because of the need of the space for uh, the agriculture works. Uh, and so, uh, with, with the pass of the time, uh, these houses uh, naturally uh, are naturally divided. Usually, are two two ways to divide these houses uh, in a spontaneous way. Uh, one by floors, uh, one family in the ground floor, one family in the first floor. Uh, the first floor uh, not not is, is not always a floor because it ha can uh, begin like a um, reduced space uh, for storage, and after then uh, getting more high can have a living use okay and the other form is one uh, one house in the in the facade and another house in the back in the back uh, in the second built body uh, at urbanistic level this is difficult to to uh, to analyze because in spain you can you can't make into inner houses but if you have an inner free space enough um, wide you can make an inner house um, i think that this house is located in uh, in villages village we call villages uh, little cities from uh, 30 100 people uh, 50,000 50,000 people, uh, more or less. Uh, and so the historical city center is, is, is big. Uh, and so in introduce these elements is not always easy. Uh, there is, we have, I think, uh, we have to make uh, adjustments in the urbanistic uh, no, um, plans to uh, allow these inner, these inner houses, because the, the streets uh, oft, uh, often are um, uh, little from the courtyards. And so an inner house is really better than an exterior house. That's very, very interesting. And, um... What I'm wondering is, can uh, I see the outside of this block where it is located? Uh, I can link. Can, can, can you can you share the, the the plan of the house once more? Because we're talking about something we don't see. If you could share the plan, okay, on, on, on your PowerPoint. Also, one suggestion: Have you did you try taking that house and making a symmetric one, like a mirror? Try doing this. You'll see what I'm talking about when I say domus mediana. Uh, yes, I, I know, I, I know, I know. But uh, when you make a, uh, a superposition of the plants, mirror, mirror, not... mirror. Uh, I know, I know. Well, you make uh, the the mirror and you make the superpositions. It's not. Uh, it do, it it's don't fit. Uh, I, th I begin my research thinking about it, but uh, after... 
What do you uh, mean it's too narrow? You mean it's too narrow? Uh, it's too too big, too big. How how two two it? houses are too big to for for this kind of how, and also how big is the house? The, Eight the, meters point five, right? In the in the south in the in all Spain, but uh, um, uh, more in South Spain, between uh, Roman era and Christian era, uh, this house is Christian. Uh, there are seven uh, centuries of Muslim era. And I so know, but the, how, the, how wide is this house? How wide? Uh, between six and twelve meters. The width. See si, width. Oh, so you put two of them. See what happens. Two, Try two, doing this. Trust me. Twelve. Uh, and also the 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 morphology of the city and of the Roman city have an influence for uh, for the public for the streets for the public spaces uh, but uh, th this no, no, we in Spain in South Spain is not clear this connection from Roman architecture to Christian architecture. And, uh, uh, often the, the morphology is a twist. And so in, there is a no continuity. There is a no continuity between uh, these kind of houses. Uh, anyway, I show uh, uh, what, just a moment. Okay. It's a little heavy. This? Yes. I think Olsge wanted to say something looking at the plan, right? Yes, actually, I would be happy to see the uh, entire block, but even in that case, I, I, uh, while doing the research, I, uh, in my research in Zaragoza, so I realized that there is another uh, ancient city named Lepida Casa, where I find a building block which is showing almost the same typology with this than the settlement, as I uh, have read, was abandoned in 60 AD. But the, um, uh, how to say, uh, you see the rooms and the corridor, it's almost exactly the same that we are calling as the patio house, which has the patio in between, behind of it and the connection from the street to the backyard, which was very interesting to me. Some archaeologists was interpreted it as different functions in each uh, part of the same block, but I, um, I don't know because every time that I am uh, starting to um, calculate the distance in between them, it comes around like 10 meters or is, it, it's, it looks like they divided the land in three pieces and created some of some parts of those houses. Uh, I, ha I have uh, inserted the link for the, uh, for the position of this house, if you, if you, you. want to, to see the, uh, the wall area. Thank you. Oh, nice. May, may I share one second the screen? Uh, I want to show you uh, something. Sorry. If you if you want to to connect with me, you can send me a mail. Okay. That, that would be uh, so, so nice. Okay. Can I can I share the screen for one second? I want to show you something. Okay. See, this is what I mean. If you take two of them. And you double. I know, I know, I know, I know. I, I have understood. Uh, the, it's not the, the issue if this is Roman or not. Typologically speaking, this is half a courtyard house. But uh, in this very specific case, it is half a courtyard house, which but, has a, a but it's a house that a, it is a, 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 a courtyard house which has a you know something behind it, backyard. In that backyard, there are two other units that grew in, inside that space. This is what it is typologically. It's an issue of form, not an issue of date or measure of style, Roman, Iberian, Visigoth. Mm -hmm. Typologically, this is what I'm saying, but I don't know, my opinion, okay? Yeah. Uh, okay, okay.
Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, um, uh, the first uh, day of the symposium, we we talk about it a little. Uh, in Mertola, uh, there is a very very uh, deep uh, uh, knowledge of the Roman house and the passage from Roman to Muslim house and after to the Christian house. That is radically different to the Spanish houses. Uh, so the There's evolution... one thing that sp uh, Spanish scholars forget, that between the Roman and the Arabic, there are 200 years of history. Hey, okay, okay, hey, of course, of course. <laughs> so that's the <laughs> point, you know? Yeah, si, 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 si. Uh, and, and so this uh, early medieval is very, very... Uh, uh, far away from us, really. <laughs> um, but the, the patio house uh, usually in Spain is very linked uh, to, the, to the Roman house. But in my opinion, the, the, the Roman house that arrives to the Renascimental house uh, or Christian house, um, speaking in popular house, not uh, palaces is not direct by Roman to Spain, is, uh, is um, uh, by the influence of the, of the Almohade house. The Almohade, the Almohade house is a house very little in front of a Roman house, but is um, around a patio with an entrance in zigzag not direct entrance to the to the patio uh, and this is the the um, the initial position of this house uh, but when, when with the transition from uh, muslim to christians uh, there is a new a, a absolutely new uh, concept of these houses and and when we analyze uh, the um, the growth of the cities after the after the wars, uh, you see, uh, is in that moment when this this house appears, uh, is is uh, after the um, the Almohade house, but not linked. Can you write the name of that uh, Muslim house that you are saying? Because I I was not able to. Uh, my English. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, I should remind you that in three minutes we're going to begin our next session. So I would kindly ask Tomasz uh, uh, Bradeczki to uh, close this session, if I may. Yes, thank you very much. So thank you very much to all of you. It was very nice to listen, to hear and to exchange experience. As mentioned before, uh, there's a next session coming. So hopefully you will stay and uh, stay till the end. And uh, uh, Professor Kamis and all professors from uh, who organized this co conference, thank you in my name and uh, others that we could really discuss. Perfect organization, good time and very interesting presentations. So I keep my fingers crossed that everything will be working well till the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Yes, uh, Lisa. And uh, uh, so uh, let me uh, introduce uh, the next uh, session. The, uh, the next session is about contested spaces in urban planning and archaeology. And it will be chaired by Lisa Sepanen and co chaired by uh, Luai Al Hussein. So, stage is yours, Lisa. Thank you very much. And welcome to this last session of today. Yes, my name is Lisa Seppen and I'm an archaeologist affiliated to Turku University of Finland, where I hold the title of docent of urban archaeology. And um, I host this session together with Luai Al Hussein. Would you like to present yourself, Luai? Well, anyhow, um, you can see the um, program of today. We have four presentations. Oh, Lua. 
Yes, hello. Uh, good evening to everyone. Good day. Uh, my name is Luai Al Hussein. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm very delighted to be co-chairing uh, with Professor Lisa Sabanin today, and uh, I'm really looking forward for the today's presentations. Uh, I'm, I'm a master's student at Ozin University. Uh, maybe some of you are aware, uh, but let me uh, introduce myself again. Uh, I'm working on Damascus uh, ancient city and um, therefore uh, very glad to hear about uh, very nice uh, presentations on Beirut for, for, for these hours. So thank you very much. Thank you, Luai. Uh, yes, uh, this session consists of four presentations as scheduled originally, although the first presentation has changed. Um, Amir El Tayeb and Michael Short uh, had to unfortunately cancel their presentation and they have been replaced by a presentation by Rosa Fiorillo. And uh, Rosa Fiorillo's uh, presentation <laughs> takes us to southern Italy and Salerno. And after that, we focus on Lebanon and Beirut in other presentations. And I'm glad that we are able to have uh, Beirut and Lebanon. Uh, included in our program since we were supposed to uh, have this meeting in Beirut last year, but due to unfortunate circumstances, it had to be canceled. Uh, before I give a screen to our first speaker, Rosa Fiorella, I would like to remind that each speaker has 20 minutes for the presentation. From the minute you start speaking, we will give you a notice when you have two minutes left and one minute left in your time if needed. Uh, we shall have discussion at the end of um, the session and you can give your comments and questions on the chat box during the presentations. Furthermore, I would like to remind you that you need to keep your microphones off during the presentations. Uh, now let me introduce you our first speaker, Rosa Fiorella. Good afternoon, Rosa, are you there? Yes. Very good. I'm well there. Very good. Uh, Rosa Fiorillo, here you can see the Rosa's abstract and, uh, and um, presentation um, bio. Uh, Rosa Fiorillo is adjunct professor of Christian and medieval archaeology since 2019 at the Department of Cultural Heritage Sciences at the University of Salerno. Since 2014, she has been a member of the academic board of the research doctorate in research and studies on antiquity, the Middle Ages and humanism at the University of Salerno. Fiorillo provides teaching in the field of medieval archaeology and in her studies she has focused on buildings and materiality of late antiquity and Middle Ages, notably in southern Italy. And today she gives a presentation which is based on her studies in Salerno. The presentation is titled Aspects of Late Antique and medieval urbanism in southern Italy, the case of Salerno. Please, Rosa, you're welcome to start with your presentation. Thank you. Okay, I am uh, Alfredo Santoro. I speak for my colleague, uh, Rosa Fiorillo. Uh, we would like to thank the organizer for the invitation and the organization of uh, the event. Uh, we will uh, spoke, I read the text of the aspects of the late antique and medieval urbanism in southern Italy, the case of Salerno. Uh, Salerno is uh, structured on alluvial terraces between the hill of Bonadies in the north and the sea coast in the south, subordinated therefore by numerous jumps uh, in altitude and by a complex network of streams that cross it. The city owes fortune and adverse fate to water. The numerous traumatic events that have always accompanied its history are in fact an integral part of its morphology today as in the past. Between uh, 2014 and the 20. 18, the collaboration between the superintendents and the Department of Cultural Heritage Science 
within a large study project fielded by the strict data bank has allowed to have archaeological data mostly derived from the necessary preventive archaeology interventions uh, that followed the Arctic of uh, 1980. To these are added the data of excavation in the area of Lombard Cortes. Excuse me. Fred Excuse me. Could you have it on a uh, full full screen your presentation? Yes, in full screen. There. No, it's because better. You can basically click click on the button uh, below. Okay, perfect. Go ahead. Please. Perfect. It's okay. Sorry. Uh, as a result a large amount of information that contribute to the knowledge of the evolution of the city between ancient and medieval age. The ancient settlement was located between the current Via de Renzi, Via Madonna de Monte, Via Trotula de Ruggero, Via Tasso and Via Spinoza, and the Largo Campo included between the two streams, Lama and Eremita, and across by numerous canals, all flowing towards the coastline located much further inland than today. Between the first and the second centuries AD, the area of the Campo had already been transformed into a beach. And the new spaces jetting out on a coastline that was more advanced than in previous centuries. Housed the public bath and some largest domus. Today's Via de Mercanti is in these centuries the most important road in sound, inside the town. Here at the crossroads with the path and the torrent Eremita, today's Via dei Genovesi, a stretch of wall in the Indian Brit, found at a depth of about four meters with respect to the current floor, attesting it, uh, attested to the limit of the pre Roman city, while the stratigraphy and of reference allows us to consider it still in operation between the third and the fourth century AD, when the city is moving toward a stronger deconstruction of its main buildings. An epigraph affixed on the base of a statue, unfortunately not found, fixed to the half of the fifth century, the fifth century and imposing flood that fell on the city bringing uh, serious damage and causing numerous deaths. The disastrous event, however, only aggravated an urban crisis already in place and recorded archaeologically in several points of the city. In the area of Largo Municipio Vecchio, where the public baths were built between the first and second century AD, the 2010-2011 investigations conduced by the chair of medieval archaeology at the University of Salerno have revealed a long and complex phase of transformation that began at the end of the fourth century. A gradual decommissioning of the thermal environment was followed by the funerary occupation of the space and if not at the same time, the installation of store devoted mainly to the working of metal in a way that finds, in the way that finds local confirmation in that area of the citadel and in many cities, not only in Campania. Pole holes referable to small fence and wooden canopies, concentration of ashes, and calls, pits with slag and numeration, dr and numerous drains consist with the agent forge also identified by the presence of a pit with numerous ferrous residues, tress, and the 
concussion of crucibles. The coexistence of living and death in these years is evidenced by the continuity of burials that follow each other in the neighbor spaces then occupied by the Cortes Lombard Arrighi II. And the discovery of two tombs placed inside the space terrain craft habitat, unfortunately found strongly disturbed by the second construction of the walls and the building of the 13th century. The certification of the existence of a residential nucleus is given by the numerous small arts and large numbers of kitchen vessels, inc including Ole and the paints and the nine Klibani, small portable oven for ba baking bread and focaccia. The presence, the presence of a country yard is demonstrated by the marks left on the bones by the pecking of birds such as, as chickens, hens and roosters testifying to the custom of throwing away leftover food in the space in front of the dwelling. The structuring of the metallurgical workshop connected to the living space inside the thermal rooms of the state property cannot be an Autonomous, uh, autonomous activity and the epigraph affixed to the Canton tomb located in one of the abandoned thermal space allowed us to trace the dominus who managed the metallurgical production and reorganized, reorganized the space. It is, pos is, it is possible, in fact, that the very respectable Socrates who died and was buried at the end of fifth century was the new owner of the area following the alienation of the public space, which becomes more comprehensible if put in relation to the productive activity that took place next to it, starting in, the, in, the, in those years. The deconstruction is uh, certified in the same period also for the large domes, although with uh, some exceptions. Between the present Via Duomo and Via dei Genovesi, two residences of imperial age and large size through the closure of a passage no longer functional, the insertion of wooden partitions and the construction of arcades were transformed into housing units of smaller size. The residence located farther south between the Eremita stream and Via dei Mercanti, whose rooms were originally distributed uh, around a, court, a, court, a courtyard, was divided into two parts. The northern area was intended for living space with the fireplaces and the mortar floors while the one jetting out on the road welcomed the wooden structure for production activities. In these years, there was an important use of wood as a balding material, which was accompanied by the raising of masonry walls. The fate of the house found in Vico della Neve is different. Between the 5th and the 6th, 7th centuries, even though the special articulation of its representative rooms was changed, the house continued to be a luxury residence destined to welcome the cities, uh, welcome the city's elite aristocracy, uh, who still expressed. Uh, their belonging to a status through frescoes and valuable furnishing, such as a country yard with the pillars and the elegantly frescoes artus conclusus. The absence of churches and monasteries in these years seems almost indicative of an urban crisis 
that, however, clashes with the establishment and survival of house workshop that produced uh, that produced artifacts without interruption. The wide uh, the wide use of hood archaeologically attested for civil dwellings will seem to be the reason for the absence of traces of masonry buildings. But the numerous pits for the walking of lime found during the archaeological investigation, emitting the wall historical center allow other deductions. <coughs> In the middle of the uh, 8th century, well before the Frank Frankish uh, events upset the political and the territorial asset of Lombard, Italy, Salerno was invested by a strong construct constructive action of Benevento Duca Arichi II, who structured uh, his uh, ducal courtes in the western area of the town. The residential palace and the government had on its eastern side the gardens and the vegetable gardens of the monastery of San Giorgio to the south scenic staircase that connected the beach to the main floor below which were placed the cellars and service area. And the northern side, the green space opened in the residential connection that over the years will characterize it the Barbuti district while between Via da Procita and the Campo. Further homes and functional buildings designed to ac accommodate the activities related to the life of the court, found in an in a elegant powered, in, in a, an, an elegant powered road connection to the sacred palace. Difficult to grasp the urban uh, medieval aspect of the city in uh, what remains and useful would be a graphic reconstruction able to compensate the absence of the archaeological creativity. The jumps in the eight, defined uh, by the answer of the trital cones, complicated not a little the reading of the plains of a frequentation, it is enough to think that between Via dei Mercanti and Largo Municipio. Uh, the present road quotas are placed with a different in an eighth of about three meters, one from the other. And in ancient times, it was not different. To an attentive and interested visitor, however, we can point out the remains of ancient architecture that persist below the superfetations of modern and contemporary age. In the two century to come the human development index uh, of demographic increase favored by the economic conditions started in the previous centuries involves the vegetables area, those uh, immediately behind the hill and the space delineated along the coastline by the advancements of a coastline. The ducal and the princely courtes, flanked by the construction of the sacred buildings, determined the birth of a new neighbor uh, over time defined in toponymy by the work vocation or religious matrix, or again, by the origin of the residence. In the second half of the ninth century, at the base of the hill Bonadias in the natural terracing either than the city, where there were some buildings and the Balneum, served by the aquifer and the Palma Dicitur. There is the monastery of San Lorenzo in the lower terrace, a rise uh, that of San Massimo church, built by the Prince Guayferio, uh, adjunct to the East Palace that together with, uh, with that of uh, San Benedict, built, uh, built on the Eastern limits of the city, implements the architectural development 
of the urban aqueduct. In the court of Lauro, Adelaida built the church of Sant'Angelo, the Castaldo Pietro, that of the Saints Matteo and Tommaso Guido and Aloara, the church of San Michele, Giovanni and Sigal Gaeta, Santa Maria dei Genitrice, then Santa Maria de Donno, that in the time will uh, constitute the pool of the Jewish quarter. The present of the I don't understand. Admin, please, can you mute the sound? Uh, it's, uh, it's, sorry, it's, it's just uh, from a uh, different speaker. You can continue, please. Uh, sorry. <laughs> the presence of a bilingual ethnic population from the, this period is in a strong dependence of the newly formed distinct Amalfitano, structured by the will of Prince Sicone and favored by these uh, successors. The Western area of the city is also equipped with buildings of a workshop to use uh, and the custom Greek, including, uh, including the disappeared church of San Giovanni dei Greci and the surviving churches of the Santa Trofimena and Saint Andrew that said the Lama. To investigate the remains, the absence of a liturgical buildings built a bishop authority that, according to the documentation, seems to lack of land in the urban area. Uh, sir, uh, excuse me, I beg your pardon. Uh, I think you have just uh, two minutes left. Two minutes? Yes. Okay. Okay. Between the 11th and the 30, 13th century, a good number of notarial acts testify contracts of lease of a purchase uh, of goods of religious and the secular property between the area occupied by the Church of Santa Maria de Mare, then Santa Lucia, the ancient street of Marcelli, the monastery of uh, San George, the Church of Sant'Angelo de Mare, and the Caraya Road. Uh, from part of Ebrus was patronymico is at the station, uh, a presence that proceeds in generation the year of the Rogito. Between, the, between 1165 and 1167, uh, there were about 600 Jews in the city who gave life to a community consisting mainly of uh, dyers who are flanked by butchers and the manufactured of silk and uh, wine skins and uh, where it was also built the church of San Salvatore de Fondaco. Mm -hmm. yeah. We go to conclusion. Following the conquest of uh, Guiscardo, the Norman Guiscardo and the construction of the new cathedral basilica, whose magnificence councils builds, building a memory of the pre, previous ecclesia. The city changes the shape, is its shape. In full 12th century, tower houses soar, uh, soar over the housing structure of one, two floors, and uh, the city is uh, colored marco piano, bands were up to the succession of stuff. Brick and stone outline single and double lancet windows of the residents of the new ruling class. They rise now to the houses, palacier de ta, uh, to three, four plans realized, uh, realized by activities maestrances in Campania between the, the 12th and the first half of the 13th century, to which they will be inspired also numerous urban buildings of the following century. Excuse me, I would like to remind you that you are running out of your time. Yes, we, we, are, we, we, are, we have, a, we have the, the, the last, uh, the last uh, conclusion. Okay. <clears throat> Mm 
numerosa. The aspect of the city is strongly changed. In the area that welcomed the Lombard Cortes, numerous collapsed following the numerous seismic tremors or fake that uh, occurred be between the 10th and the 13th century have determined and the considerable rise in road levels, transforming the original ground floor in, uh, in underground environments. Mm -hmm. The following centuries will see the urbanization of the space occupied in ancient time by the dwellings of the Roman Imperial Age with the construction of a large palace and a new ruling class that will rise looking and see from the two natural terraces of Viatasso and Viatrotua de Ruggero. But the ancient city almost doesn't exist anymore. The stratification, the collapse, the outtakes, and the flows have made the difficult its a con connection, mm -hmm. and the city still today lacks of a programmed archaeological research. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank you very much for your presentation, Rose and um, your colleague. Um, the presentation provided us with information about history, urban planning, and uh, building was um, which was very interesting. We will get back to your presentation during our discussion at the end of the session, and I would like to remind the audience about the possibility to post the comments already on the chat. And our next uh, presentation um, takes us to Lebanon, and our next speaker, Patricia Antaki. Are you ready? Good afternoon, Patricia. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, let me introduce you very briefly. You can read Patricia's biography on the screen, but uh, Patricia Antaki has PhD in medieval archaeology. She works as a director at the Department of Archaeology and Museology of the University of Valament in North Lebanon. Her research interests and studies are mostly related to the archaeology and archaeological heritage in Lebanon and the Levantine region. And today she's talking about inclusion of archaeological heritage in today's urban landscape, planning and development projects. And the title of her presentation is A Living Past, the Place of Medieval Heritage in Modern Lebanese Towns. Please, Patricia, you are welcome to start sharing your presentation. Okay. Professor Patricia, before you start, uh, I would like to remind you that you have uh, 20 minutes for your right. presentation, and we will remind you when it comes to two minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I still cannot share my screen. Okay. Please try now. Yes. All right, so can you see it? Yes, pretty well. Please go ahead. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Or I should rather say good evening, uh, at least from here, from Lebanon. I would first like to thank the organizers and especially Lisa for having me here and for the fantastic job that you're doing. Uh, so my talk today will address the medieval archaeological heritage that has survived in the major Lebanese towns and the way it is incorporated in the modern urban uh, fabric. So what we designate by medieval in Lebanon is quite a long period that spans from the 7th century to the 16th century and which includes obviously several major phases. The early Islamic one, the Crusader and Ayyubid one and the Mamluk one. Um, so I chose this period not only because it's my field of expertise and my passion, actually, but also because it corresponds roughly to the last effective milestone in archaeology as it is regarded in Lebanon. And therefore, these remains are the last ones on the historical Lebanese timeline, which includes prehistory, Bronze Age, Iron Age, Hellenistic, um, Roman and Byzantine periods. So in order to discuss this topic in such a short time, I invite you to follow me into each one of um, the several major towns of Lebanon before moving to a synthesis and try to draw some general lines concerning the place attributed to these remains and therefore their impact on the local culture. 
So let's start with uh, Tripoli. Tripoli is located in North Lebanon on the Mediterranean coast and it's considered as the country's second largest town after Beirut with a population of more than um, half a million. So the city was founded originally in the late Bronze Age period in the first millennium BC in what seems to be the area known as Elmina that is the harbor, a very important uh, feature for the city, as you can guess. So this is an old plan and you can see um, Elmina here. So in the subsequent periods, Elmina is also the place where the city developed until the end of the 13th century, when the Mamluks conquered the region and raised the town built by the Franks, that is the Crusaders. So I will use uh, both terms. So what they did, what the Mamluks did afterwards was to rebuild a new town inland, two kilometers to the east here, uh, along the banks of the Kadisha or Abu Ali River at the foot of a hill known as uh, the Pilgrim's Mount, which was occupied by the Crusader fortress. So since that period onwards, and more particularly in the 20th century, the city has developed in almost all directions. So here you can have an idea of what it looks like today. And of course, all this empty zone here um, is today occupied by concrete buildings. So today, the only archaeological remains left in Tripoli are the ones of the medieval period, which of course makes me very happy. <laughs> First, those of the Crusader period, when Tripoli was the chief town of the county of Tripoli itself. These are mainly the citadel, uh, and a crusader church nearby, and second, the Mamluk town itself, with some 30 still surviving monuments from that period, and which corresponds to the old residential and souks zone. Uh, and finally, two Mamluk towers, the Lion's Tower, very famous, and the Ras al Nahar Tower, which were initially part of a network of seven towers built to defend the coastline. Except for the Crusader Church and the second tower, Ras al Nahar Tower, all of these monuments are today open uh, to the public and are part of a traditional, the traditional tourist path of the city. Indeed, the successive master development plans of Tripoli, which followed the foundation of the Lebanese state in 1943, have all taken into consideration these features, and in particular, the old Mamluk town, as it is still densely populated. Some of the Mamluks building, uh, namely the mosques, the khans, the hammams, the souks, have even been restored under the auspices of the DGA, the Directorate General of Antiquities, and the municipality of Tripoli, and are thus well preserved. As for instance, Hammam al zadin or Souk al-Haraj. So our second example is the coastal town of Jbel or Byblos, which sits halfway between Tripoli and Beirut, as you can see. It is definitely a much smaller town than Tripoli, covering only 75 hectares and home to some 20,000 inhabitants. Now, Jbeil is mainly renowned for being the ancient Near Eastern site with the longest uninterrupted population settlement from 7,000 BC to the present day. Now, I know many cities also claim the same thing, and maybe in Turkey you have one or two like this. So the first settlement from the Neolithic period was established on what has become today the archaeological site. Sorry. So which is this area in orange here, uh, which overlooks the sea. So you have the first Neolithic settlement, which is here, and it's also there that the remains of all the subsequent periods can be visited. That is the remains of the Chalcolithic occupation, the Bronze Age settlement within its ramparts. So here you can see the, the Bronze Age ramparts, which are these ones here, and the Iron Age settlement with all, also its own ramparts, which are just in front of the Bronze Age ramparts. So this was the first city here. And during the classical period, the town expanded and the Tel became the Acropolis. And finally, in the Crusader period, that is the 12th and 13th centuries, the town was one, one more time enclosed into a city wall, which is this line here and this one here, 
and was marked by the construction of a massive fortress on the tell itself, the archaeological tell. So here you have the fortress and the construction of a church, which is today the Cathedral of St. John Mark in the middle of the town, and also the building of two towers of which only one is left to defend the harbor entrance. So you have the harbor here, for those of you who don't know Jbeil, and you have uh, the tower here. So this is the fortress, this is the, um, the bag, the abscess of uh, the lovely cathedral of St. John Mark, and this is the harbor uh, with the entrance here and the still standing tower here. So due to the importance of its archaeology and history, since it was excavated in the 1920s, the whole area of 10 hectares encompassed within the medieval ramparts is a protected area with very strict regulations and with only some 40 families living there. Well, the counter effect is that it looks more like a ghost town, but well, we cannot have everything, right? So therefore, the physical expansion of the town took place outside these limits, as you can see here. Therefore, all the ruins also, including the medieval ones, are very well preserved and well integrated in the tourist circuit, which can be discovered through a very pleasant stroll. So our next case study is the capital, Beirut, which I think doesn't need much presentation. Uh, the history of the birth and growth of the city is well known. It starts in the Bronze Age period, again, in the third millennium BC. At that time, the city lay on what is known today as the Tell of Beirut, that you can see here, north of the downtown area on the seaside and was enclosed in a city wall. So this is an old uh, plan of Beirut of the late 19th century. Um, and here you can see uh, the entrance um, of the Bronze Age period uh, city uh, set inside the, the fortification walls. And here you have a nice section showing the Bronze Age settlement and the succession of the Bronze Age um, uh, city walls. So these are from the Bronze Age. This one is probably from the Iron Age one, and this one is from the late Phoenician period. So you can see how the city grew little by little towards the south. So all these features are on the tell, on what we know is considered as the archaeological tell of Beirut. So in the subsequent Phoenician period, as I said, the city was slightly bigger. And then in antiquity, the city expanded beyond uh, these walls and became in the Roman period, an important colony, the colony of Beritus. Now in the medieval and later Ottoman periods, the city walls enclosed the area, which corresponds more or less to modern day uh, downtown. So these are the old uh, medieval and Ottoman city walls. And finally, at the end of the 19th century, walls were demolished and the population started occupying first the immediate surroundings and then went progressively farther until the town was transformed into the large metropolis of more than 2 million people that we know today. Now concerning the remains of the medieval period, there are a few of them, the majority having been uncovered during the excavations of the last decades, which followed the end of the civil war in 1990. First, we find those which display a defensive character, and these are parts of the citadel to the right with its moat, which lie at the initial, as you can see, north northeast angle of the city on the ancient tell. And in addition, a small segment of the western city wall and its moat have also been preserved to the left. Um, the second type of medieval remains are religious monuments. These are the Crusader Cathedral, uh, as in Jbeil, uh, it's almost the sister of um, the, the Jbeil Cathedral, and a Crusader old church in the center of downtown, as well as a Mamluk Madrasa known as Zawiyat ibn Ara al Dimashqi. Now, these remains can still be visited today. The fortress is currently completely abandoned and neglected due to the dramatic situation the country is going through, but it was originally integrated into the tourist circuit of the city. The city wall and its moat have been rehabilitated, as you can see to the left, and included in the modern souks. As for the religious buildings, the cathedral is today the, the great Amari Mosque, and the Crusader Church is located in the crypt of St. George Church and is open to the public. 
And the Mamluk Zawiya has been restored and is well highlighted at one of the entrances of the souks area. However, the majority of the inhabitants and the visitors are either completely unaware of the existence of these monuments. Most of the people, for instance, don't know that there's a fortress in Beirut because as you can see, it's kind of hidden underground and or know nothing about the history and significance of these monuments. So let's continue our journey uh, southwards to Sidon. Sidon lies also on the coast, some 40 kilometers south of Beirut, and is the capital of the South Lebanon Governorate. It's the third largest city in Lebanon after Beirut and Tripoli, and home to a population of about 80,000. Now, literary sources and also archaeological remains attest the importance of the city, especially during the Canaanite and the Phoenician periods. However, in contrast with Beirut, the exact ancient topography of Sidon is still undetermined. The most ancient historical remains belonging to the Bronze Age period were found a few years ago at the foot of the Tell overlooking the sea. So the Tell is here and the remains were found here. Uh, I hope you can see my pointer. A tell which has yielded at the beginning of the 20th century many remains from various periods. The urban picture becomes clearer in the medieval period and especially in the Crusader I when Sidon became a lordship belonging to the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. The town was then protected by massive city walls that you can see here and here and corresponded to the present old souks, what we know today as the old souks. In the later Ottoman period, the city remained inside these ramparts, as was the case in Beirut until the end of the 19th century. Now, the major medieval features are a portion of the city walls and its adjoining moat, recently excavated by a British Lebanese team, two Frankish fortresses, the land castle erected on the Tell and the sea castle built on an island offshore to the north of the port, as well as the Frankish cathedral turned into a mosque, as is the case in Beirut in the 13th century. Uh, although these remains can be visited today and the castles have been restored and consolidated recently, so far no information was provided on the sites. However, the DGA, the Directorate General of Antiquities, is currently working on this matter and preparing explanatory panels to be implemented on both sides. As for the city wall, it will become part of the archaeological visit which will accompany the visit of the museum that is being built on top of it. Our next stop is Tyre or Sur in Arabic. Tyre is the capital of Tyre district and has a population of approximately 200,000 inhabitants. Now, Tyre was originally an island during the Bronze and Iron Ages. It was linked to the mainland by Alexander the Great during the famous siege of 332 BC, which allowed him to conquer the city. So the island was here uh, and the mainland here. Uh, and over the centuries, the city has turned, as you can see, into a peninsula as we know it today. In the Roman and Byzantine periods, Tyre flourished at all levels and witnessed several monumental constructions, such as imperial baths, public buildings, roads, a hippodrome, an aqueduct, and a vast necropolis. So, for example, here you have the public baths, here you have the hippodrome or circus, and here you have the necropolis at the entrance of the, of the city, before the entrance of the city. Um, in the medieval period, the city shrank and had to protect itself from invaders by building several city walls around the peninsula and on the land side. So around the, the peninsula here and on the land side at this level, particularly at the time when it had become one of the major strongholds of the Crusader Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. And after it was destroyed by the Mamluks in the 13th century, it was almost completely abandoned until the 18th century, when there was an attempt made by a local governor to repopulate it and bring it back to life. From the medieval period, a few but interesting remains are left. These are the towers belonging to the original city walls, Burj Al Hiram to the right on the land side and Burj Mubarak um, to the left on the sea side. In addition to these, the Crusader Holy Cross Cathedral, as it was called, and which saw the, the, the crowning of several kings also when Jerusalem was captured, uh, it still displays, as you can see, some spectacular remains. 
And last but not least, a crusader chapel set in the middle of the spina of the circus. So the middle of the circus, that's the chapel here. And behind, you can see the tier seats of the hippodrome. So this chapel is largely unknown by the public, but really deserves special attention as it contains numerous graffitis from the Crusader period and drawings mainly of boats. Although the most impressive monuments of Tyre are of course those of the Roman and Byzantine periods and are therefore very well highlighted, the medieval monuments can also be accessed, especially the two churches which are located within the archeological sites. Now we move eastwards to the Beka Valley, which runs from north to south between the Mount Lebanon range and the Anti-Lebanon range. And here we will focus on two towns, Baalbek and Anjar. Baalbek is today a small import, but important town being the capital of the North Beka district with a population of 80,000. Now, during ancient times, Baalbek was a place of worship. As you know, the story starts in the Phoenician period, continues in the Hellenistic era, and culminates in the Roman period where Heliopolis, the city of the sun, as it was then called, became an important pilgrimage place which attracted thousands of pilgrims. So the Roman city enclosed in its walls that you can see here, it's the, the black line, uh, comprised several monuments, among which was the Acropolis here in yellow, uh, where two of the most famous Roman temples in the world still stand, the famous Jupiter temple and the Bacchus temple, considered by some as the best preserved Roman temple in the world. The temple complex was transformed in the subsequent Byzantine era into a, re a Christian religious complex and then from the 7th century to the 13th century into a fortified citadel, which was occupied, destroyed and rebuilt several times by the Umayyads, Abbasids, Fatimids, Seljuks, Zenjids, Ayyubids, the Mongols and finally the Mamluks. From the 16th century onwards, European tourists began to visit the picturesque ruins, uh, which were to be excavated by the Germans at the turn of the uh, 20th century. And of course, over the centuries, the town grew gradually around the main pole of attraction, that is the archaeological ruins. Patricia, and, yes. uh, I need to remind you of your time. You have uh, two minutes left. Two? Oh, okay. Uh, so... As we said, during the period extending from the 7th to the 15th centuries, which correspond to the Middle Ages Baalbek, to the Middle Ages, Baalbek played an important role in the various territorial conflicts that took place in the region and hence witnessed several occupations. So what are the traces of these events? They consist of three major sites of monuments. So I'm gonna be quicker. <laughs> First, the citadel, which is located in the sanctuary's complex itself. The second set of medieval ruins is the rich settlement that developed south of the citadel. And the third medieval evidence is the Umayyad mosque that stands also close to the citadel and which incorporate uh, antique columns and capitals. Um, so all these archaeological features, I will speak, skip my paragraph, are well integrated, let's say, in the urban fabric and in the archaeological sites. And I will quickly move to the last town, which is Anjar, which is also in the Beka Valley, and it's located along the Beirut-Damascus Highway. The history of Anjar goes back to the Umayyad period, as attested by its archaeological site. Um, the uncovered remains represent the ancient town itself, which has, um, which really looks like a Roman town. And actually it's this mixture between the Roman and Byzantine architecture and the Umayyad one that makes it uh, so remarkable and interesting. So it's really a remarkable example of this architectural mixture. And the site is very well preserved um, and it's well integrated in the urban fabric of the town, which was settled by an Armenian community in 1939, as you, some years before the, the discovery of the town. So we'll jump to the conclusion now that we have gone through uh, all the major Lebanese cities and explore their medieval remains and the way they are integrated in the cultural landscape. I'll try uh, to draw some very um, short general lines. We have seen that except for Anjar, all these places are very rich 
in archaeological remains from all the periods, and four of them are actually classified by UNESCO as World Heritage Sites, Biblos, Tyre, Baalbek, and Anja. We have also seen that medieval period remains are present in all of them at various levels and in several forms, and this medieval wealth is due to the rich history of the region at that time and the numerous events that took place here from the Islamic conquerors to the Crusaders and the Mamluks. The place assigned to this medieval heritage varies from one place to another, depending on the density of population and of the will and the resources of the relevant stakeholders. But in general, we can say that the urban plans carried out by the Ministry of Public Works and Transport usually take into consideration these aspects, even if the implementation is far from being optimal. The Ministry of Culture through the, the DGA, the Directorate General of Antiquities, also plays a leading role in protecting and exhibiting in a proper way these monuments by coordinating uh, several projects and collaborating with various institutions. The final goal is, of course, to raise awareness among the people about this precious heritage, which is still largely neglected. But let's keep hoping and working hard to make this wish come true. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. It was um, very interesting. And um, I was very happy that you took all of us to this nice excursion to Beirut and uh, all other cities, because we were actually supposed to have excursions to these cities um, last year. So it was really wonderful. And we can continue with um, these towns uh, when we have our discussion. And um, at the end of our session, and let me introduce you our next speaker. He is Professor Andrew Peterson, and you can see his uh, abstract and uh, short biography on the screen. Um, Professor Andrew Peterson is from the University of Wales, Trinity, St. David, United Kingdom. Hello, Andrew. Hello. Yeah, that's good. Very good. Yes. Nice to have you with us. Yeah, um, nice to actually meet you, everybody. Yeah. Very good. And um, he's the Director of Research in Islamic Archaeology in University of Wales as well. Um, Professor Peterson studied medieval history and archaeology at St. Andrews, followed by a degree in Islamic architecture at Oxford. His PhD at Cardiff University concentrated on the development of urban centers in medieval and Ottoman Palestine. He has worked in and carried out research in a number of countries in the Middle East and Africa. And he has also worked in British archaeology with a speciality in recording standing buildings. Andrew Peterson has written a large number of articles and several books based on his research in the field of archaeology and architecture of the Middle East and Islamic architecture. He's a fellow of the Royal Historic Society and member of the Chartered Institute for Archaeology. And today he's providing us with a presentation of an early Ottoman Beirut with the title Rediscovering the Early Ottoman Beirut. Please, the uh, screen is all yours. Okay, right, here, I'll just see. Not yet, yeah, okay, now, please. Is that going? Is that working? You can share your screen now. Share. Okay, we see it clearly. Please. Is that go okay, ahead. good, right. Okay, um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Lisa Sepinen for, for the, uh, for the in introduction and also for, for being the organizer of the first, first version of this, this session, this conference, which was, as, as was meant to be in Beirut. Um, and I'd also like to thank the organisers of the, the whole conference for making this happen. I think it's a very, very good opportunity to talk between different regions and different disciplines. So I think it's a very important and interesting conference and I'm very good to be part of it. Um, now, my own um, interest in, in Beirut is because I spent... Um, a year at the American University um, uh, as a visiting professor um, a couple of years ago, and I became very interested in um, in Beirut, partly because I was living there, but also because I I found that despite the fame of the city and its importance, 
that the archaeology was not as well understood as, as, as you'd expect it to be. And also that uh, one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in, one of the periods, the Ottoman period, was um, as, as, has not really been fully investigated. And uh, the, there are a number of reasons for this. Um, and this is to do with perhaps to do with conflict, perhaps to do with um, with the way Beirut was revitalized after the uh, civil war. And also it may have other historical reasons within uh, roots within within Lebanon. But um, during my time in Beirut, I became increasingly interested in, in, in this period. And also I was aware that there are actually quite a lot of um, sources for, for the Ottoman period of Beirut. And um, so I decided to do uh, some research on this. And as, as um, some of you may know, there's uh, the 19th century, the, the late Ottoman period in Beirut is in fact very well known. And it's uh, in particular through the works of people like Jens Hansen, who's, who's produced a book on Van de Siekel, Beirut, the, the period when Be Beirut was made into an Ottoman provincial capital, simply because of its huge commercial success compared with other cities within what was then um, uh, 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 Syria. Um, Greater Syria. Um, um, just to look at the, the beginnings of the Ottoman period, what was in Beirut um, before the 19th century, what, what was Sir Beirut Peterson. like in the early Ottoman period? Now, yes? Would it, Bob, would it be uh, possible to turn off your camera, maybe? The connection is, is a little bit uh, weak. Yes, yes, yeah, sorry, yes, yeah, so of course, of course, yeah, yeah, sorry. How do I do that? Um, um, um. Yes, yeah, stop video. Oh. Stop video, hey, uh, stop share. And then stop video, yeah, okay. That's right, so... I think you're, you're, saying again. you're showing the wrong the, the wrong screen because we see the the Zoom meeting. Yeah, is this okay now? No, yeah. you're sharing the you're sharing the Zoom meeting, not the PowerPoint. Okay, and would just... would be better to stop sharing and start again by selecting the PowerPoint because we're seeing your Zoom meeting, not the PowerPoint. Okay, right. Yeah. Okay. So screen. Ah, uh, right, okay, pop there. So I, I stop your, I'm gonna stop your screen sharing. Okay, so that, now you can share your screen again, hitting the green button, share screen and select your PowerPoint therein. There you go, much better. Does that work? It is coming up, yes. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, no problem. Okay, so, um, yeah. So, um, I was really interested in looking at the, uh, the early Ottoman period, just to look at where, where this spectacular 19th century Beirut came from, and really what happened in the um, uh, in this early period. So first of all, as as you may be aware, there there are many different views about um, about history within Lebanon and in particularly within Beirut. Uh, but what I was struck by is that the, uh, the there seems to be a, a, a generally not a very positive view of the Ottoman era. Um, 
and uh, amongst some people in any case. So um, I'll just give you a quote from um, uh, a well-known book on, on Beirut, which states that after defeating the Mamluks, um, Syria and Egypt in 1516, Syria and Egypt were added to the Ottoman Empire and followed. The Ottomans were only interested in collecting taxes and Beirut uh, declined rapidly during this period. So the, I was quite interested in, in this, this view that, that the, 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 the start of the Ottoman period was actually uh, a period of decline within Lebanon. And um, I thought this is quite interesting because when you look at um, many of the other Ottoman cities in the Middle East, uh, for example, most famously Jerusalem, but even Baghdad, uh, Damascus, lots of the cities, their, their populations seem to have increased during this period and there's a lot of evidence for urban regeneration. And so I, I was interested in, in whether this was also perhaps the case with Beirut. And the other interesting thing within this context is the fact that really before the 16th century, before the 16th century, Beirut was not really so important within, within what is today Lebanon. It wasn't the most important city. Really, Sidon and Tripoli were more important to, during the Mamluk period. So I was interesting, interested in whether um, the Ottoman um, uh, the Ottomans actually fostered the development of Beirut from the 16th century onwards. Now, um, I'll just next. Um, so um, this is um, a, a famous monument, which is the the two the Zawir of Ibn uh, Al Arak, which is. Um, which was built right at the very end of the Mamluk period or the beginning of the, the Ottoman period, whichever way you like to see it. And this was um, so-called discovered uh, during the uh, clearance of the Beirut souks in the 1990s. And it's the same building as you saw in the first slide. And here's a, here's a, here's a view of that building today. And this was um, really um, uh, a Zawir built uh, in about 1517, we think, between 1517 and 1520s, uh, in an area which probably would have been um, uh, parkland within, within, within Beirut at the time. And these are, these are some um, uh, floor plan, ground plan and sections by uh, uh, Hueda Harithi, who studied the building. So that was really the... Um, the end of the Mamluk period or the beginning of the Ottoman period. Now we have, we're, we're fortunate that we have a very early record of a uh, sort of pictorial record of Beirut. There are, there are quite a few documentary sources, but not really many uh, uh, graphic representations. And here we have a, a representation of Beirut on the, um, in the Kitab Bahriya, or the, 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 the Book of the Seas, by the famous Ottoman uh, uh, sailor, geographer, navigator, Piri Reis. And it shows um, uh, Beirut with its harbour, and you can see uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the mountains of Beirut, the harbour itself, and, and, and the town of Beirut. And just in front of it, you'll see a ship which looks to me like a uh, like a, um, a European ship moored just anchored just outside the harbour. Um, now, uh, there's also a map which describes Beirut, and not surprisingly, it mostly concentrates on the anchorages where, where it's possible to anchor a ship, uh, where there are hidden shoals, where it's dangerous to sail and, and the right approach to the harbour and prevailing winds. But it does also mention um, things which could be seen from the ship, which could be used for navigation, such as the, the shape of the mountains. But what I think is quite interesting looking at this, um, this image is you, you can see um, you can see the harbour itself, plus you can also see um, 
um, uh, several towers. One on the one to the um, to the to the north um, to the south of the city, uh, and one on the headland, and also several um, fortified buildings around the harbour itself and then uh, something that looks like a castle and then a series of um, arch of the ship which I think probably represent perhaps some form of um, um, merchants houses or, or warehouses so this is our first representation and this is this is as, as the caption says it's from from about 1521, 1525. So this shows again is this is uh, Beirut right at the end of the Mamluk period, just just when the Ottomans were um, mapping their new territory. We have to wait quite a long time for the next uh, uh, sort of cartographic representation of Beirut. This is a map of Beirut by and its surroundings by Major Rochefort Scott in 1844. This, he, was a, uh, he was in the British Army and he was charged with mapping um, the coast of uh, what was Syria and also in particular the, the cities because um, the British government was interested in um, in uh, in the area and the nature of the fortifications uh, uh, with the potential possibly for further military action but this is a this is an invaluable map and it show, you can see here that the um, the, the 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 urban area of Beirut is marked in in pink in the left hand corner, and there's also a separate map, much more detailed. And this map was the uh, the map that was the um, basis for Michael Davies' uh, maps and analysis of um, of medieval and antique Beirut, medieval and later later Beirut. So this is really the core of the. Um, what you'd say is the uh, post-medieval uh, city of Beirut. And so you can see on here a number of uh, structures quite clearly marked. You can see those two castles, which also appeared on the Piri Reis map, uh, what, one in the sea, one on an island in the sea and one on a peninsula. And you can also see um, a wall all around the city, um, and then the, which and within the wall is the built up area, but also you can see some of the um, the fields. Now, this gives you an idea of um, where some of the structures are. Sorry, I went back then. Um, now, you can see um, there are a number of mosques marked on this map. Uh, so you have the Amir Asaf Mosque, which is uh, built in the 16th century and is dated by inscription. The Al Amari Mosque, or the, um, which was originally a 12th century cathedral, which, which Patricia uh, mentioned earlier and was converted um, on the Mamluk reconquest was converted into the, the uh, Amari Mosque. And you also have the Emir Munzer Mosque uh, to the, um, the position of the Zawiya, which I showed at the beginning. This is the approximate position of the Zawiya, um, uh, which is today in the, in the Beirut Souks, approximately where it's located. So all these structures are located within the, um, within the city and all of them were, the, extant in the um, in the early Ottoman period that's from the 16th century to the uh, 17th century or 1600 so these these are all within that area um, this is just to show you the architecture of the um, the buildings this is the Amir Asaf mosque built in 1523 so around about the time of Piri Reis is um, map just 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 around that time this is the first ottoman mosque built within um beirut um it still has an essentially mamluk form um just a view of the interior uh built like um uh, built with reused um antique columns and um the, the mihrab is a characteristically um 
Mamluken style, although which is what you'd expect for this early Ottoman period. And we've also got the Emir Munzir Mosque, which is uh, from the 17th century. Again, uh, a similar style. So you've got uh, a small dome, and this is the uh, interior. This is the uh, courtyard again with reused antique columns. So you could see a lot of reuse of antique material uh, in this um, early Ottoman period. Now, um, the other, the other interesting early source for, Be for Ottoman Beirut is, uh, is the famous Ottoman traveller Evliya Çelebi, who visited Beirut in 1648, and um, he he was he gives quite a long description of uh, of Beirut, and. Um, and uh, quite a lot of details. And in his description, the harbour of Beirut and uh, what he calls the city or, or Shahir of Beirut, um, it's not quite clear in his description whether the, um, whether the, the, the city and the, the port were connected, but he, he, um, he talks about them as if they weren't connected. But he also talks about uh, Beirut Itself as being um, surrounded with, with many gates. He doesn't describe the wall, but he does describe gates within the city. So we assume that it was a, a walled city. And within the city, he said there were 37 mihrabs, which presumably means mosques and religious buildings, uh, four bathhouses, 17 madrasas, 300 shops, 40 coffee houses, eight khans. And he describes a population. Um, it's quite hard to um, understand his numbering, but it's it looks to me like it's four thousand four hundred and twenty four, but it, it could be more. It's quite hard to interpret that. So that's that's another uh, uh, source for early Ottoman Beirut. Um, and. So one of the one of the things I'd like to, there's two things I'd really like to think about is uh, for this is the um, is is uh, some of the uh, representation early representations of Beirut and here is um, a view of the, uh, the the walls from 1848 again about the same time as the plan and then we also you have here um, here back. Um, is a view of the um, of the um, a south southeast corner, and you can see this is again from the map of uh, Scott's map from 18, 1844, and you can see a section through the wall, the fortification wall, and again, this is this is his his. Um, diagram or, or plan or section through the wall and it can show the and he is very interested in in this to do with the um how well the fortifications would would stand attack from from outside so it's, it's very very uh very detailed and very technical drawing of the fortifications now the question which occurs to me is when when were these fortifications for first built when you look at the Puri rays map you can see a number of different fortifications but these aren't connected by a city wall so um the conventional idea is that the uh, and this is um, uh, I'll just show you some examples of um, this is uh, one of the city gates on the um, on the west side one of the city gates which sorry, is actually built yeah, over right. uh, um, you, have, you have 50 seconds left so that's a all oh, right okay so okay right so I'll just move on quickly so more examples of the city wall and um, lastly, I was just going to talk a little bit about the cemeteries. Um, the cemeteries were excavated while they're looking for the earlier, uh, earlier Beirut. And here are some examples of some of the tombstones from, from that cemetery which were excavated.
then finally this this but the the I, I think the main the main point I'd like to make is that it looks as if the the Beirut as a as an Ottoman as as a city really developed during this early Ottoman period and this is the the basis for the 19th 18th and 19th century city. Okay. Thank you. So Andrew, I really like the last uh, last last image and uh, representation okay. part. And we will get back to your presentation um, when we have a discussion. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, we had some problems with the audio connection. But uh, hopefully, okay. Sorry. this can mm. be sorted out. Uh, and uh, the last speaker of this session is Marlene Shahin. Hello, Marlene. Marlene, are you with us? Yes, of course. Very good. Thank Hi. you. Welcome. And Thank here you can see my uh, abstract and uh, biography of uh, Marlene. And Marlene Shahin has a PhD in landscape architecture from the Università degli Studi Mediterranea in Reggio Calabria, Italy, and master's degree in urban planning with focus on landscape architecture and environment. Presently, she works as Associate Professor at the Lebanese University Faculty of Fine Arts and Architecture and Faculty of Agronomy. And with her presentation, Merlin takes us to Beirut. The title of the presentation is Marty Square in Beirut, a production of urban space with a deep social belonging. You're welcome to start your presentation, Merlin. I'm trying to share my, um, okay, this one. Okay, uh, good afternoon. My name is Marlene Shahin. And uh, in this session, as we saw, there are many readings and interpretation and this is the importance of the multidisciplinarity and its richness. Today we talk about Marcher Square in Beirut, the production of urban space with a deep social belonging. I choose this photo. Just one second, please. Yes, uh, this photo to the right, very expressive and symbolic, showing the statue of uh, Martyr designed by the Italian sculptor Renato Mariano Mazzacurati in 1960, holding upright in the middle of the square as shown in the panoramic view. First, I would like to express my deepest mm. thanks to the organizer. It's a real pleasure to be part of this symposium. Just to Okay, uh, I would like to mention that part of this study had begun during my PhD thesis in Italy, and I would like to uh, thank friends, students, colleagues for helping me to prepare this work and especially concept and methods that I'm the founder and where a research activity in landscape is held. Beirut, capital of Lebanon, had an extraordinary boom in construction after the civil war from 1975 to 1990. Lebanese and above all internationally renowned landscape architects have contributed to the creation of new landscapes under the control of Solidaire. Solidaire, a private company that has appropriated all the historical center of Beirut. Among this new development, let's mention the Martyr Square, an area of 12,000 square meters situated in the northern point of the demarcation line created during the war and dividing the city into Christian to the east and Muslim to the west, as we can see in this aerial view. Okay. This is the demarcation line. This is Beirut suburb, but downtown which is uh, the old Beirut. And uh, here we have uh, the Marchi Square and the statue of the Marchi. 
So among these new development, there is uh, March Square, a real palimpsest set and succession of layered landscape discussed and revisited over time. This overlapping of landscapes is an overlapping of names assigned to the square depending on the current political or economic situation, thus spreading an uncertain future to the square. In 2004, the competition was held allowing to concede the square with the big access, but in October 2019 appears the unexpected layer, which is a huge production from social perspective. A reversal of the situation in a few hours gives birth to a new landscape that has long been non-existent. Marty Square in Beirut became a production of urban space with a deep social belonging. This presentation does not have a political objective. It is an analysis of studies already carried out during seminars and publication such as Torino in 2016, Sapienza in 2018 and 2020, Beirut and Oslo in 2019. Thus, from parameters identified by spatial and social approaches, we try to uncover what is the Marty Square over time, what were the different readings in the past and before the civil war, what is the reading of the first winner competition in 2004, what reading would we give to this square today following October 2019, and how social creates a new landscape joining, in a way, the previous presentations. This is an idea about the structure of the study, or let's say a way representing the movement of people. They come and go over time. It is a wave of people where they appear and disappear. With this people escape, the olfactive and sound escape follow the wave because of course the production of urban space is not only limited to the visual landscape, but also to the sound and olfactory ones. Before 1975, during the golden age, the layered landscape was first seized the bourgeois garden with its citrus inspired from Europe in the late 19th century that made the Place Hamidier during the Ottoman Empire, first official name given to Marty Square. And then Place des Canons in the 20s at the time of the French mandate, as written in the participation with IFLA in Torino, entitled Marty Square in Beirut as a layered landscape. It was secondly, the alignment of figures and palm trees constituting Marty Square in the 30s, as we can see in this photo. You can see my pointer. And in the second one, and a less dense alignment in the 60s, because the square became a parking car, the name of Burush was attributed at this time of its, its history. We have a photo from uh, Mireille uh, Mathieu. At the booth where the souk is held. Souk is the Arabic term for open air market, a place of multiple experience, scent of spices, color of fabric, cry of street vendor. Trading in Beirut souk began in the Phoenician time then was continued and enlarged in the Hellenistic, Roman, and Byzantine period. To the old people of Beirut, Souk was their home, their workspace. It started off as a meeting point for some merchants and developed over the years to become the heart of the country economy. Beirut stayed in the history. 
It did not survive the war in the old days. They were side by side, merchant of vegetable, flour, gold, clothes, and spice. The scream of the crowd made the landscape vibrate. All this remained in the memory of Beirut people. For them, once upon a time, there was Beirut, there was Balad, meaning country. As mentioned in Urbanistica, from Beirut to Dora, city next to Beirut, sound and olfactory landscape to evoke public space. And as mentioned during the participation with IFLA, entitled Beirut, a renovation prohibited of democracy, it's important to know that Beirut Souk was moved from Buruj, from its original location by Solidaire, using only the name of its famous street, and become through the renovation of Solidaire, a luxurious space where the most prestigious brands occupy its window without any spirit, just makeup and decoration. The heart of the city is buried, Beirut remains in memory. War from 1975 to 1990, no man's land. Even the emblematic statue of the martyr was moved to another city to avoid the shells till the end of the war. Now that the heart is dead, buried under the rubble, it does not beat anymore. The heart of the city was beating day and night, and all social classes were mixed. The sound and olfactory landscape have made Beirut a unique and cosmopolitan city with an identity that no other city could share. After the civil war, Solidaire had erased many architecture, monuments, places as if they wanted to erase history. As they moved the souk, I have talked a little about it uh, last year during um, my presentation with Sapienza 2020, uh, and where I have met many of you. By the symbol of Union of Martyrs Square, Nukaki's proposal in 2004, first surprise in the competition, is a fragmented space. As mentioned in my book entitled Beirut Streetscape in Contemporary Concept, a concept of modern trend standardization as we see anywhere around the world. It looks like some other squares in the city done by Solidaire as an ordinary square that has neither identity nor national symbol. However, it is worth mentioning that Olto Nukaki is a famous degree company in landscape architecture. They had to follow the order from Solidaire to conceive their proposal by following exactly the story of the Martyr Square just as told by Solidaire. By this layer, the square became an ornamental garden. What happened to the genius and to the meaning of the place? It, in squares disappeared, wrote a century ago. The space that seems to everybody belongs in fact to the engineer and the hygienist. Indeed, Nukaki's proposal is a decoration of insignificant passage creating the museumification of the square without any appropriation, neither belonging. Landscape project is an art, not a profession. It contributes to active and inventive conservation, social mediations, and the sharing of vision of contemporary issues. It is an art of making love the city, creating opportunities of self-expression, as said Gell. Therefore, in this condition, it is hard to say that the concept of Martyr Square in Beirut allows people to appropriate their landscape. 
autumn revolution. In the 70s of October 2019, protesters in the streets, a series of civil protests taking place in Lebanon and especially in the Marquis Square. These national protests were tricked by planned taxes on gasoline, tobacco, and calls on applications such as WhatsApp. But quickly, expanding into a countrywide condemnation of sectarian rule, stagnant economy, unemployment that reached 46% in 2018, and any corruption in the public sector, legislation that was perceived to shield the ruling class from accountability and failures of the government to provide basic services such as electricity, water, and sanitation. That time, Marty Square in Beirut becomes again a production of urban space with a deep social belonging. Today, today it's the desert again, one time more, following the blast of August 4 in 2020. The iconic sculpture held upright lonely in the middle of the empty square, telling the story of Beirut and waiting as usual. As a conclusion, Martyr Square remains as a palimpsest and a succession of layered landscape, taking in a unique way the people escape, the olfactive and sound escape. And as long as there is hope, love, determination, there will be always a deep social belonging. This symposium had to be in Beirut. The Martyr Square touched hugely everyone, like so many Lebanese connected right now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we have had all our presentations of this session and um, uh, Rose and Andrew provided us with um, um, topics related to evolution of the city, development, redevelopment of a city. Um, and um, uh, Patricia uh, with her nice excursion and tour to, to Lebanon gave us um, aspects to preservation and presentations of archaeological heritage, notably medieval remains in Lebanon. And Marlene, on the other hand, um, uh, gave us, um, um, provided us with topics related to social meanings of urban spaces and uh, layered meanings, layered identities, and um, uh, readings of these different layers of a city. So, um, is there anybody who wants to start the discussion? Either ask um, something about the contents of the presentations or uh, make comments or open a wider discussion about these topics. So may I start with the uh, with the discussion? Yes, um, of course. So um, I'm, I'm really enjoyed today's uh, presentations. They're they're really uh, very nice. It took us into several areas and 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 and, uh, and cities that were rich with history. And I mean, I mean it when it, when we say rich with history. I mean every single part of the city has already been under several uh, nations and civilizations and etc as professor antaki has explained i think um and during this the, the, his her really nice presentation uh, my question to to professor antaki would be uh, during you know i when i was looking into the uh, damascus and the syrian phoenician uh, phoenicia libanese uh, border uh, in that when reading historical um, chroniclers by for example, Chronicle Pascal, 
I, I've looked into a transformation that have happened during Theodric the Great from uh, from uh, from temple to to uh, to a church in 300 in the in the early in the late fourth century. So uh, in Baalbek that happened actually. So during the, your last slides, I was uh, unfortunately I, I disconnected from the from the internet, but I was very uh, curious to learn uh, whether this uh, Mayyad mosque that you have displayed to us is uh, was a result of a fortification that happened from uh, a different functions, rather for, whether it's from a church or a temple or any other, I mean, identified uh, uh, data that you have collected previously. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you for your question. So we're talking about the Umayyad Mosque of Baalbek. I think. Yes, that's um, right. Yes, actually, um, I think it was not well studied. So what is commonly agreed upon is that we think it might have been a Byzantine church turned into um, a mosque. And we're not even sure it's Umayyad period, but this is what um, everyone agrees on. But I mean, th there hasn't been a real uh, a thorough study on it, actually. We know it was built prior to the Mamluks because the Mamluks, we know that um, they uh, they restored it and we have Mamluk inscriptions uh, in the courtyard, I think. Uh, so definitely it has reused these antique uh, granite columns from the Roman period and uh, the Corinthian capitals. So some scholars assume it was built on top of a Byzantine church, but um, Unfortunately, we cannot, I mean, uh, with what we know today, it's hard to tell if this was really the case. But as you know, I mean, in Lebanon, it's not only the temples turned into churches. I mean, this is, uh, we have this everywhere, not only in Baalbek, even in all the rural villages. I mean, in, in many, many of them in Lebanon, in the Lebanese mountains and in other places also in towns, we have, um, we have the, this transformation of temples into uh, Byzantine churches, mm. uh, which happens also in the fifth, sixth centuries. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, the, the, the other thing would be actually, while uh, just a quick one before the, uh, the others actually prepare their questions. Uh, do you have any, any sources where it leads to the, uh, to the to, to other buildings that were fortified uh, from a church to a mosque inside Lebanon. I, because I was looking for Baalbek's uh, mosque, I couldn't find any interesting uh, researches done on, on, this, on the mosque. I mean, have you, have you actually came through any of these researches before? Uh, you mean churches turned into mosques? Yes. Because you're also talking about fortification, but that's even that's something else. But we have many churches turned into, like the two uh, that I showed you, the the cathedral, the Crusader Cathedral of Beirut is the Amari Mosque, and the cathedral, just to name a few, the, the cathedral of Saida also is the also called the Amari Mosque um, in Sidon, um, and we have we have uh, we. We have other many other examples. We have also St. George Church in Beirut, the old St. George Church, uh, which has become the Al-Khudr uh, Mosque also. Uh, in Sarafand also, we have uh, the same thing. So we do have, uh, of course, many churches which were converted into, into mosques. And in, in Tripoli also, uh, the, the great mosque of Tripoli was also the, um, a church. Um, so we do have many examples of temples turned into uh, churches on one side and churches which mm -hmm. transformed into mosques. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I can see that Per Cornell would like to um, uh, comment something or ask something. Yeah, uh, I will <laughs> promise I won't talk much. Uh, I'll just ask Patricia, a question. Um, we have discussed Italy and we have seen how uh, in the 19th century certain uh, uh, churches were, uh, which had been built within a temple, were, there, there were attempts to remake them into, to, uh, or to make them into ruin. It was the ruin of the temple. 
So they took away everything that was church and kept only what was parts of the old temple. So they became a ruin. That, that was an active work to create a ruin out of a church. A church that once had been built in, inside a temple. Have that occurred in Lebanon? I didn't really get your, <laughs> your question. Okay, so, no, okay. What happens is that most of the temples which have been turned into churches are either already in ruins or mm. they are still occupied today. Yeah, but, but I'm speaking about that. They were, there are examples of active churches. Yes. Yeah, in Italy. Mm -hmm. Where, which are yeah. closed down and then they they take out the ruin of the church so to say they take away everything that is not what they do not consider belonging to to the to the the ruin the original monument you mean but they make it to to a ruin yes transform the church to a ruin yeah of the temple that it once was incorporated into that is a very mm -hmm. interesting we don't have this policy here, I think. I don't know if... No, it was what I supposed. That, because it, but it is interesting. Uh, it, it just out of curiosity. I, 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 I am interested how often that type of, of action takes place. Uh, of course, it's not very common, but it has occurred. And of course, it, it's never perfect. Uh, they often preserve parts of the church anyhow and so on. But uh, it has occurred. And it, it's an interesting phenomenon. Active... Yeah. Active, actively take out the ruin of the building yes. and make it a, a ruin. As I told you, it's either it's already a ruin and we try to, to mm. consolidate it and preserve it, or it's already a church and we definitely will not uh, tear it down. <laughs> Thank you. Andrew, would you like to continue? Yeah, I was just going to say about that. I, I think that was an interesting point. Um, I was just thinking of some possible examples, but I was thinking in Baalbek, not, not so much, well, sort of part of what you might be thinking about, I was thinking is the, the, the site of Baalbek as a, a tourist site, as you see it today, with the ancient temples, that of course, during the Mamluk period, that was a fortified, that was a fortress and they've, what you can see there is some of some of the medieval remains have been uh, walls have been removed, but not all of them. So in a sense, it's kind of to actually get to the older older ruins. You 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 kind of have to do this, um, but it does it does. You are having to remove some of the historical evidence, but it's 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 always one of the one of the problems with any form of archaeology or presentation is that you, you can't see everything at the same time. I, I, absolutely, we are talking about that. It is a process of selection. You, you select something you consider important and take away what you do not consider important. Yes, yeah, and, and I, yeah. I'm just describing processes. I'm At present, I'm not trying to make any sort of ethical no, no. comment on this. I'm just describing processes, but it's interesting uh, whether or not they take place everywhere. And, and I, I referred in particular to, to, to buildings which uh, have actively been considered sacred in some, some way, uh, almost at the same moment as they are destroyed and, and made into a ruin, because that is something rather interesting. If I might in add... In other countries, but uh, I, I, I wonder if it had occurred in Lebanon. It was just a question. Yes, I would like to thank Andrew because he, he, because he brought up the, the example of Baalbek, which is the perfect one, because indeed uh, you talked about the fortifications, but in the great courtyard of the Temple of Jupiter, where were found the, the, the remains of a church, they were removed. So that was a parti pris to remove the... the uh, yeah. absolutely. So, so we have a case. We have a case. Interesting. <laughs> we, we should make a list of these cases. Huh? Huh? That, that would be one of the lists we should produce the ACCP. Huh? Thank you. I'm sorry I will have to leave soon. Thanks for interesting presentations and a fun discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Per Cornell. And uh... So do we have any other discussion or questions from the other members? Please feel free to speak with us. Uh, if I may comment. Um, yes, please. On, on Andrew's, uh, thank you very much for your lecture first. 
Uh, very interesting. Um, you talked about the, the city walls and you were wondering about them and the towers and you showed the tower which was on Marte Square originally. Actually, yes. we do know the, the story of the of the, the city walls um, because I worked on the, the Crusader topography of Beirut actually. Um, it all started with the Crusader castle that you excavated a long time ago. And then I, I continued with the, the study of the, the Crusader city. So I, if I remember well, I think that the city walls were already here uh, prior to the Crusader's arrival. Uh, that's the beginning of the 12th century, and we know what happened. We know they were destroyed by Saladin, and they were rebuilt later on, etc. Um, so we can follow them uh, till the end of the 19th century, as you yes. said. And uh, I guess you know that the the tower you you uh, you showed is Burj Al Kashif. Yes. Uh, which was in the Martyr Square and which was um, eastwards of the of the city wall, as you said, and it was part really of this network of watchtowers, guard towers that were surrounding um, the city. Just Thank you. That's that's yeah. That's very useful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, I would like to ask Patricia about uh, the valuation of heritage among in inhabitants. You raised the question about increasing interest among inhabitants. Are there big differences between different towns you presented us? Mm, there, mm, I guess there is. <laughs> I mean, in Anjar, for example, I guess all the, the um, I didn't make any social study, I must confess, <laughs> but I think the old people in Anjar know their side because it's a small town and it's the only side. So that's, I think it's easy to, to they must all know what it is and to what period it belongs. Uh, in Beirut, uh, I think this would be less evident. As I told you, the Crusader castle, even specialists don't know about it. I know about it because uh, I excavated it. I was part of the team uh, uh, who excavated it. So, um, and the, the like the moat and the city wall inside the souks. I mean, I think there was a panel explaining what it was at one point, but uh, people, I mean, don't even stop, don't even know what it is. So, uh, um, inside that, everyone knows, for example, everyone, all the, 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 the local people know about the, the sea castle and the land castle. Now, if you ask them when it was built, I, I'm not sure they, they will know the answer. So I think that we still have really um, much work to do <laughs> ahead of us. So there is a disparity, there is a, a difference between the the towns concerning their uh, this medieval heritage and their heritage in general. Do you consider that as a problem? Of course. <laughs> of course. I think people are not, well, I'm an archaeologist, so <laughs> that's a normal answer. I think I will never be satisfied, but I think that, yes, people need to, to um, to, to get more in touch with their heritage and, uh, and with their history. And more and more, I mean, these days, I think that's very, very important, of course. In these very challenging days. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> um, are there any more questions or comments? Uh, yes, I, I want to make a comment. Uh, yes, please. What was surprising not a, not unexpected, by, but surprising is the close similarity of that medieval architecture from Lebanon to the one you could see in Cyprus. Actually, in 1187, when Saladin retook uh, Jerusalem, uh, according to the sources, 30,000 people left and paying a ransom went to Cyprus, Tyre, uh, Akros, and Tripoli, if I'm not mistaken. And, but they were not only crusaders. Actually, they were third-generation Middle Eastern people, because they, they, they had been there for over 100 years. And they had their own style, which is usually referred as crusader, whatever you want to call it. Anyhow, uh, basically in Cyprus, we have exactly the same architecture, identical. And it's very specific, you know, very interesting that it's very close in, in space, but it's not only about being close, it's the same people, it's the same ruling group, the Luzinian family. So that's surprising, amazing. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Yes, and in Cyprus, I think you're more in the Gothic style. Uh, uh, we, we only have very rare examples of Gothic architecture, but I think you, you have, because you're, they established themselves in 13th and late 13th centuries, so they were closer to the, the Gothic architecture, lovely Gothic architecture. We're more in the Romanesque um, style. In, in the Holy Lands here in the Near East. The what, was, what was done before 1187 is Romanesque. What was done after, yeah. because they, 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 when they came to Cyprus, it was you know already Gothic, but you might know that- But Saint, we still Saint, have very few examples. Uh, I know, I know, but, but they, they all concentrated- Cyprus. <laughs> because they moved there the kingdom of yeah. Jerusalem and, and Cyprus, and that was the capital. Mm. But in Jerusalem, for instance, there are two buildings that are Gothic. Nobody really noticed this. The, the Al-Aqsa in the phase of the transformation in the, into the Temple Palace, you got groin ribs with, uh, groin both with ribs. Yes. And, and you got the, the buttresses outside and the, the, the rotunda, the second rotunda of the Holy Sepulchre as well. The Saint Anne, Ag Agianna as well. They're basically Gothic. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that the... the but this is why you're mentioning them, because these are exceptions, but, right? No, but the point is that there's a laboratory of architectural style in that area, mm -hmm. you know, that invents Gothic. The rib, the vault, the flying buttress, mm -hmm. all these features that then they move out to Cyprus, they bring it there and they continue doing it. But this is, I mean, uh, St. Denis is, uh, what is it, 40 years later. So if you look at the dates, what happens in Jerusalem and in these places is before the Gothic in, 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 in the Western countries. That is the laboratory where these features, which are also visible in older examples, of course, like the, you know, you, you, there are cisterns with the Gothic vault in, in, in the Middle East. You, you can find flying buttresses. There's one in Cyprus with dates to the sixth century. But uh, there's, a, there's an aqueduct in Turkey with the Gothic arch uh, dating to the seventh century. So we have these uh, features scattered, but it is in that area that there's this, you know, sort of karijik melting pot of cultures. And that's what Gothic is, basically. This is my personal idea. But then it becomes a trend, you know, like the spices, trendy. And they do it in, in the West as well. But it's like, you know, it, it's not Western. It's, it's from there. This is my opinion. Yes. Then we open a new chapter and a new discussion. <laughs> okay, thank you, Alex. I just love it when you when you just rewrite uh, the architecture history of Europe just like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I did live for five years in Cyprus. I lived, taught, researched, and published. And I, I so I didn't do it right now, Martin. <laughs> this is old stuff. Former researchers of mine, but it, it all makes sense, you know. If you, if you see these examples, you realize that somebody was doing something new in that area, and that was the most important part of the world in, in those years. Okay, that one centered between the uh, what is it, eight ten eighty nine to eleven eighty seven, when Jerusalem is in Christian hands. That is the laboratory of architecture. You know what I'm saying? Not all your architecture, everything, poetry, music, food, every, philosophy, that's the core of the West, let's put it this way. And, and then it, it moves somewhere else, but you know, it, it's the same people. <laughs> Those people move somewhere. So not only soldiers, builders, families, kids, priests, all of them, you know, the whole package. <laughs> Are these our concluding words? Yes, the whole package. The whole package, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, it has been a rather long day, um, I, I suppose. Um, so if there are no more comments or questions or words to be shared, I think it's my time to conclude this interesting uh, session and interesting day all in all. And um, I hope to see you all tomorrow morning. Oh, there's still one. Uh, no, 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 I'm in love. I'm in love. Oh, oh. yeah. Thanking you. <laughs> Virtually. Thank you all. Digitally. <laughs> Digitally, yeah. Let's applaud 
all of us. And um, we will see tomorrow tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Zainab? Yes. Uh, are you in charge of the breakout rooms? No. Okay, who is it? Who is? Alex. Alex, you can you put Andrew and me in a breakout room? Uh, mm. Okay. I, uh, I'm not, yeah, I can do that. Yes, I will. Well, give me, give me one minute. I'll do it. Yeah. Andrew mm -hmm. and Martin. Anyone else? Uh, Anyhow, yeah. When, yeah. When, now I'm going to open them and invite you to there. But if anyone else wants to move into the breakout room, they can do it as well. Yeah. Thank you. So meanwhile, uh, thank you, Lisa and uh, uh, Luai, uh, for this last session. And thank you, all the presenters of this uh, last uh, session. Uh, it's a shame that we couldn't be, uh, we couldn't have this discussion in Beirut, as you all mm -hmm. mentioned. Uh, but hopefully, after everything goes uh, better, uh, let's try it again, shall we? Yes, um, it would be a pleasure. Yes, to, we're to meet in to you here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Perhaps so, within the next few years. Ahlan wa sahlan. Ahlan wa sahlan. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we expect to see you tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, Islam 